dare to fall. A Second Chances in Sapphire Cove Romance. Written by Lindsay Armstrong. Text, copyright 2022 by Lindsay Armstrong. Production copyright 2022 by Lindsay Armstrong. One word frees us of all the weight and pain in life. That word is love. Sophocles. Chapter 1. Cheyenne leaned against the hood of her baby blue 66 Ford Thunderbird convertible, her cell phone pressed against one ear and chest tight with anxiety. Two minutes into this conversation and she was already worried. Your mother's had a rough week, Dr. Robbins said, a slight lilt to her soprano voice. That's not unexpected, but I am concerned she's not fully committed to the program. Less than twenty feet away, seagulls converged on a half-eaten hot dog that lay forgotten in the sand. When her cell phone rang five minutes ago, Cheyenne had pulled over into this mostly empty beach parking lot. There weren't many tourists out at eleven in the morning on a Wednesday, but it was only the first week of May. Cheyenne's best friend, Aspen, had promised that Sapphire Cove would be hopping soon enough. Cheyenne pinched the bridge of her nose, trying to think. What do you mean, she's not fully committed? She seems closed off in therapy, Dr. Robbins said. Not just group sessions, but our individual ones, too. Closed off. Cheyenne supposed that was one way to describe her mother. She'd been warm and loving when Cheyenne was a child, almost to the point of stifling. Practically embodied the word homemaker, at least on the outside. Mom had helped with every class party, chaperoned every field trip. But she'd also been what Dad called fragile, easily overwhelmed and constantly worried. From a young age, Cheyenne had been very aware of how her actions might affect Mom. She'd learned to bury her problems if it meant avoiding one of Mom's panicked crying bouts, which sometimes left her in bed for days. Mom wasn't the kind of person you went deep with. She didn't deal well with big emotions, hers or her daughter's. It's only been ten days, Cheyenne said to Dr. Robbins. Isn't that pretty normal? No one likes spilling their guts to strangers. Convincing mom to go to the Harbor Bay Drug Rehabilitation Center hadn't been easy. But after that last overdose, mom second in as many months, Cheyenne hadn't known what else to do. The hospital psychiatrist had highly recommended the 12-week inpatient program. It meant using her meager savings for that, instead of putting it toward opening her own garage, but there hadn't been another choice. Thankfully, Mom had signed a privacy waiver when she entered the program that allowed Dr. Robbins to discuss all of her treatment with Cheyenne. Dr. Robbins' voice grew softer with every word. You should prepare yourself, Cheyenne. Your mother is here voluntarily, and we can't stop her from leaving if she chooses to do so. Breathing became physically painful as Cheyenne was assaulted by the memory of her mother's unconscious body sprawled in the middle of the kitchen floor. She had rushed to mom's side, pills crunching beneath her only pair of heels with each step. Her black graduation robe had bunched around her knees as she crouched beside mom's inert form. Was she even breathing? Cheyenne had pulled her hair to one side, the unfamiliar curl stiff with hairspray, and held her breath as she waited for an exhalation of air against her cheek. Mom was supposed to be waiting for her so they could drive together to the graduation ceremony. Instead, they rode in the back of an ambulance to the closest hospital. During the rushed dash through the congested streets of Portland, all Cheyenne had thought about were the countless sacrifices Mom had made for her over the years. Once, in seventh grade, Cheyenne had mentioned that a car show she'd always dreamed of attending was happening in Salt Lake City that weekend. She'd come home from school to find the minivan packed and mom bursting with excitement. They'd driven through the night, just the two of them since dad was working a weekend shift and slept for a few hours in the parking lot of a big box store before the show began. Mom must have been exhausted and bored out of her mind, but for twelve hours she'd smiled cheerfully while Cheyenne eagerly explored each and every car. Is she talking of leaving? Cheyenne asked Dr. Robbins. Not in so many words but she's struggling with the program's rigid structure. Facing your demons is never easy, and many patients aren't prepared to do the work on their first go-around. The first go-around? Cheyenne thought of her empty bank account and closed her eyes tightly against the bright Oregon sun. It had taken nearly every penny she'd saved for her garage just for the down payment on the program. 
she was already working two jobs to pay for it, one helping with the Continental Breakfast and Aspen's Family Inn, and another at an auto shop running the front counter, but she wasn't sure it would be enough. She still had to come up with half the rent each month on the small bungalow she shared with Aspen, along with expenses like food and gas, not to mention the payments on her student loans. Maybe she should have accepted the job offer to be an on-site mechanic at that classic car museum in Portland. The pay hadn't been much better than what she was making now, but she could have lived at home to save on expenses and would have been doing what she loved. But no, she'd done the right thing by refusing the job. Being even a few hours away from mom right now wasn't an option. Which meant she needed to figure out how to make more money in Sapphire Cove. Cheyenne mulled over the possibilities. She could start a mobile oil change business or maybe do car detailing, that might be a hit with tourists sick of crushed cereal and spilled juice cups after their cross-country treks. Neither option was as fun as restoring classic cars, but keeping mom in rehab was the priority. Besides, Sapphire Cove, and her jobs here, were only temporary. So what do I do? Cheyenne asked. How do we make sure she stays there and does the work? Even if mom dropped out, Cheyenne would be liable for the full cost of the program, and she couldn't afford to pay for this more than once. These 12 weeks had to count. It's not something we can force, Dr. Robbins said in that same maddeningly calm voice. Like many addicts, she's adamant that she doesn't have a problem. Cheyenne squeezed her eyes shut. Mom hadn't had a problem, not until almost four years ago, when Dad was killed in the line of duty. My job is to help her accept that she does have a problem, and then to walk her through the steps to recovery, Dr. Robbins continued. Your job is to set boundaries and be supportive. Have you set up an appointment with that therapist I recommended? Yeah, right. Cheyenne wasn't wasting a single precious penny on therapy for herself. Mom was the addict, not her. It's on my list, Cheyenne lied. I'm still getting settled in Sapphire Cove. You should move it to the very top of that list, Dr. Robbins said. Addiction is a whole family disease, and you don't have to suffer alone. Cheyenne wasn't about to get into that conversation, not now, not ever, if she could help it. I need to head to work in a minute. Is there anything else we should talk about before I go? No, I just wanted to make you aware of your mother's current challenges, Dr. Robbins said. I'll continue to do my best to get her to open up during sessions. Thank you, Cheyenne said, although the doctor's words did little to ease the tension in her neck and shoulders. When can I speak to her? Phone calls were closely monitored in the beginning stages of the program. Cheyenne couldn't call in, and Mom could only call out with the approval of Dr. Robbins. Sometime next week, depending on how she progresses. Maybe the week after that. I'm sorry, I don't have a firmer timeline for you at the moment. Cheyenne rubbed her chest, trying to take even breaths. When was the last time she'd gone this long without talking to her mother? She honestly couldn't remember. I understand. When she calls, how should I act? Encouraging and positive. I'll let you know when she's ready, and we can schedule a time for the call. Cheyenne thanked Dr. Robbins then hung up the phone. She pressed her lips together and covered her eyes with one hand, taking a deep breath. Encouraging and positive. Like it was so easy. Ten days ago, when she'd loaded up her convertible and left Portland in her rearview mirror, she'd felt hopeful for the first time in years. The Harbor Bay Drug Rehabilitation Center was one of the best in the country. She had envisioned spending a peaceful, if not exactly relaxing, summer in Sapphire Cove with Aspen, and then picking up a fully cured mother and heading back to Portland to focus once again on opening her garage. But already Cheyenne's hopes were plummeting. What if the treatment program didn't work? She was out of ideas on how to help her mom. Definitely out of money to try rehab again. Her phone buzzed with a text, and Cheyenne peered at it from underneath her hand. Aspen. I told you not to eat dinner at work tonight, right? We'll eat at the pier. Cheyenne struggled to shift her focus from her mom to the plans she'd made for tonight. She honestly couldn't remember what Aspen had told her that morning. 
She wasn't super excited to be the third wheel to Dan and Aspen's nauseatingly adorable, newly engaged Hayes, but Aspen had insisted the summer opening at Sapphire Pier was a must-attend event and that they wanted Cheyenne to join them. Since it didn't interfere with either of her jobs, she'd reluctantly agreed. It wasn't like she knew anyone else in town. Don't eat, Cheyenne texted back. Got it. Three dots appeared, and a moment later Aspen's text. Oh, and some of the guys from Dan's crew might meet us there. Cheyenne groaned aloud. So far, she'd managed to successfully dodge all setup attempts with the guys from Dan's construction crew, but she had a feeling that soon her luck would run out. She was happy for Aspen, really, she was. But just because Aspen had found true love didn't mean Cheyenne needed to. She didn't have the time or energy to devote to a relationship right now. Just the thought of dating exhausted her. It's a free country. Dan's crew can go wherever they want. Aspen sent a rolling eyes gif, followed quickly by, don't be difficult. Pot, meat kettle. I'm making it my mission in life to make sure you have some fun this summer. Cheyenne stared at the phone, frowning. To hear Aspen talk, Cheyenne was a hundred years old and about as fun as a box of rocks. But there was nothing wrong with focusing on her career, right? Sure, right now it was on hold, but that was temporary. In twelve weeks, ten and a half, actually, she'd be back in Portland, saving up again for her garage. Hopefully, working in an auto shop, where she was allowed to do more than count the money in the cash register. She gazed across the beach, watching the waves gently break against the sand. A man wrapped his arms around a slender woman's waist, lifting her into the air as she squealed and laughed. He set her back on the ground and she turned in his arms, kissing him. Yeah, relationships were always great, until they weren't. Sure, that woman was happy right now. But if her man died tragically, would she find solace in a bottle of pills? Aspen could throw men at Cheyenne all summer long, but it wouldn't work. She knew what lay at the other end of heartbreak, and it wasn't pretty. We're meeting at the bungalow, right? Cheyenne texted. As soon as you get off work, Aspen replied. I can't wait. The pier is seriously one of my favorite parts of living in Sapphire Cove. Aspen's hints that Cheyenne should stay in Sapphire Cove long term were already growing less and less subtle which was fine, Cheyenne was enjoying her time in the small town, even if she couldn't make concrete plans beyond the next three months. See you then, Cheyenne said. The salty sea air and warm sun were enticing, but she climbed into her convertible and slipped on her sunglasses. If she sat around any longer, she'd be late for her shift at the auto shop, not a good look after only a week on the job. Maybe tonight she could relax and have some fun. But for now, it was time to get to work. Chapter 2. Zack let out a curse as the engine of his ancient truck whined, then sputtered and coughed. He quickly downshifted as the truck dropped below 40 miles per hour, coasting along the winding scenic highway. Scraggly rocks rose in the distance, and the waves crashing against them echoed his current frustrations. Beside him, Sawyer had one arm out the open passenger window, his dark, shortly cropped hair barely moving in the wind. Don't say it, Zack ground out moving down to second gear and flipping on his hazard lights as the truck continued to slow. Sawyer and John, his two best friends and fellow sailors, had been telling Zack for years that it was time to buy a more reliable vehicle. But he wasn't ready to give up this last tenuous connection to his parents. I haven't said a thing. Sawyer stared pointedly out the window. I'm just admiring the beautiful Oregon coastline. Wouldn't even have noticed the truck wheezing like a chainsmoker with emphysema if you hadn't pointed it out. Zack grit his teeth, letting the truck coast to the side of the road as it coughed once more. There wasn't much of a shoulder, thickly wooded forest framed one side of the road and a cliff created a steep drop-off to the ocean on the other, but Zack made it work and urged the truck as far into the trees as he could manage. Thick branches scraped against the hood and passenger side door, but Zack wasn't concerned. The body of the truck was more rust than paint at this point. The truck gave another shudder, then the engine sputtered and finally died. Zack turned the key in the ignition. Nothing. He smacked the steering wheel, letting out a groan. 
stupid piece of junk. It couldn't have waited another ten minutes? They were almost to Sapphire Cove, their final destination. Maybe it's not as bad as you think, Sawyer said. It's thirty years old and spends ten months a year sitting in a parking lot. That can't be good on a vehicle. Zack knew enough to disconnect the battery before each seal up so it wasn't drained when he returned, and he tried to remember to check the fluid levels and get the oil changed regularly. He also could hotwire it in a pinch, but anything more extensive was beyond him. An 18-wheeler with Georgia plates sped by, making the entire truck shake. Zack's heart skipped a beat, his adrenaline spiking at the unexpected commotion. You're fine, he told himself, trying to breathe evenly. Any sudden movements or loud noises tended to set him off. Sawyer rolled the hand crank until the window was once again shut, looking unperturbed. Nothing bothered him. When they'd first enlisted, Zack and John had both struggled to adjust to military life. But not Sawyer. He seemed born to be a SEAL. We'll get her up and running again, Sawyer said, waving a hand to encompass the truck. And for once in our lives, we're not in any rush. Yeah, Zack muttered, staring gloomily at the cracked dashboard. This truck had been his dad's pride and joy. As a child, Zack had loved watching him work on it, the smell of mom's homemade bread drifting in from the kitchen and making their stomachs growl. He pushed aside the memories. Just because his parents were gone didn't mean he was without family. He, Sawyer, and John had formed their own tight-knit unit in the absence of biological relatives. That bond of brotherhood had only strengthened as they went through basic training together, then later BUD slash S. Was John really not going to re-enlist? In four months, he would be a married man and had already told the Navy of his intention to leave when his current contract expired in a year and a half. The Navy wasn't like other jobs, where two weeks' notice sufficed to quit. For a SEAL, the Navy started the paperwork, to re-enlist or to be discharged, a minimum of a year before the end of the contract. Zack couldn't fathom giving up the SEALs, after all the effort they'd expended to get there, for civilian life in Sapphire Cove. Craziest of all, John thought he could convince Zack and Sawyer to join him. Wanted them to open a scuba diving company together for the tourists. Even had a cheesy name for it, King Trident Scuba Diving. Well, John could ask all he wanted. Zack wasn't about to turn in his fatigues and gun for a Hawaiian shirt and cargo shorts. Especially not now, when he was so close to achieving the promotion he'd worked tirelessly towards. He'd been shocked when Lt. Matthews had called him in two days ago and suggested he apply for officer candidate school. Matthews was being promoted, and Zack was his recommendation to take over the junior lieutenant vacancy in the platoon. It was still very hush-hush, but having the direct recommendation of your commanding officer was practically a guarantee you'd advance ranks. Me? Zack had asked, caught completely off guard. He wasn't the most senior member of their eight-man squad. Sawyer was a better marksman. John was a stronger diver. Zack? He was just grateful the Navy had given him a purpose after losing both parents. Because you get people, Lt. Matthews had said. Your squad trusts you completely, and you're the best man for the job. Think about it while you're on leave. I'll need your answer as soon as you get back. Three weeks to make the biggest decision of his life. Advancing in the SEALs was a dream come true, and a year ago, before John met his fiancée Meredith and their little trio morphed into a quad, Zack would have said yes without hesitation and already have filled out the application. But continuing as a SEAL without John, and maybe without Sawyer too, felt like a nightmare. He wasn't sure what would have happened to him after his parents' unexpected deaths if John and Sawyer hadn't kept him afloat. Zack knew for a fact that he wouldn't have made it through basic training or BUD S without them, he would have flunked out before the end of the first month. Could he be a sailor without his brothers in arms? Zack had never truly been alone, and the thought of it was unsettling. He and Sawyer had to convince John to re-enlist. Sapphire Cove is only three miles from here, Sawyer said, interrupting Zack's thoughts. He had his phone out, looking at the GPS map. There's got to be at least one mechanic there who can get the truck up and running again soon. Unlikely. 
How many options can there be in a town of 3,000 people? Might have to get it towed to somewhere bigger. Sawyer lifted his shoulders in a characteristic shrug. You never know. Meredith said it's triple that size in the summer months. Zack climbed out of the truck with a sigh, and Sawyer followed suit. Another vehicle cruised past, this one a sleek tour bus with an image of an ocean sunset covering one side. Zack's entire body tensed at the sound, and he took three deep, even breaths. We haven't done our cardio yet today, Sawyer said. Zack peered over his friend's shoulder at the map on his phone. The most direct route to Sapphire Cove was through the forest, and a footpath for just that purpose was only a quarter of a mile ahead. Seems like a good time for a run, then. That would be quicker than waiting for a tow truck, and cell service on this highway was spotty at best. Through the forest? Yeah, Zack agreed. They both checked that their concealed carries were still secure at the small of their backs, then grabbed their duffel bags from the bed of the truck and slung them crossway over their shoulders and chests. Let's go, Sawyer said. They fell into a steady rhythm, ducking under tree branches that canopied the overgrown dirt path. Dried pine needles crunched underneath Zack's feet with each step, but he barely noticed. Running through a forest with Sawyer was easy and familiar. Just another day on the job. What does John see in this place, anyway? Zack asked, the words bursting from him. Sawyer gave Zack a pointed glance, maintaining their steady pace. Pretty sure it's not Sapphire Cove that John is interested in. Zack thought of the way John lit up whenever speaking of Meredith. How he carried a picture of her with him at all times, a black and white self portrait she'd taken facing a mirror, her face mostly obscured by the Nikon camera. You know what I mean. Why does he have to change who he is for Meredith? She never asked him to leave the seals. Sawyer pursed his lips, the furrow between his brows telegraphing his displeasure. Birds chirped in the treetops, the only witnesses to their conversation. I thought you liked Mare. Zack did like Meredith. She was independent and strong and funny, and most of all, she made John happy. Zack's objections to the relationship had only appeared last week, when John dropped the bombshell that he was leaving the seals in 18 months. This isn't about her, and you know it, Zack said. Sawyer grunted, his face still pulled into a scowl. You're mad that John's breaking up our trio. Aren't you? Zack asked, disbelief, coloring his words. His whole plan is ridiculous. A scuba shop? That isn't us. He'll be bored in a week. They hopped over a fallen log without breaking pace, its branches long gone and trunk green with moss. I get why he's doing it, Sawyer said finally. Well, that makes one of us. He loves Meredith. He loves the seals, too. Zack skirted around a large rock in the pathway, reining in his emotions. This isn't an either-or situation. He can have a family and be a seal. Why does getting married mean he has to change careers? He loves Meredith, Sawyer repeated. She knew what she was getting into when she started dating a seal. Yes, and John knows that the divorce rate among seals is higher than 90%, Sawyer snapped back, his frustration finally leaking through. You know as well as I do that he'd be naive not to consider the possibility that their marriage can't survive his job. Zack had no comeback for that. Sometimes love alone wasn't enough, he'd seen the evidence of that in his squad. It wasn't easy to keep a marriage together when SEALs were often deployed 10 months a year and regularly put in 14-hour days when they were home. Which was exactly why Zack had never bothered with relationships. Sure, he might take a pretty girl to dinner while on leave, but he'd never let things get serious. Neither had Sawyer, or John for that matter, until he fell head over heels for Meredith. Women. They ruined everything. Maybe they'd be in the 5%, Zack said stubbornly. Meredith seems pretty tough. They ducked under a low-hanging branch, sending a pair of birds fluttering away. Bottom line? Sawyer said, a bitter edge, to his voice. I think John loves her more than he loves the seals. And that's why he wants to leave. Which was hard to argue with. Zack hated that. 
I know we promised we'd give Sapphire Cove a chance, Zack said. But just like we've agreed to see his side of things, he's got to see ours. Couldn't agree more, Sawyer said. They'll be here in a few days. Let's talk to him then. Zack nodded. They dropped Meredith and John off in Portland, something about cake tastings and bridesmaid dresses that Zack hadn't paid much attention to, before continuing to Sapphire Cove without them. Zack and Sawyer weren't interested in the wedding stuff, and it would give them a chance to explore the town without John's opinions suffocating them. The forest trail dropped them off at the edge of a park, right in the heart of Sapphire Cove. Kids hung from monkey bars, while moms in sunglasses and yoga pants watched from benches. Zack and Sawyer veered onto the walking path, slowing their run to a jog as they passed by an older gentleman walking a hyperborder collie. Welcome to small town America, Zack muttered. Sawyer's only response was a grunt. Main Street looked like it belonged on a postcard, which annoyed Zack for reasons he didn't want to explore. Flower baskets hung from lampposts, and the single story buildings looked picturesque with their brightly painted shutters and colorful shop signs. The town was a far cry from the deserts of the Middle East, where most of their deployments took them. How on earth did John plan to fit into this frilly utopia? They finally found a mechanic on 3rd Street, the dented sign hanging from a metal pole in the parking lot identifying it as Doug's Auto Shop. New tires sat in a stack outside one door, and a handwritten sign proclaimed 30% off, this week only. Think they have a tow truck? Zack asked, doubtfully. Sawyer shrugged, opening the front door. Maybe. Inside the shop, Zack stood still, letting his eyes adjust to the dim interior after the bright afternoon sun. Loud music with a heavy bass beat filtered in from the garage, where he heard what sounded like two men laughing as they worked. There was a large water stain on the ceiling, and Zack could see a few places where the faded linoleum flooring had worn through to the concrete. A rickety table held a nearly empty coffee pot, and two plastic chairs sat beside a water dispenser. Hi, a soft, feminine voice said, startling Zack. How can I help you? A woman stared at him from behind the front counter, her big blue eyes framed by dark lashes. Her equally dark hair hung in a loose braid over one shoulder, and she'd folded a red bandana into a thin strip and tied it around her head. She was young, perhaps 23 or 24, with nicely bronzed skin that said she spent a lot of time outdoors. A denim button-up shirt was tied at her waist, revealing a white tank top underneath. Her full lips turned up in a friendly smile, making her already pretty face even more beautiful. Zack blinked, trying to clear his head. When they'd gone hunting for a mechanic shop, he hadn't expected to run into such a beautiful woman. Um, hi, Zack said, walking up to the counter. I'm hoping you have a tow truck here, or at least can tell me where to find one. My truck broke down about three miles outside of town. I'm not sure what the problem is. Bummer. Yeah, we can give you a tow. We just require that you leave behind a photo ID and one form of payment. She flashed him another smile. Store policy. You understand. No problem. Zack pulled out his wallet and slapped his driver's license and a credit card on the counter. The woman picked up both and gave them a cursory examination, sending him a furtive glance beneath thick eyelashes that had his heart flipping. She pulled out a box beneath the counter and dropped his cards in. Southern California, huh? That's a long drive. Yeah, he said, unable to come up with something more creative. She'd short-circuited his brain, which was ridiculous. He'd seen beautiful women before and still been able to form coherent replies. When can we go? Sawyer asked, bringing Zack back to Earth. The truck. Right. Now should be fine, the woman said. Let me check with Doug. Oh, here he comes. The door behind the counter swung open, and Queen's We Are the Champions grew momentarily louder. A middle-aged man in coveralls wiped his hands on a greasy rag, barely glancing at Zack and Sawyer. Doug, these men need a tow, the woman said. Want me to do it? Zack blinked in surprise. He'd thought someone else would go with them. Not that a woman couldn't tow a truck, 
but he'd assumed from her lack of coveralls that she only worked the front desk. Doug eyed Zack and Sawyer, his mouth twisting into something like a grimace. A toothpick hovered between his lips, almost hidden by his full beard. Maybe I should send Mike out on this one. He'll be done with that oil change in another twenty minutes or so. No, I can do it. The woman opened a metal lockbox on the wall behind the counter. Rows of hooks held keys, and she grabbed one of the pairs. His ID and credit card are under the counter. If you're sure. Doug folded his arms in what Zack assumed was supposed to be an imposing manner. You got your cell phone with the location turned on? Yup. The woman pulled a phone from her back pocket, holding it up. Three miles outside of town, right? Was this Doug the woman's father, or just a concerned boss? Sometimes Zack forgot that he and his friends looked like they could bench press grown men, which tended to intimidate civilians. He ran a hand through his sandy blonde hair, trying to look harmless. Sawyer kept his hair military short whenever possible, but Zack took advantage of the allowances, given special ops teams, and kept his longer to help blend in. Yeah, about three miles, Zack said. Doug looked back and forth between Zack and Sawyer. And you walked here? We didn't have cell service. The white life fell effortlessly off Zack's tongue, like a million others he'd given while keeping his profession quiet. It wasn't that they couldn't tell people they were SEALs, they just chose to keep that information need to know. Revealing their profession tended to inspire either fear or hero worship in others, and Zack didn't much like either reaction. Besides, they never knew where their next stop would take them or who it would put them in contact with. Some things were better kept to themselves. Yeah, cell service can be spotty around here, depending on your provider. The woman motioned behind the counter. You can leave your bags here if you'd like. It'll be a tight fit in the truck with all three of us. Sawyer looked about to protest, but Zack raised one eyebrow. Leaving their luggage behind would help this woman and Doug feel even safer. That would be great, Zack said, pulling off his duffel bag and setting it on the counter. Sawyer did the same. Thanks. Doug's posture relaxed, and he gave the woman a nod. Shouldn't take you more than 90 minutes to get back here, then. Me and Mike will keep an eye on the front while you're gone. The woman nodded, and Doug went back into the garage. She grabbed their bags, setting them behind the counter before rounding it, revealing long legs clad in denim shorts. I'm Cheyenne, by the way. The name fit her perfectly. Sawyer bumped him in the shoulder, and Zack realized he'd taken too long to respond. I'm Zack, and this is my buddy Sawyer, he said. Tourists, she guessed. Something like that, Zack agreed. A small furrow appeared between Cheyenne's brows, as though the vagueness of his response surprised her. But her face quickly relaxed, and she nodded. Well, let's see if we can't get your truck operational soon. Let's go. Chapter 3 Cheyenne twisted the key ring around her index finger, trying not to stare at the two hulking men walking beside her. Late afternoon sunlight filtered through the dense canopy of trees, sending sunbeams arcing across the spider-webbed cracks of the parking lot. Birds chirped somewhere overhead, and she could taste the humidity of an approaching storm. The tow truck is back here in the employee lot, Cheyenne said, trying to sound confident. Doug had only taught her how to operate it two days ago, but she wanted to prove herself capable. Maybe then he'd let her do more than spend eight hours a day manning the cash register and doing inventory, with an occasional oil change or tire rotation thrown in if she was lucky. She knew working at Doug's auto shop was temporary, but she was going out of her mind with boredom. Besides, her skills might decline over the summer if she didn't put them to the test, at least occasionally. We really appreciate this, Zack said from where he walked beside her. There was a subtle drawl to his voice that brought to mind sweet tea and fireflies on warm summer nights. It went perfectly with his all-American good looks. Cheyenne had definitely done a double take when he walked into the store. Of course, Cheyenne said. Happy to help. Especially if it convinced Doug to let her get her hands dirty. She longed to be beneath the hood again, a crescent wrench in her hand and ache in her back as she worked on a faulty engine. 
We weren't sure Sapphire Cove would have a mechanic shop, Zack said. Cheyenne hadn't been sure what to expect when she'd first arrived in town either. Aspen had promised her a job at the inn, but she'd known that wouldn't be enough for her pocketbook or her soul. It hadn't taken long to find Doug's auto shop or to convince him to hire her for the busy summer season. It's a small town, but not that small, she said. Zack grunted. It made the hairs on the back of her neck stand at attention. Both men were gorgeous if Cheyenne was being honest with herself. They knew how to fill out a pair of jeans, and their muscles were evident beneath their tight t-shirts. Sawyer had a harder edge, with shortly cropped dark hair, unsmiling eyes, and a five o'clock shadow. Zack was more boy next door with dark blonde hair that stood on end in a way that suited him. His eyes were a piercing, light green color that reminded her of the ocean, and something about his smile made her knees a little shaky. Which was perfectly fine. Just because she wasn't interested in a relationship didn't mean she couldn't appreciate the view. Is it true that the town triples in size during the summer months? Sawyer asked. His voice was gruff, which Cheyenne expected given his appearance, but it was also soft, which surprised her every time he spoke. I'm not sure. I just got here a week and a half ago myself. Cheyenne motioned to the rusting, dark blue tow truck, appraising the men. Yeah, it'll definitely be a tight squeeze in the cab, but I think all three of us can fit. I hope neither of you is claustrophobic. Good thing you left your bags inside. We've been in tighter places than that, Zack said easily. What did that mean? A clarifying question was on the tip of her tongue, but she waited a beat too long to ask it and the moment passed. The doors were already unlocked and Cheyenne heaved herself up into the truck, a stretch for her short frame. Soon the three of them were crammed shoulder to shoulder inside the cab. Zack was sandwiched in the middle, his tanned arm brushing against hers as he shifted positions. The truck smelled of spilled coffee and stale cigarettes, but she also caught a whiff of Zack's aftershave, something crisp and clean that had her stomach fluttering. We've been in tighter places than that. Right now, she couldn't imagine Zack and Sawyer folding their hulking frames into a smaller space than this one. Body heat radiating off of Zack, warming her entire right side and making her face flush. Had he and Sawyer once tried to ride in a clown car or something? She shoved the key in the ignition, trying to collect her scattered thoughts, and the engine turned over with a satisfying roar. Which way? Cheyenne asked. Left. Zack's arm brushed hers again as he pointed. Out on the scenic highway. That surprised her, she'd learned pretty quickly that most visitors took the freeway into town. But she waited until there was a break in traffic, then obediently turned left. So, what brought you to Sapphire Cove? Zack asked. His tone was neutral, with the polite interest of a stranger making small talk. Tourist season, same as everyone else. Cheyenne cranked down the window, needing the salty sea air to help clear her senses. Did Zack bathe in pheromones or something? I needed a summer job, and my best friend talked me into coming home with her for a few months. Really, it had been the proximity to mom that had convinced Cheyenne to make the move. But she wasn't about to get into that with strangers. Is your friend from Sapphire Cove, then? Zack asked. Cheyenne nodded. Born and raised. She just got engaged and moved back to be near her fiancé. Both of them have family businesses in town they're planning to take over. Of course, that hadn't always been the plan, not until Aspen reluctantly came home two months ago to help with renovations on the family in over spring break, only to reconnect with her high school boyfriend. Days before that, Cheyenne and Aspen had talked about continuing to live together in Portland while they both started their careers, Aspen at some fancy hotel downtown and Cheyenne at an auto restoration shop. But all of that had been thrown out the window when Aspen and Dan got engaged. That's when Aspen had switched gears and started begging Cheyenne to move to Sapphire Cove. Then Mom had overdosed once again, and all of Cheyenne's plans had changed in a flash. Sounds like a similar story to our friend, Zack said. Thank heavens, he seemed oblivious to her inner turmoil. His fiancé is a Sapphire Cove native, too. In her peripheral vision, Cheyenne caught Zack flexing his hand where it rested on his knee. 
he's thinking about moving here after the wedding. He, not they? She seriously hoped this friend's fiancé had a say in this decision, otherwise, someone needed to tell that girl to run. But Cheyenne was probably misinterpreting things. Maybe your friend's fiancé knows Aspen and Dan, Cheyenne said. They might have gone to school together. What are their names? I'll ask Aspen. Meredith and John, Sawyer said. He was crouched forward, his shoulders hunched in front of Zach in an attempt to give them all more space. But John's not from around here. A tour bus flew by on one of the hairpin curves, making the tow truck's windows rattle. Beside her, Zach tensed, his arm and leg muscles hard as metal where they pressed against her side. Sorry, she said, gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. The highway can be a little scary sometimes. Beautiful though. Beside her, Zach said nothing. It was difficult to hear over the roar of the engine, but she thought maybe his breathing had picked up speed. Zach didn't strike her as the anxious type, but what did she know? She slowed down, taking the next curve more cautiously for his sake. Do you know Meredith? Sawyer asked. Cheyenne got the impression he was trying to deflect her attention from Zach. Was he scared of driving? Heights? All of the above? I don't think so. I haven't met many people yet. Cheyenne made her tone joking, eager to play along with Sawyer and put Zach at ease. Does she work at Doug's auto shop? That's where I spend most of my time. Sawyer chuckled. No, Mare is a photographer. She's really in demand, the tourists love having family pictures taken on the beach. I'll bet. Cheyenne's family had taken photos faithfully each fall until her dad passed, complete with coordinated outfits picked out weeks in advance by her mother. Usually, mom would have some big meltdown the morning of the shoot, and dad would pull Cheyenne aside and remind her to be on her best behavior that day. You said your friend isn't from here. Does he live in California too, then? Yeah, Zach said. An awkward silence stretched as neither man volunteered more information, and Cheyenne scrambled for something to fill it. Well, Aspen loves living in Sapphire Cove, she said. And so far, I'm enjoying it, too. It seems like a great place to settle down. Not that she had any plans to make this her permanent home. Being out of contact with mom had been hard, like taking a full breath after a long bout of pneumonia. Cleansing. Exhilarating. But also somehow wrong. The whole thing felt like a long vacation, and Cheyenne wasn't about to get too comfortable. Whether mom finished the program or not, once she moved back to Portland, Cheyenne would need to keep an eye on her. Besides, she could find a much higher paying job in the city, one where she was allowed to do more than count the till before close each night, and if she ever wanted to open her garage, she needed a nice paycheck to help build her savings account back up. So, does your friend's family own the mechanic shop? Zach asked. She supposed it was a logical assumption, but it irked Cheyenne, like the only way she could get a job there was through nepotism. No, the Sapphire Inn. I'm working there this summer. Two. Wow, two jobs? You're a busy woman. Zach seemed less tense beside her, his tone friendlier. Maybe he hadn't picked up on her annoyance. Isn't the Sapphire Inn where Meredith made us reservations? Sawyer asked. Zach nodded. Yeah, I think it is. Huh, Cheyenne would have pegged them as more chain hotel tourists. The Sapphire Inn was beautiful but a little cutesy for these two burly men. The inn tended to cater to couples on a romantic getaway. Maybe Sawyer and Zach were together? No, that didn't fit. She'd seen the way they both checked her out back at the store, not in a gross way or anything, but a woman knew when she was being admired. Mayor said it's the nicest hotel in town, Sawyer said. It's a bed and breakfast, not a hotel, but it is nice, Cheyenne said. Aspen's fiancé, Dan, just finished remodeling the whole thing. It's basically brand new. Lucky us, Zach said with a grin. Cheyenne quickly focused on the road again. If he kept throwing her those hundred watt smiles, she was going to crash. Zach pointed down the road, distracting her once more. 
My truck is around this next bend and about 15 yards down the road. We pulled as far into the trees as we could. Great, Cheyenne said. Let's go rescue it. And maybe, if she was lucky, she'd find out more about Zach while she worked. Chapter 4 Cheyenne rounded the curve and saw Zach's truck immediately, its rust-splattered tailgate peeking out of the trees. Huh. She'd expected something more along the lines of a shiny Ford 4x4 with a lift when Zach had mentioned a truck, but the Chevy C-K3500 was a work vehicle. She drove past it, flipping on the tow truck's hazard lights as she came to a stop. Her nose nearly pressed against Zach's shoulder as she slowly reversed, edging her back bumper toward the stranded vehicle. Cheyenne bit her lip, trying to focus on aligning the two trucks and not the crisp, clean scent of his aftershave. She managed to do it in one shot and killed the engine, eager to put some distance between her and Zach. Her boots made squelching noises in the patchy, moss-covered mud as she took in his truck, assessing. She'd been right to assume it was a workhorse, the two bench seats in the cab clearly intended for function, not comfort. The truck's white paint had faded to a dingy gray pockmarked with rust. She'd guess it was 30 years old, maybe 35 based on the style, technically old enough to be a classic, but the make and model wasn't anything unique. Considering the state of the body, she had little hope for what condition she'd find things in under the hood. Still, with a little elbow grease, it could be beautiful. I know she's not much to look at, Zach's soft drawl said behind Cheyenne, but I'm hoping this wasn't her last ride. She tried not to shiver as his breath hit the side of her neck. With enough time and money, almost any vehicle is salvageable. Mind if I take a look? He held out his arm in a be-my-guest gesture. Anticipation raced through Cheyenne, and she couldn't help but grin as she popped the hood with a screech of metal. Doug probably wouldn't be thrilled she'd done an assessment, but Cheyenne was a certified mechanic, and staring at the engine block wouldn't somehow make the problem worse. She noticed the smell of burned oil first, a clear sign there was a leak somewhere. The trees blocked out most of the sunlight, and the open hood made things even darker. She squinted as her eyes, tried to adjust, taking in the clear signs of neglect. Green liquid tinged with white covered a good portion of the visible surfaces, for starters. How does she look? Zach asked. Cheyenne forced a smile. She's leaking oil and antifreeze and the timing belt needs to be replaced. Doug will do a full assessment back at the shop and let you know what the bigger problems are. What kind of issues was she giving you? She was making weird sounds, kind of revving, and then slowing down, Zach said. And then the engine just died. We managed to coast into the trees before she quit entirely. Add engine problems to the possible cracked radiator and worn-out pistons and cylinders, not to mention all the other issues she'd already catalogued. Cheyenne had a feeling it was going to cost more than this truck was worth to get it operational again. Too bad. She hated seeing formerly good vehicles turned into scrap metal. How long has she been giving you issues? Cheyenne asked. I'm not sure. I don't drive her much. And yet he decided to take an unreliable vehicle up the coast? How did he get around if he didn't drive the truck? City buses? Seemed weird when you had access to your own wheels. We'll get her back to the shop and up on blocks, Cheyenne said. It's hard to diagnose out here, with poor lighting and no tools. We'll know more then. She shut the hood, turning to find Zach closer than she'd realized. Her breath hitched as he took a step back. His arms were folded across his expansive chest, and she couldn't help but notice his biceps. Holy crap. Did he bench press minivans for fun? Sawyer stood beside him, looking equally muscled, but with an unreadable expression. You seem to know a lot about cars, Zack said. Sawyer remained silent, but Cheyenne thought the corner of his mouth twitched upward for half a second. For her part, she tried not to sigh as she began unrolling the tow cable. Most mechanics do. You're a mechanic. Zach asked, and Sawyer quickly covered his mouth with one hand. Men. They were all the same. She thought, okay, hoped, that maybe Zach was different. Let me guess, 
you thought I was just eye candy for the front desk. Cheyenne bit out the words. The token female employee, so they can claim their business, doesn't discriminate. Sawyer hooted, any attempts to hide his mirth gone. Zack rubbed the back of his neck, face flushing red. His obvious embarrassment was doing things to Cheyenne's body temperature. I didn't mean, Zack began. Obviously, women can be mechanics. I was just saying. Sawyer's hand landed on his friend's shoulder with an audible thump. Quit while you're ahead, man. Cheyenne's lips twitched upward in a reluctant grin. Maybe she was being too hard on Zack. He and Sawyer had both been perfect gentlemen and weren't responsible for the years of misogyny she'd been subjected to as a woman in a man's world. She'd give them the benefit of the doubt, this time, at least. You were just saying you've never met a female mechanic, Cheyenne said. Not true, Zack shot back. I mean, I'm sure I have. Cheyenne bent down under the pretense of checking something so they wouldn't see her roll her eyes. But you can't think of any right now. No, I guess not, Zack said, and Sawyer hooted. Of course not, Cheyenne muttered. She pulled the winch toward the end of the flatbed, trying to ignore the two very distracting men and remember the exact steps Doug had shown her two days before. Zack took a step forward. Here, let me help with that. You're not helping your case. Cheyenne pushed the button to lower the ramp. I've got it. This will only take a few minutes. At least, that's what she hoped. Doug had walked her through the process three times, before letting her attempt it herself, and it had been simple enough. The lift's hydraulics did most of the work. We don't mind, Zack said. I do, Shay encountered, making sure she'd lined the ramp up correctly with the wheels of Zack's truck. Perfect. She tossed the chain between the wheels, then crouched down to grab it. She found the holes in the frame and hooked in the chain on the first side. You guys can wait in the cab of the tow truck if you want. The men didn't get in the tow truck, but they stayed quiet after that, letting her work. That surprised Cheyenne, in a good way. She'd expected big, burly men like them to be incapable of letting a woman do a man's job solo. But here they were, watching her work without further commentary. She could feel Zack's eyes tracking her every movement, but it didn't feel judgmental. More curious. After double-checking the chains, she pulled the cable tight before putting Zack's truck in neutral and letting the tow truck's hydraulics pull it onto the ramp. Almost done, she said, glancing over her shoulder at the men. No rush, Zack said. There was something about him that intrigued her. Something that reminded her she was only 24 and hadn't been on a date in over a year. When was the last time a man had watched her work without a running commentary on what she should do differently, whether or not he knew anything about cars? Maybe, if mom got better. Cheyenne wouldn't think about that right now. Soon, the truck was pulled into place, and the ramp returned to the bed of the tow truck. Cheyenne double-checked the ratchet straps, making sure that everything was locked in place. Perfect. The entire process had only taken 15 minutes and she wasn't even sweaty from the effort. She couldn't help the surge of pride as she turned back toward the men. All done. We can head back now. Zack nodded, his eyebrows lifting. She had a sense that she'd impressed him, taken him off guard, perhaps, and while part of her wondered if she should be insulted yet again, it thrilled her for reasons she couldn't afford to examine. Sure, Zack was hot. He had that whole mysterious, brooding thing down. There was a tension to him that intrigued her. But he and Sawyer were only passing through town, and she wasn't interested in a summer fling. Back in the tow, she slowly pulled back onto the scenic highway, Zack's body pressed up against the length of hers once more. Sorry about earlier, he said. I didn't mean to imply you can't do the job on your own. You're obviously very capable, and I expected nothing less. Her opinion of him went up a notch at the apology. She couldn't remember the last time a man had said sorry to her. Zack isn't used to standing by when he could help, Sawyer said. We're doers and don't like watching others work while we're idle. Hmm. She hadn't thought of it that way. No need to apologize. 
and I didn't mean to snap at you. You didn't, Zack assured her. Thanks again for your help. With the truck, I mean. He seemed oddly attached to it. Maybe it was the first vehicle he'd purchased? Cheyenne could relate, she bought a white 1984 Toyota Celica the year she turned 15. It hadn't been much, but she loved that car. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's my job, but I'm happy to help. Sawyer chuckled, and Zack shoved him with his shoulder. They were wedged so tightly together that Sawyer barely moved. Don't be like that, man, Zack said. That stupid truck means a lot to me. I didn't say a thing, Sawyer said. How could the truck mean so much to Zack, but also be so neglected? Cheyenne wanted to peel back the layers of Zack and find out what had beneath the surface, which was exactly why she wouldn't ask her questions. Good thing he wasn't staying in town for long. Acting on her impulse would be a terrible idea. Back at Doug's, Cheyenne drove to the graveled lot at the back of the building. We've got cars being worked on in both bays right now, so I'll just leave your truck on the tow, Cheyenne explained as they climbed out of the tow truck. When will it be looked at? Zack asked. Cheyenne was dying to more thoroughly check things out herself, really get her hands dirty, but doubted Doug would give her permission. Hopefully later tonight, but maybe not until morning, Cheyenne said. Any chance it'll be up and running again by tomorrow evening? Zack asked. She seriously doubted the truck would ever be operational again. Not unless Zack had a lot of money that he wanted to sink into what most would deem a lost cause. It would probably be cheaper to buy a new vehicle than to get this one running again. But she couldn't tell Zack that unless she wanted to get on her new boss's bad side. Doug should be able to give you a more accurate estimate after he takes a look. What she wouldn't give to tow Zack's truck back to Portland. Mom had let Cheyenne take over the detached garage a few years earlier, and it was filled with all the tools and equipment she'd slowly acquired over the years. After one of her more expensive carjacks had gone missing a year ago, suspiciously coinciding with one of Mom's more intense episodes, Cheyenne had confronted her. Mom had denied selling the tool, her face splotchy with outrage and eyes brimming with guilt. Cheyenne had gone out that night and bought a padlock for the door. Mom never mentioned the lock, further confirmation of her guilt, as far as Cheyenne was concerned, and neither of them spoke of it again. Inside the auto shop, Cheyenne was surprised to see Aspen sitting in one of the sagging chairs with a rip in the leather cushion next to the rickety table, holding an empty coffee pot. She held an ancient copy of some muscle car magazine in her hands, idly flipping through it as she chewed bubblegum. Aspen, Cheyenne said. Her friend looked up, eyes widening as she took in the two men behind Cheyenne. She quickly dropped the magazine and stood. Uh, hey. What are you doing here? Cheyenne asked. Dan and I were at the print shop across the street when his work called. There's some issue at a job site just outside of town. I told him to go ahead, and I'd catch a ride home with you. Hope that's okay? Yeah, of course, Cheyenne said. I should be off soon. No rush. I don't mind waiting. Aspen was barely looking at Cheyenne, her attention on Zack and Sawyer. She held out a hand, her voice turning sweet. Hi, I'm Aspen. What brings you two to town? Oh boy. Cheyenne darted through the glass door that led to the shop, not willing to leave Aspen alone with the men for long. No doubt she'd try to convince one, oh gosh, or maybe both, of the guys to ask Cheyenne out as a backup if none of the guys on Dan's crew came through. Like Cheyenne couldn't be happy unless she was in a committed relationship. The clank of tools and pulse of electric guitars echoed off the concrete and metal walls of the shop. Legs poked out from underneath a minivan, the thick calves straining the fabric of the coveralls a clear indication it was dug under the van and not Mike. I'm back, Cheyenne said, raising her voice to be heard over the cacophony. I left the truck on the tow, so we can bring it into the bay later. Doug slid out from underneath the van, the toothpick between his teeth almost hidden by his thick beard. Good. I was worried about sending you off alone with those two. They're giants. They're nice, Cheyenne countered defensively. Doug wouldn't have thought twice about sending Mike out on the job. 
Any trouble with the tow? No, but they're wanting an ETA on when it'll be up and running again. Darn tourists are always in a hurry. Why come to a nice, quiet town like Sapphire Cove and then rush everywhere? Cheyenne hid a grin. I took a quick look under the hood, and I think we're dealing with multiple issues. Frayed timing belt, cracked radiator. Might need to replace the pistons and cylinders, and I think the engine has something wrong with it. Doug pushed himself up with a groan, then grabbed a greasy cloth from the pocket of his coveralls and wiped his hands. You didn't tell them anything, did you? Nothing concrete. Might not be worth fixing if it's as bad as you say. Cheyenne folded her arms, trying to look casual. Maybe not. I can take a closer look if you're too busy. She held her breath, hoping against hope that Doug would say yes. But he shook his head, and she let out her breath in a whoosh. I need you manning the front desk. Me or Mike will look at it when we're done with the Civic and the caravan. She tried one more time, the desire to work on Zach's truck, any vehicle, stronger than her fear of being pushy. I don't mind staying late to go over it. I can even move it in and out of the bay so it's not taking up room. No, Mike will handle it. Cheyenne bit back a sigh but didn't argue further. Maybe, if she kept nagging Doug, he'd eventually let her prove she knew her way around a garage. Not only did she have all of her certifications from a technical college, but she also had a bachelor's degree in automotive technology, for heaven's sake, a rarity for a mechanic. From what she'd been able to gather, Doug had hired Mike right out of high school and let him under a hood on day one. Any 12-year-old could change the oil or rotate tires. Cheyenne wanted to do more. How would it look when she applied for a real job in Portland if she had to list desk clerk as her last gig? I'll come in and talk to them, Doug said. Cheyenne nodded, following him back into the store. Her ears rang at the sudden quiet after the noise of the garage. Zack and Sawyer were waiting expectantly at the counter, Aspen perched on one of the stools lining it. Doug pulled Zack's driver's license and credit card out from underneath the counter and slid them over to him. It might be tomorrow morning before I can take a look under the hood, Doug said. After that, I should have a better idea of how long the repair will take. Depending on the issue and what parts one need, it could take anywhere from two days to a couple of weeks. Sorry, I can't give you a more definitive timeline. I understand, Zach said. Are you boys here to stay or just passing through? We're here, at least for a couple of weeks, Sawyer said. Maybe three. That long? Cheyenne perked up at the information. Good, Doug said. Cheyenne can help you find a car rental if you need one. There's nothing in town, but you should be able to find something in Harbor Bay or Paradise Green. That's okay, Zach said. I don't think we need a vehicle, at least not until we know how long the truck will be. Doug nodded, sliding a notepad and pen across the counter. Write down a number where I can contact you, and I'll let you know what I find as soon as I take a look. Cheyenne looked away, placing a hand to one cheek. She absolutely, positively would not look at that number and memorize it. Zach and Sawyer were just telling me they're staying at my parents' inn, Aspen said, raising her eyebrows at Cheyenne as she chewed her gum. I suggested they check out the summer opening at the pier tonight. She wouldn't. Cheyenne glared at Aspen, jabbing a finger at her behind Zach and Sawyer's backs and mouthing, don't you dare. Aspen grinned, turning her attention back to the men. Cheyenne's off work in a minute. Why don't you let us drive you to the inn? That way you don't have to carry your luggage. Oh, we wouldn't want to impose, Sawyer said, grabbing his duffel bag from where Doug had set it on the counter. No, that's a good idea, Doug said, dropping Zach's bag on the counter next. Cheyenne can take off now. It's only five minutes early and there ain't any customers here. Apparently, she had no say in this. Cheyenne's eyes met Zach's, her entire body feeling warm. Sure. Doug nodded at Zach. I'll give you a call, sometime tonight or tomorrow. I appreciate it, Zach said. Okay then. Cheyenne grabbed her purse from underneath the counter, a thin crossbody bag that was more utilitarian than cute. 
Guess I'll see you tomorrow? Doug nodded, giving a wave before disappearing back into the garage. And just like that, she was dismissed. Cheyenne pulled her keys from her purse. I'm parked around back. As they all filed outside, Zach leaned close to Cheyenne, his voice low enough that only she could hear. You don't have to drive us to the inn. Doug put you on the spot, and Sawyer, and I don't mind walking. Cheyenne gazed up at Zach, feeling like she'd jumped from a hot tub into a glacier lake. He had to be over six feet tall, with broad shoulders that nearly blocked the sun. His expression was so earnest. So sincere. Like he worried that driving them for five minutes would somehow be a major inconvenience. She should take the out, they probably wouldn't even fit in her convertible. It wasn't that far to the inn, and Zach and Sawyer were definitely in good enough shape to traverse the distance. But Cheyenne surprised herself by saying, No, it's okay. I really don't mind driving you. There was something in Zach's eyes, a hint of the secrets yet revealed, that she couldn't resist. Besides, it would be unbelievably petty to make them walk when she was already going in that direction. In that case, thank you, Zach said. Again. Cheyenne inhaled a shaky breath, forcing herself to look away. Of course. It's just a car ride, she told herself. But it felt like the beginning of so much more. Chapter 5 Zach should have insisted they walk to the inn. Aspen had said it was only a few blocks away, and he shouldn't bother Cheyenne any more than he already had. He needed to get away from her. There was a pull between them, a connection, that he didn't understand and should definitely ignore. You gave her an out, he reminded himself. It was just a ride, a short one, even. What was the worst that could happen? He was overthinking this. Maybe their connection was all in his head. Zack and Sawyer followed the women around the side of Doug's auto shop, the blacktop transitioning to gravel that crunched with every step. Beside him, Sawyer's intense gaze had Zack breaking out in a sweat. He could read Sawyer's mind as clearly as if he'd spoken aloud. Years of entering battle together had fine-tuned them to one another's thoughts, even the wordless ones. Zack's gaze drifted to the two rusted-out cars in the back of the lot, instantly remembering the time he, Sawyer, and John had hidden behind similar junkers during a shootout in Baghdad. They'd worked together like a single unit, anticipating each other's actions and movements. It had saved their lives that day, and many others before and since. But right now, Sawyer was wrong. Sure, Cheyenne was an attractive woman. Downright distracting, actually. There was something endearing about the way she'd tied a lightweight denim shirt around her waist, not to mention the way it emphasized her curves. And yeah, those shorts showed off her gorgeous legs fantastically. But it didn't matter how great she looked. How sexy Zach found her knowledge of mechanics. The seals had provided him with a purpose when he had none. Had given him direction and security when he was floundering. More than that, they'd given him a family. For better or for worse, Zach was a frogman. Relationships would always have to take a back seat to his job. That was why he definitely wasn't interested in Cheyenne, whatever Sawyer's eyebrow raise suggested. Zach was only staying in Sapphire Cove long enough to convince John that this town wasn't for any of them. Then, once he got back on base, Zach would apply to officer candidate school and work his butt off to become a junior lieutenant. He'd be an idiot not to. Gravel crunched beneath their feet, filling the silence. Three cars sat in the lot, aside from the junkers and the tow truck, which still held Zach's truck. There was a shiny green SUV that looked new, a gold Honda Accord with the scratched exterior of a well-used car, and a classic convertible with a flawless baby blue paint job. Sorry, it's going to be a tight fit, Cheyenne said. You'll probably have to hold your bags on your laps. Zach's eyebrows raised involuntarily. He'd assumed she drove the well-used Accord, but unless its trunk was full. Don't worry, the inn isn't far, Aspen added over her shoulder. It's better than walking, right? Better? Well, he supposed that depended on your perspective. We don't mind holding our bags, Sawyer said. We just appreciate the lift. Zach definitely shouldn't appreciate the extra time with Cheyenne. 
She walked past the shiny green SUV, just as he'd suspected she would. Then she bypassed the scratched gold car. Finally, she paused in front of the beautifully restored classic convertible, whose style suggested it was from the 60s or 70s. When she pulled out a keychain and unlocked the door, he couldn't help the way his heart rate increased. This is your car, he asked. It had sleek lines, and the white leather interior looked brand new. The sun hit the light blue paint just right, making it shimmer. Cheyenne raised her eyebrows, dropping into the driver's seat. Yeah. That one word felt like a challenge, and Zach's attraction to her grew even stronger. Women rarely challenged him. They flirted with him, sure. Sometimes they even seemed to fear him. But Cheyenne's reactions were something different. If he didn't get these feelings under control soon, he would be in big trouble. The last thing he needed was to turn into John and end up making stupid decisions because of a girl. She's a beaut, Zach said. The car, I mean. Cheyenne smirked as the convertible's top began folding back. Thanks. I restored her myself. Crap. Zach was pretty sure he wanted to marry this girl. That's incredible. You do fantastic work. For a girl, you mean, Cheyenne said. Zach grinned, loving the way she argued with him. For anyone. Don't let Che give you a hard time, Aspen piped in. She's amazing with car stuff, but gets a lot of crap for being a woman. Aspen, Cheyenne began, but her friend cut her off with a glare. She just graduated with her auto mechanics degree, top 1% of her class, Aspen said. Did she tell you? Zach gave Cheyenne a long, appraising look. She'd said she was a mechanic, but this was something more, a true artist, and a smart one at that. No, she didn't. Cheyenne shrugged like it was no big deal. Climb in. Hopefully, you'll have a little more room with the top down. Good call, Sawyer said. Soon, Zach and Sawyer were settled in the back, their bags crowding their laps and knees, practically touching their chests. Cheyenne slipped on a pair of sunglasses that nearly covered her cheekbones, and Zach's entire body grew warm as he stared at her reflection in the rearview mirror. This girl was freaking awesome. What made you decide to become a mechanic? Zach asked as the convertible purred to life. It's just something I've always enjoyed, Cheyenne said vaguely. What year is this? Sawyer asked. In 1966, Thunderbird. Cheyenne pulled onto the road. She was just a shell when I found her, so the guy practically gave her away. Cheyenne spent every free moment restoring this convertible for almost two years, Aspen said, the pride evident in her voice. She did every bit of the work herself. Okay, Zach was definitely in love. Maybe you should be the one fixing my truck instead of Doug. Seems like there's no challenge you can't overcome. The back of Cheyenne's neck turned red, and Zach found even that show of embarrassment attractive. He was dying to know how she had gotten into restoring old cars. What was someone with a gift like hers doing at the front desk of a pretty average auto shop in some tiny Oregon town? I'm sure Doug has it well in hand, Cheyenne said. Which still didn't explain why she was working the cash register instead of working under the hood, but after her previous vague answers, Zach wasn't going to ask. The car glided smoothly along the quiet streets of Sapphire Cove. In less than five minutes, Cheyenne pulled into the parking lot of a frilly Victorian mansion that looked more like a gingerbread house than a hotel. The exterior was painted a vibrant sapphire blue with white trim, and Zach held back a groan. What had Meredith been thinking, reserving them a room at a place like this? It looked more like a cozy place to spend an anniversary than a comfortable hotel for two dudes. Wasn't there a chain hotel they could have stayed at? Here we are, Cheyenne said, pulling around the circular driveway and stopping in front of the inn's front steps. Want us to come in and make sure you get checked in, okay? Aspen asked. She flicked a glance at Cheyenne, wiggling her eyebrows. We don't mind. Was Aspen trying to set Cheyenne up with one of them? Since Aspen was engaged, he doubted she was flirting for herself. Zach instantly hoped she was trying to set Cheyenne up with him, then quickly squashed the desire. 
either way, she was probably out of luck. Zack couldn't afford to be interested, and Sawyer didn't date much, either. Hadn't dated at all, since Meredith joined their little trio. We'll be fine, Sawyer said. He was already out of the convertible, duffel in hand. Thanks for the ride. Yeah, we appreciate it, Zack echoed, getting out as well. He rested a hand on the door, leaning down so he was eye-level with Cheyenne. I don't know what we would have done today without your help. Maybe we'll see you at the pier tonight. Aspen blew a bubble with her gum. We're heading there in about an hour. Okay, Aspen was definitely trying to push Cheyenne toward one of them. Cheyenne adjusted her sunglasses, and Zack wished he could see her expression. Did she want him to come to the pier? Did he want her to want him to come to the pier? You're playing a dangerous game, sailor, he told himself sternly. If you come tonight, make sure to find us and say hi, Cheyenne said, resting her arm out the car's open window. Her voice was even, her tone neutral. Why did she have to wear sunglasses? He wasn't sure if Cheyenne was being polite, or if she hoped they'd run into each other again. We'll do that, Zack said. I'm not sure what our plans are yet but the pier sounds like a lot of fun. Maybe we'll see you there then, Cheyenne said. She put the car in gear, and Zack stepped back. He lifted a hand as the convertible drove away. The baby blue glided smoothly down the drive, then turned the corner and disappeared behind a wall of trees. Sawyer shook his head, climbing the inn's front steps. Wow. That didn't take long. What are you talking about? I didn't think you'd fall for a local girl. Sawyer shook his head again. We've been in town, what? An hour tops? Zack hurried up the stairs after Sawyer, his conscience prickling. I'm not falling for a local girl. John's the romantic, not me. You're such a bad liar. Zack ground his teeth, not sure if he was more frustrated with Sawyer or himself. Am I attracted to Cheyenne? Yes. I'd have to be dead, not to be. But that doesn't mean I'm going to do anything about it. Good, Sawyer said. Dealing with John's lovesick self is plenty. Zack winced, remembering an uncomfortable few moments after he and Sawyer had walked in on Meredith and John kissing. It had been pretty early in Meredith and John's relationship, and she'd driven down to Coronado for a visit. Zack and Sawyer hadn't realized Meredith was in town and had barged into John's room unannounced. It had been jarring to see his best friend passionately embracing a woman instead of holding a gun. The image shifted, and Zack suddenly saw himself embracing Cheyenne. He opened the door to the inn with a yank, pushing aside the thought. Maybe a relationship was enough for John. But Zack needed the seals. The lobby of the inn was small, but nice with intricate crown moldings and crisp, clean lines. The smell of fresh paint still hung in the air, and the dark wood flooring gleamed. A large watercolor of the beach hung behind the empty front desk, and next to a small silver bell, there was a bowl of something that looked like dried rose petals and smelled floral. Zack stifled a groan as Sawyer rang the bell, the clear sound echoing through the small space. Why would Meredith have made us reservations here? Zack asked in a whisper. This looks like the kind of place couples stay at on their honeymoon. She said this was the nicest place in town, Sawyer whispered back, although he looked a little uncomfortable too. Mare just wants us to have a good experience, so we'll move here. She knows it'll make John happy if we're all together. Yeah, Zack wanted them all to be together, too, in the Navy, like they had been for the last decade. But that would mean John wouldn't have Meredith. As much as Zack hated for things to change, he couldn't wish that on his best friend. Not after seeing how happy John and Meredith were together. Still, this place was a little much. If there's only one bed, we're rock paper scissoring for it, Zack said. Loser takes the floor. Mare would have thought of that. Are you willing to bet your bet on it? Sawyer rolled his eyes. You're being a pansy. There's running water, no cockroaches, this is paradise, compared to our last op. At least it's only a few nights, Zack muttered. 
He wasn't above dogpiling with other members of his squad to stay warm when sleeping outdoors in below freezing temperatures, but this was different. A tall woman appeared from the back office, interrupting their conversation. She wore a blue vest with a shiny gold name tag and had a broad smile on her lined face. Hi there. Welcome to the Sapphire Inn. How can I help you? We have a reservation, Sawyer said, resting an arm on the counter. It should be under Sawyer Gray. Ten minutes later, they were walking up a winding staircase to the room with a bronze number three on the door. Sawyer unlocked it with his key card, and Zach let out a grunt. Two beds, that was a point in Meredith's favor. See? Sawyer said, holding out an arm. I told you Mare had thought of everything. Zach dropped his bag on the closest bed, taking in their new surroundings. One window along the far wall. It appeared to be a solid pane, the type not meant to open, but the large tree outside it made for an easy entry or exit point for anyone trained. It's nice, Zach said begrudgingly. Better than their usual digs, for sure. Probably better than the air mattress he'd soon be sleeping on at Meredith's beachside bungalow, not that he really minded. Meredith had offered to give them her spare key so they could stay at her house immediately, for going to hotel, but neither Zack nor Sawyer had felt comfortable intruding on her home without John present. They'd switch from the inn to Meredith's in a few days, once the couple was back in town and John could stay at the bungalow with them. Sawyer dropped his bag on the far bed and turned to Zack. Real talk? Sawyer asked. Zack nodded, shoving his hands in his pockets. He didn't want to have this conversation, but he figured they needed to. I know it seems crazy that John wants us to move here, but we promised we'd give the town a real chance, so that's what we need to do. Mare and John will know if we're faking it. Zack blinked, surprised. He thought Sawyer was going to rag on him more for flirting with Cheyenne, if you could even call their conversation flirting. He pushed thoughts of Cheyenne, and the promotion he hadn't told Sawyer or John about, out of his head and tried to focus on what Sawyer was saying. Yes, they needed to come to an understanding on this. And as much as Zack hated it, Sawyer was right. I know, Zack said with a sigh. I'll try to give this place an honest chance. It's just hard to imagine life as a civilian. Well, this is as good of a trial run as any, Sawyer said. Once John sees that we've tried, it will be easier to present our side of the argument. Which meant Sawyer was on Zack's side. Good. Do you think there's any chance that John will change his mind? Sawyer lifted his shoulder in a shrug. Maybe. By which you mean no. Zack pushed a hand through his hair. This sucks. The odds aren't in our favor, but that's never stopped us before. No, but they also didn't enter battles they knew they would lose. What should we do first? Sawyer asked. Mare and John will be here in two days, and I want to show them we've made progress. Cheyenne's bright red lips flashed into Zack's mind. He should try to avoid her. Definitely shouldn't orchestrate chance encounters. But in the spirit of trying to act like a civilian. He tried to keep his voice casual. We could check out the pier. Sawyer raised one eyebrow. Aspen made it sound pretty cool, Zack continued, intentionally mentioning the engaged best friend instead of Cheyenne. And this has nothing to do with Cheyenne's invitation, Sawyer stated. Of course not, Zack said. I mean, it's not like there's much to do around here. Nothing is more Sapphire Cove than the summer opening at the pier, right? John will be happy we went. Sawyer stared at him for a long moment. Zack met him stare for stare, refusing to blink. Okay, Sawyer said finally. Yeah, that sounds fun. Mares talked about the pier a lot, so we should check it out. Cool. Zack grabbed his duffel bag. I'm just going to hop in the shower real fast, then we can go. You're taking a shower? Sweaty from the run, Zack said, trying to sound casual. He definitely wasn't freshening up in case he ran into Cheyenne. It had just been a long day spent in the car, then trekking three miles through the woods. I'll be ready to go in twenty minutes. It didn't matter if he saw Cheyenne at the pier, 
because he was only in town for a few weeks, anyway. Tonight was about convincing John they'd given the town a solid chance. Chapter 6 Cheyenne held her breath as the roller coaster raced down the track, flipping the world upside down as it entered a loop before leveling out again. In front of her, Aspen had her hands in the air, her shrill scream of delight piercing the sky. Beside Aspen, Dan mimicked her pose, his deep woohoo, joining her higher pitch. The seat beside Cheyenne's was empty, a visual reminder that she was nothing but a third wheel her best friend had taken pity on. For a moment, she could almost imagine Zach occupying that space, a mysterious half-smile on his ridiculously handsome features. What secrets hid behind that brooding expression? She would never find out. Couldn't risk any further interest. Her only goal this summer was to make enough money to keep mom in rehab. Zach wouldn't be sticking around town for long, anyway. Neither would Cheyenne. As soon as mom was better, it was back to Portland for both of them. Too bad the job offer at the Classic Car Museum would be long gone by then. But Cheyenne would find something else, maybe even something that paid better, and start saving up again for her garage. She could move back home since rooming with Aspen was out. It would serve the dual purpose of cutting costs and helping her keep a close eye on mom. The roller coaster crested another hill before taking a sharp dive. Cheyenne tried to give herself over to the thrill of the moment. Tried to unclench her muscles and let out a joyful laugh. It was no use. Her mind wasn't on the dips and curves of the track, it was back on the phone call with Dr. Robbins. What if mom really did leave the program? Cheyenne didn't have a backup plan. The roller coaster jerked to a halt. Metal gears ground against the track with a high-pitched screech, making her cringe. Aspen turned in her seat, grinning broadly while her eyes sparkled with anticipation. Well, you've now ridden the world-famous Sapphire Cove roller coaster. What did you think? World-famous might be a bit of a stretch, Dan said dryly. Aspen swatted him on the arm. Don't be mean. Seriously, Che. What did you think? Cheyenne barely registered the question. She'd get to speak to mom sometime in the next week or two. Maybe, if she said the right words in the right tone, she could convince mom to give the treatment center a real chance. Aspen's face fell, and Cheyenne realized she'd taken too long to respond. Her friend faced forward again, leaning back against her seat with a loud sigh. Dan put an arm around his fiancé's shoulder, and Aspen rested her head against his. Crap. Now Cheyenne wasn't only failing her mother, but disappointing her best friend. It was great, she said quickly. Okay, Aspen replied, not turning around. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Dang. Cheyenne lifted her dark hair off her neck, suddenly feeling hot. She hated disappointing people. The roller coaster jerked forward again, slowly making its way toward the loading zone. Maybe, if Cheyenne could act enthusiastic enough for the rest of the evening, she could make it up to Aspen. She was so tired of never being enough for the people in her life. Back at the loading zone, they all piled out of the carts and followed the crowd onto the main thoroughfare Sapphire Pier. Aspen matched her pace with Cheyenne's, hanging back to walk beside her, and Dan matched his stride to Aspen's. Are you okay? Aspen asked. Yeah, of course. The answer was knee-jerk, and Cheyenne didn't feel like analyzing whether or not it was true. What would it be like to be any other 24-year-old, enjoying a carefree summer with her best friend? Maybe eyeing Zach as a summer fling? Aspen wrapped an arm around Cheyenne's shoulders, her eyes full of empathy. You're doing your best. You know that, right? For your mom, I mean. Dr. Robbins. Is just preparing you for the worst-case scenario. It's still very possible that your mom could adjust to rehab and decide to take the treatment seriously. Cheyenne gave a helpless shrug, emotion clogging her throat. Yeah, you're probably right. You're doing a good thing for your mom, Dan said, giving Cheyenne one of his rare smiles. She's lucky to have you as a daughter but you can't force her to do the work. But I want to. Cheyenne didn't say the words out loud, though. Aspen released her, 
taking hold of Dan's hand. Her voice lightened, a clear attempt to change the subject. So, what's next on the agenda? We could fly kites on the beach, or go on another one of the rides. Or we could eat. They have the best funnel cakes here. I've been craving one for years. Oh, come on, Dan said. No funnel cake can compare to Baylor's shakes and fries. You can't compare a funnel cake to shakes and fries. It's apples and oranges, Aspen argued. What do you think, Che? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? The question flashed an image into Cheyenne's mind that she couldn't shake, one of walking hand in hand down a deserted beach with Zach. Something about him fascinated her. He'd apologized for offending her over the whole female mechanic thing. Stood by and watched her work without telling her how to do her job. Most of their conversation had been light-hearted, but there seemed to be an edge to him hidden just beneath the surface. And he seemed so attached to that broken-down truck. Why? If you aren't hungry, the guys from Dan's crew should be here soon, Aspen said, nudging Dan in the side. Maybe they'd want to join us on the Ferris wheel? What? Dan looked over at Aspen as she elbowed him again. Oh, right. Yeah, they said they'd drop by. It was so embarrassingly obvious that Dan wasn't thrilled with Aspen, dragging him into her matchmaking attempts. Not that Cheyenne could blame him, she wasn't too happy about it herself. Relationships were just another opportunity to disappoint someone. Cheyenne had enough unmet expectations to deal with at the moment. We don't need to wait for the crew, Cheyenne said. If you guys want to go on the Ferris wheel, we can go. Sitting by herself didn't sound so bad, and there was probably a fantastic view of the ocean from the top. No, we can wait, Aspen said, unwrapping a fresh stick of gum. Maybe those two hotties from the auto shop will show up, even if the crew doesn't. They were pretty cute, weren't they? Hello. Dan waved his arms in the air. Your fiancé is standing right here, thank you very much. Aspen placed a hand on his chest and gave him a brief kiss. I have the hottest guy around, obviously. But there's no reason Cheyenne can't settle for second best. Ugh. They were so nauseatingly cute together, sweet enough to cause cavities. I'm not looking to settle for anyone right now, Cheyenne said. But I am hungry, so let's go grab one of those funnel cakes and see if the real thing is as good as your memory. Aspen looked up at Dan, the love on her face so obvious it made Cheyenne's heart ache. Oh, I already know real life can't compete with memories. Fine, you win. Let's go eat. We can compare it to Baylor's potato fries later tonight, Dan said. Like that's even a fair comparison. Aspen laughed. One's a dessert and one's, I don't know. An appetizer, I guess? The various food trucks and stands were nestled near the back of the boardwalk, not far from where the Ferris wheel rose high above the water. Dan opted for a burger, and Aspen and Cheyenne got a funnel cake to share. The dessert was bigger than Cheyenne's face, dripping with warm chocolate syrup and powdered sugar. Crowded picnic tables were staggered about the area, but they managed to snag one shaded by a red and white striped umbrella just as someone left. Cheyenne caught a glimpse of a tall man with blonde hair at a nearby table, making her heart leap. But then the man turned, and she realized it wasn't Zack. She wasn't sure what had possessed her to practically beg him to join them at the pier tonight. For all she knew, Zack was one of those California boys who couldn't swim and the thought of partying on a pier terrified him. She tried to imagine him as a little boy at the local pool, kicking his feet furiously in a group swim class. Had his mom been the type to enroll him in every extracurricular, then eagerly watch from the sideline? Or did she pop pills until you barely recognized the woman she'd become? Maybe, like Cheyenne's mom, she did both. Cheyenne trailed her fork tines through the chocolate syrup, then speared another bite of funnel cake and let it melt on her tongue. Everyone had thought mom was the perfect housewife, room mother every year, volunteering to sew costumes for every school play, running every bake sale. But they didn't know that she fell apart whenever dad was late from work and not picking up his phone. 
They didn't realize that she often spent days curled in bed with the curtains drawn, so paralyzed by life that she couldn't function. All important things in their lives, from paying the water bill to deciding when to buy a new car, were handled by dad. Cheyenne hadn't realized just how much he was in charge of until he was dead and all of those responsibilities fell to her. For nearly a year, she'd been so consumed with all the little tasks that had to be dealt with after a death that mom's pill problem had gone unnoticed. Cheyenne had seen the bottles of diazepam and Vicodin in the kitchen cabinet, but hadn't paid attention to just how much mom was taking. Not at first. Maybe if she'd noticed earlier. Che? Cheyenne blinked. Aspen was staring at her, fork lax in one hand and eyebrows raised. She'd obviously asked a question that Cheyenne hadn't heard, and Dan's brows were furrowed in concern. Sorry, what was that? Cheyenne asked. Never mind. Aspen gave a smile that was half exasperated, half sympathetic. I'm going to grab some more napkins. I'll do it. Cheyenne was halfway up from her side of the bench before Aspen could blink. Uh, okay, Aspen said. Thanks. Cheyenne took her time locating the condiment cart, dodging the Midwestern dads wearing Hawaiian shirts and moms weighed down with diaper bags and children. She needed a breather, however short-lived. Eventually, she found the cart, shrouded in shadows and sandwiched between two of the food stands. Cheyenne squinted as she walked closer, her eyes struggling to adjust to the sudden change in light. A man already stood at the condiment cart, his tall, lean frame backlit by the sun. Something about the way he held himself seemed familiar. He reached for something, causing his face to leave the shadows for the briefest moment. Cheyenne froze, only a few feet away. Zack held a hamburger in one hand and grabbed ketchup packets with the other. A quick look around revealed Sawyer paying for his meal at the nearby Korean barbecue food truck. Heat flooded her body. Zack had come. Was it because he'd known she would be here, or because it seemed like an interesting event? Maybe it was a bit of both. Her feet urged her to run away while every cell in her body begged her to walk over and greet Zack. Sure, Aspen had been the one to invite him here, but Cheyenne had sort of invited him too, right? At the very least, she'd hinted they could meet up if he showed up at the pier. Run. That was the smartest course of action. She'd tell Aspen they were out of napkins and hope her friend, or Dan, didn't investigate further. The pier was crowded enough, they might not run into Zack or Sawyer all evening. Cheyenne took a step back, preparing to leave. But Zack looked up then, his eyes locking onto hers. A half-smile graced his gorgeous lips, and he raised a hand in an uncertain wave. Crap. She lifted her hand, her heart beating erratically. Zack walked toward her, and she reluctantly met him halfway. Hey, he said. Hey. Her mouth felt dry, but her palms were sweaty. Why did just looking at Zack make her heart beat a million miles a minute? He's just a stranger here for a short vacation, she reminded herself. Just because his friend was potentially moving to town didn't mean Cheyenne would ever see Zack again after he left. She was only here for a few months herself. Cheyenne cleared her throat, feeling like an idiot. She was so much better with cars than with people. I see you found the pier. A smile flashed across his face, highlighting the shadow of a beard making its way across his chin. It's kind of hard to miss, what with all the signs around town pointing toward it. Cheyenne laughed, feeling some of the tension leave her body. Yeah, the town is extremely proud of Sapphire Pier. Zack's gaze didn't leave hers, his eyes seeming to search her soul. I can see why. What was it about him that turned her brain to mush? She cleared her throat, motioning to the condiment table. I was just grabbing some napkins. Aspen and Dan are right over there. Cool. Sawyer's here too somewhere, ordering his food. Oh, here he comes. Sawyer walked over, his movement somehow both stiff and fluid. The smell of Korean barbecue made her stomach growl. Maybe she should have eaten something more substantial than funnel cake. Cheyenne, Sawyer said, giving Zack a sidelong glance. 
It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Cheyenne grabbed a wad of napkins. Uh, I'll let you guys enjoy your food. It was nice bumping into you. Same, Zach said. Was it her imagination, or did he sound disappointed? Let's see if we can find a table, Sawyer. You can sit with us. Cheyenne didn't know what possessed her to blurt out the invitation. Her cheeks grew hot as Zach's eyes met hers again. That warm, light green color, like the ocean before a storm, was piercing. I mean, it's pretty crowded right now, Cheyenne said lamely, motioning to the area of filled picnic tables. We had to circle twice before finding an empty one. You're sure you don't mind? Zach asked. Oh, she minded, all right. The thought of sitting next to Zach, the length of his warm body brushing against hers like it had in the tow truck, had her blood racing. Of course not, she said. There's room for six, and we're almost done eating, anyway. We accept your offer, Ben, Zach said. Thanks. Why couldn't she stop smiling? Cheyenne ducked her head as they wove through the tables, hoping he hadn't noticed. We're right over there. Oh boy. Aspen was watching them approach, a wide smile across her lips. She lifted her hand in a wave, saying something to Dan. This is so nice, Sawyer said in his deep timbre. Aren't the people in Sapphire Cove neighborly, Zach? I can see why John loves it here. Well, we haven't seen much of the town yet. There was an edge to Zach's voice, and Cheyenne had the feeling she was missing something. But I'm glad we met you, Cheyenne. First, you saved my truck from being stranded, then you saved us from boredom by telling us about the pier, and now you're saving us from eating standing up. Her knees had gone liquid at the compliment. She gripped the napkins tighter. Well, I'm not sure yet how saved your truck is. And you have Aspen to thank for telling you about the summer opening. But you're welcome for all of it, just the same. They were within earshot of the table now, and Aspen perked up. What was my doing? Telling them about the pier, Cheyenne said. I invited them to sit with us since all the tables are full. Hope you don't mind, Zach added. Of course not. Aspen's grin widened, and she motioned to the empty benches. We're happy you could join us. Thanks, Sawyer said, taking one of the two empty benches and plopping into the center. Aspen and Dan already occupied the third bench, leaving the remaining one for Zach and Cheyenne to share. He sat down, his eyes flicking to hers. Half his butt hung off one side, leaving plenty of space for Cheyenne on the other. She took a deep breath, then sat down next to him, careful not to touch any part of his body. This is my fiancé, Dan, Aspen said to the men. Dan, this is Zach and Sawyer, the guys I was telling you about who are staying at the inn. Good to meet you. Dan leaned over the table to shake both men's hands. What brings you to Sapphire Cove? Cheyenne could feel Zach's eyes on her, but she refused to meet them. Why was he looking at her? A friend's thinking of moving here, Zach said. His fiancé lives in town, and we wanted to come check it out. What's her name? Aspen glanced at Dan, maybe we know her. Meredith Jackson, Zach said. She's lived here since she was little. Since she was five, Sawyer clarified. Went to Sapphire Cove Elementary, Middle, and High School. She owns a photography business here in town. Aspen's eyes lit up. I know Meredith. Not well, we weren't in the same grade, but well enough. She recommended the wedding photographer we're using. I didn't realize she was engaged. How exciting. When is the wedding? As Sawyer answered Aspen's question, Zach leaned forward, his voice low enough that only Cheyenne could hear. I'll be honest with you, he said quietly. When John first suggested this trip, I wasn't that excited about visiting Sapphire Cove. But I'm starting to see the appeal. Cheyenne couldn't take in a full breath. She blinked quickly, focusing on her cold funnel cake. Yeah, it's a nice town. I don't know about the town yet, Zach said. But the people in it are certainly more interesting than I counted on. She glanced at him, then away quickly. 
yeah, they're pretty nice. He raised his eyebrows, meaningfully. Maybe spending a few weeks here won't be so difficult after all. Chapter 7 Zack took a bite of his cold hamburger and chewed slowly, watching Cheyenne drag her fork tines through the melted whipped cream and chocolate syrup on her plate. She, Aspen, and Dan had finished eating ten minutes ago, but they didn't seem in a rush to leave. That was fine with Zack for reasons he didn't want to examine. Aspen said you own a construction company, Sawyer was saying to Dan I'm curious about the real estate market here in town, since it's so small. Is there much available? The question startled Zack, bringing him back to earth, with a thud. Sawyer was taking their promise to John a little too seriously. Of course, Zack had known he would. Sawyer was nothing if not loyal. What if Sawyer decided to leave the seals, too? For the first time, Zack seriously considered the possibility that he could lose both his best friends. Would the Navy still feel like his home if his family was no longer there? Zack pushed the errant thought aside, refusing to even consider the possibility. Sawyer was a born sailor, if ever there was one, and Sapphire Cove held nothing for either of them. The market's pretty decent, Dan said. We just bid on a new housing development on the south side of town. There are 22 lots, all pretty small, around a sixth of an acre. The developer plans on marketing them to tourists looking for summer vacation homes. They'll be really nice when finished and perfect if you don't want to bother keeping up a yard. The area is zoned for short-term rentals, too, so it could make a nice investment property. Dan and his crew do genuine master-level work. Aspen's hand rested on Dan's shoulder, her face bright as she leaned into him. You saw the inn, right? That crown molding is all original to the house, and they spent forever meticulously filling in every hole so that it would look perfect. It was obvious that Dan and Aspen were crazy about each other. Zack felt an ache deep down in his soul. He'd never had that with someone. Never had a real relationship, if he was being honest. But he didn't need one, because the seals were family enough for him. When he got back to Coronado, he would do more than tell Lt. Matthews he wanted to apply for officer candidate school, he'd ask the lieutenant to mentor him through it. Cheyenne might be the most intriguing girl Zack had ever met, but she wasn't staying in Sapphire Cove permanently. Neither was he. The inn looks really nice, Sawyer said. I can tell you do great work. I'd love to check out the development's location. Are you interested in buying, or just curious? Dan asked. Because if you want to take a look at what's available, I can recommend a few real estate agents that are great at what they do. The market can be pretty competitive, especially if you want something right on the beach. Sawyer's gaze slid to Zach's, then back to Dan. Just curious for now, Sawyer said easily. Since our buddy John is moving here and all. Zach released a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. Doesn't Meredith live over on Primrose Lane? Aspen asked. She inherited her grandmother's bungalow on the beach, right? Yeah, Sawyer said. On the southwest side of town. The new development is only about half a mile from there, Aspen said, looking to Dan for confirmation. He nodded. Yeah, it's close to Primrose. Those lots will go fast. If you decide to move here down the line and want to build, I can hook you up. I know the town's crowded right now, but it's peaceful, for most of the year. Aspen laughed kissing Dan on the cheek. You know, some people like the chaos of tourist season. I know. Dan captured Aspen's face, pressing a kiss to her lips. I guess that's why Sapphire Cove is the perfect town for us, we both get what we need here. Zack looked away, feeling as though he'd intruded on a private moment. Cheyenne was also avoiding eye contact with Aspen and Dan. How did she feel about her best friend getting married? She certainly seemed to be handling it better than Zack. Then again, Aspen wasn't a Navy SEAL deserting his squad for love. And for Zack, that was the crux of his feelings of betrayal. John could fall in love all he wanted. But did that mean he had to become a civilian? Zack tried to imagine meeting a girl, falling in love, and leaving her alone at home for nine or ten months a year while he was off doing his job. 
saying goodbye without knowing if he'd come back. Memories of the thick copper scent of coagulating blood and fading moans of the dying crowded into Zack's mind, making him clench his hand into a fist. Something soggy and damp squished in his palm. He opened it, surprised to find a mutilated fry sitting there. He'd forgotten he was holding it. Zack quickly dropped the fry, wiping his hand off with a napkin and tossing it in the basket. There were parts of the military he struggled with, but they had given him a purpose when he had none. He'd been close with Sawyer and John growing up, the three of them best friends since middle school, but the military had turned them into a family. How would Cheyenne react if he told her he was a Navy SEAL? Beside him, Sawyer dropped his napkin onto his empty plate. It appeared they'd stretched out the meal as long as possible. Disappointment clogged Zack's throat, and he swallowed it back. Cheyenne glanced at Sawyer's plate, then at her watch. Dang it. I didn't realize it was already so late. Zack knew from the slant of the sun that it was only about seven o'clock. Was Cheyenne hinting that Zack and Sawyer had overstayed their welcome? We should let you three enjoy your night, Zack said. We didn't mean to intrude. No, it's not that. I just have to be at the inn at five to start preparing breakfast. Cheyenne glanced at Aspen. Want to come home with me, or stay out a while? Dan will drive me home, Aspen said, snuggling into her fiancé's side. Are you sure you can't stay longer? Yeah, I don't want to be a zombie tomorrow. Cheyenne glanced at Zack and Sawyer. It was great seeing you guys again. Maybe she wasn't making excuses. Sometimes Zack forgot that not everyone subsisted on six hours of sleep a night. I'm sure we'll see you around over the next three weeks, Zack said, trying to hide his disappointment. Yeah, maybe, Cheyenne said noncommittally. His phone buzzed in his pocket, and Zack pulled it out to see an unknown number flash across the screen. He shot Cheyenne an apologetic look and flipped it open with a gruff, Zack here. This is Doug from the auto shop, came the gravelly voice from the other end of the line. I was able to take a look at your truck sooner than expected. Zack's chest tightened. Yes. There was a long pause. Had they been disconnected? Zack pulled back, checking the screen, but it still showed the call was ongoing. I'm just closing up the shop, Doug said. Any way you can come in to talk before I leave? It'll be easier to discuss it all in person. That sinking feeling was back in Zack's stomach. Yeah, sure. We'll come right over. See you soon, Doug said and hung up. Cheyenne was still standing there, her arms folded as she stared at Zack with a furrow between her brows. Everything okay? That was Doug. He wants us to come into the shop right now. Zack's fingers curled around his cell phone. That's not a good sign, is it? Cheyenne glanced at Aspen and Dan, then back at him. Doug can be a bit of a pessimist. I can drop you off there on my way home. I don't want to put you out, Zack said. Cheyenne waved her hand. It's not a problem. I'll even go in with you, if you want. Doug forgets that not everyone speaks auto. Her blue eyes were liquid in the fading light, her face earnest. Zack glanced over at Sawyer, who had his arms folded across his chest and an unreadable expression. If you're sure, Zack said. Of course. Cheyenne pulled her keys out of her front pocket. Good luck, Aspen said. Maybe it's not as bad as you think. Maybe, Zack said. But he'd never had great luck, and something told him his truck was toast. Chapter 8 Zack tried not to worry about his truck as he, Sawyer, and Cheyenne left the food court. He found himself slowing his steps to accommodate Cheyenne's shorter stride, walking half a step ahead of her so he could use his shoulders to cut her a path through the throngs of people, while Sawyer trailed behind. Doug wasn't an easy person to read, especially over the phone, and Zack wasn't sure how much sticker shock to brace himself for. The pier was packed with teenagers taking selfies, frazzled parents chasing after sugar-hyped toddlers, and older couples wearing fanny packs. Upbeat big band music piped through the speakers placed on the street lamps, and the air crackled with energy. But inside, Zack's stomach was tied in knots. 
The crowd spinned as they left the pier, but heat radiated off the parking lot's blacktop and the waves shimmered in the light. Cars were packed into the parking lot, shiny sedans with rental car stickers mixed in with dented minivans. Three exits, all of them easily accessible in a pinch. So far, he'd seen license plates from 12 different states. What do you think? Zack asked Cheyenne. She glanced up at him, the setting sun backlighting her figure and turning her dark hair golden. A few paces away, a little girl lost her balloon and started crying. A curvy woman bent to hug her while a beanpole of a man chased after it. Zack could already tell it was a lost cause. About your truck? Cheyenne asked. Yeah, Zack said. The balloon was probably twelve feet up now, bouncing in the sea breeze. Give it to me straight. I can take it. Behind them, Sawyer said, considering it won't start, I'm guessing the news isn't great. Yeah, that's what Zack was worried about. I know I peeked under the hood earlier, but I didn't do a full assessment or anything, Cheyenne said. I get that. Zack spotted her car three rows away. She put the top back up, the white leather making it stand out. But you are a mechanic. Cheyenne played with her key ring, looking uncomfortable. She wouldn't meet his eyes. Doug will have more information than I do, but I'm betting it will need a lot of work before it runs again. Just as he feared. Worry clogged Zack's throat, his muscles battle already tense. So it's a lost cause? he asked. There had to be a way to save that truck. He didn't make much as a seal, but he also didn't have much in the way of expenses. Over the past decade, he'd managed to save a modest nest egg. Would it be enough? Was it even possible? The thought of emptying his savings account made him nauseous, but losing the truck wasn't an option. I've been restoring cars since I was 12 and I can count on one hand the number of vehicles I've encountered that are lost causes, Cheyenne said. I don't think yours is one of them. Zack exhaled, and Sawyer gave him an encouraging nod. Cheyenne seemed to miss their silent exchange, instead pointing down the row to her convertible. They were only a few stalls away now. You should have seen my baby when I first bought her, she said. The hydraulics on the top had been broken for who knows how long so the interior had been exposed to the elements for years. The seats were completely rotted, the wiring for the radio was shot, and the body was so rusted I could barely tell the original color. But all she needed was a lot of love, time, and money to be as good as new. With your truck, it's probably going to be a matter of whether or not the effort is worth the result. Definitely worth it. Zack just hoped he had enough money, or maybe, if he was hoping, it was better to pray that Cheyenne's assessment was wrong and things weren't that dire. But Cheyenne didn't strike him as the type of person who was wrong very often. How many cars had she restored? How many lost causes had she saved? Sawyer ran his hand along the convertible's body as Cheyenne unlocked it. If you can make Zack's truck look as good as your convertible, then you're a miracle worker. Was she really that bad off? Cheyenne laughed, climbing into the driver's seat. Sawyer took the back without comment, leaving the passenger seat for Zack. She was worse than you're imagining, I promise, Cheyenne said as the top slid back, the hydraulics barely making a sound. My dad must have asked me a dozen times if I was sure that I wanted to buy her. Zack tried to imagine a younger Cheyenne begging to buy a car that didn't run. The image that conjured made him smile. He wondered if her dad had loved tinkering with cars. Had he been the one to teach Cheyenne what she knew? Well, my truck isn't a classic like this baby, Zack said. But my dad loved that thing. The truck was your dad's? Cheyenne glanced over at him, her eyes filled with an understanding he hadn't expected. Yeah, Zack said. Cheyenne nodded, slipping on a pair of sunglasses. She effortlessly released the clutch and put the car in reverse, looking way too attractive. Where is your dad now? Six feet under, but Zack figured she wouldn't appreciate his morbid sense of humor. Civilians didn't understand how witnessing so much death and carnage, often being responsible for it, dulled the senses. He and my mom both passed away shortly after I graduated high school, Zack said. A car accident. 
Cheyenne inhaled sharply, and he thought she clenched the steering wheel tighter. I'm so sorry. Zack knew what came next, an awkward apology, then a quick subject change. He swallowed back the disappointment that Cheyenne was reacting the same as all the others. They were good people, Sawyer said gruffly from the back seat. Treated me like one of their own. Zack nodded, staring fixedly at a red light up ahead. Sawyer hadn't had much in the way of family, neither had John, and Zack's parents had always treated his two best friends like surrogate sons. When his parents had died, Sawyer and John had rallied around Zack and convinced him to join the Navy with them. It had turned out to be the best decision Zack could have made. My dad died, too, Cheyenne said quietly. I can't imagine losing both of my parents at once. Zack stared at her, surprise quickly morphing into empathy, then shame that he'd assumed the worst of her reaction. I'm so sorry. Was it? I mean, was it expected? No. An accident, like your parents. There was a catch in her voice that tugged at his heartstrings. If the truck means that much to you, then I don't think it's a lost cause at all. Beautiful, mysterious, and she had depth. Zack rubbed his damp palms against the fabric of his cargo shorts. He couldn't let any of that matter. This leave was supposed to last three weeks, but Zack had learned long ago not to put much stock in promised vacations. The reality was, they'd be lucky to make it two weeks before being called back to Coronado for some national emergency. They'd come back again in four months for the wedding, or whenever it happened, if their squad got called up and the wedding had to be postponed, which was likely, and Zack knew that if John did leave the SEALs, he'd drop in to say hi whenever possible. Sawyer would come with him, Zack refused to believe he'd lose both of his friends to this town, and maybe they'd run into Cheyenne every once in a while when visiting. But that was it. Two weeks, maybe three, and then he was out of here. He was in no position for even a casual relationship. Back at the auto shop, the sign was flipped to closed and half the lights inside were off. But the front door pushed open when Cheyenne tested it and she motioned them inside. Good, you're here, Doug said, his tone gruff. He glanced up from the computer screen that held his attention, then did a double take when he saw Cheyenne. Did you forget something? No, Cheyenne said. We ran into each other at the pier, and I asked her to come with us, Zack said smoothly. She gave us a ride, Sawyer added. Cheyenne cast them both a grateful smile, while Doug's only response was a grunt. So what did you find? Cheyenne asked. Doug wiped his hands on a grease-spattered rag, then shoved it in the pocket of his coveralls and gave Zack his full attention. I won't sugarcoat it, Doug said, and Zack's stomach dropped. Your truck is pretty much toast. The engine's shot, and your only option is to rebuild it from scratch or replace it entirely. If I'm being honest, the vehicle isn't worth the time or energy to do either. Zack braced his arms on the counter, feeling sick. After talking to Cheyenne, he'd expected it to be bad. But this? Your best bet is to scrap it for parts, or maybe donate it to one of those charities that takes broken cars. At least then you'd get the tax right off, Doug continued. I'm sorry that I don't have better news for you. I can recommend some salvage yards that might buy your truck and some dealerships that won't screw you over for a new ride. Zack felt the concerned gazes of both Sawyer and Cheyenne, their worry palpable. Naja roiled in his stomach, and he swallowed back the acrid taste of bile. He couldn't have taken his last ride in the truck. Couldn't have settled into the seat his dad used to occupy for the final time. When a familiar song came on the radio, the memories of riding in that truck with his parents were so vivid. Sometimes when the air conditioner first started up, he imagined he could still smell his mother's perfume. Driving that old, beaten-down machine almost made him feel like they were with him again. He should have taken better care of it. What did it matter that he was gone 80% or more of the year? Who cared that he often worked 14-hour days, went home? He should have made the time to take the truck in for regular maintenance checks. How much? Zack asked. Doug's brow scrunched together. Sorry? How much to get it running again? Doug scratched the back of his neck, looking uncomfortable. Honestly, 
I'm not even sure it's possible. They stopped making parts for it a few years back. We might be able to find a used engine with low mileage, Cheyenne said. Swap it out. But Doug was shaking his head. That would take a lot of time and be pricey. A few grand at least, depending. Maybe as much as seven or eight. Zach flinched. That would put a decent dent in his savings account, and for what, a truck he only drove a few weeks a year? It's not just the engine, Doug continued. The tires are nearly bald. The timing belt is shot, and all the pistons and cylinders need to be replaced. The radiator's cracked, the brake pads are paper thin, and the alternator's on its way out. I don't think there's a part on that truck that isn't worn out. You'd be better off taking the tax credit and buying something newer. More reliable. It would save you money in the long run and maybe even up front. Zach's mouth felt like sandpaper. Swallowing was painful. It might be time to let it go, Sawyer said quietly. That's a lot of money to sink into something that's going to keep having problems. Zach leaned forward, his shoulders nearly touching his ears and his entire body aching with tension. Sawyer was right, of course. From a financial standpoint, it was beyond stupid to fix the truck. With as little time as he spent at home, he could probably get by with no vehicle at all. The squad had an SUV on base that they shared when home, so neither Sawyer nor John had a personal vehicle. Most of the guys didn't bother. But the thought of letting the truck go, of sending it to a salvage yard where it would be crushed into oblivion, was physically painful. He'd visited his parents' graves a few times over the years. Had driven by the house he grew up in. But nothing made him feel connected to his parents like that truck. It was his father's, Cheyenne said quietly. Zach looked up, heart beating painfully in his chest. Cheyenne was staring at Doug, the two having some unspoken conversation. Seconds that felt like hours passed before Doug's shoulders sagged and he sighed. I want to help you, son, Doug said. But I don't have time to track down the replacement parts right now. Maybe, once the busy season is over. It would be September at the earliest before I could get to a project that time intensive. Even then, I make no guarantees. If we can't find an engine, there's no point in fixing anything else. It would take months to rebuild one from scratch. September wasn't so bad. Zach didn't mind waiting if it meant saving the truck. Maybe Meredith would let him store it at her house if Doug didn't have space in the parking lot. Or Zach could have it towed back to California and find someone in San Diego to do the work. He thought of how much it had cost to tow the truck from the highway to Doug's and internally winced. Getting it back to California would cost a fortune. Then again, he had nothing better to spend his money on right now. He was 28 and single, with minimum monthly expenses. What did he need a savings account for? Beside him, Cheyenne spoke, her voice, both feminine and strong. I could do it. Zach whipped his gaze around to meet hers. Determined blue eyes stared back at him, hands shoved in her back pockets. Restoring lost causes is kind of my specialty, Cheyenne continued. Doug stroked his beard, staring at her. I hired you to keep an eye on the front and help with oil changes and tire rotations on Mike's day off, not restore cars. Frankly, it's not something we typically do. You don't, but I do, Cheyenne pressed. I could work on it in the evenings after the shops closed, so it wouldn't interfere with my regular job here. I can tow it in and out of the bay each night so that it isn't in the way and park it in the back lot when I'm not working on it. Zach's heart leaped with hope. But wouldn't that be taking advantage of Cheyenne? He'd insist on paying for her time, but she already had two jobs and probably didn't want a third. Besides, if what Doug said was true, it sounded like fixing the truck might take months, and Cheyenne was only in town for the summer. When are you going to sleep? Zach asked. She laughed, her eyes sparkling in a way he hadn't seen before. I don't need sleep when I'm restoring a vehicle. These kinds of projects are what I live for. You think you can find an engine? Zach pressed, trying not to hope. She shrugged, not seeming concerned. 
or rebuild it. I've got a lot of contacts. Finding parts will take time and money, but I'm confident we can do it. Zack nodded, still contemplating. I won't be in Sapphire Cove for long. Sounds like you might not be, either. If I'm not done by the end of summer, I can take it back to Portland and finish up there. I've got all the tools I need in my garage at home. Once it's finished, we can figure out how to get it to you. Well, there you go then. Sawyer clapped Zack on the back. Problem solved. It would be pretty expensive, Cheyenne warned. Doug's right that it might cost more to get your truck running again than to buy a new one. But I promise it can be done. I'd pay you for your time, Zack said. We can come to an arrangement that's fair to both of us, Cheyenne agreed. Doug heaved a sigh, glancing back and forth between them. It's a nice idea, but I don't know. Zack could almost hear his mom's smooth alto voice singing along to a Johnny Cash song, static crackling through the truck's radio. Could almost see Dad glance over at Mom, one hand loosely on the steering wheel, and the love in his gaze so apparent. Zack folded his arms, remembering what it had felt like to curl into his mother's side and fall asleep on their long Sunday drives. He didn't care how much it cost to fix the truck. Didn't care who he had to beg. He wanted it saved, and he knew Cheyenne could do the job. I'll rent the garage from you, Zack said, zeroing in on Doug. After hours, of course. Seems like an easy way to make a quick buck, Sawyer said easily, giving Doug an intimidating stare. Zack recognized it immediately as the same one that Sawyer used when interrogating insurgents. I promise I'll put all the tools back in place every night, Cheyenne said. You won't even know we were there. Doug grunted. Come on. Cheyenne leaned forward. This is my specialty. I'm not some kid right out of high school with no experience. Doug flinched, her words apparently hitting their mark. Zack didn't care why they'd cut. All he knew was that Cheyenne was fighting to help him fix his truck. It made him like her even more. He didn't need the truck, beautifully restored, he just needed it to run. Needed to feel like some part of his parents lived on. That he was still connected to them. Doug threw up his hands, letting out an exasperated huff. Fine. Cheyenne can fix your truck. Zack sagged against the counter, feeling like he'd resurfaced too quickly after a dive. Cheyenne let out a cheer, bouncing on the balls of her feet. You won't regret this, Cheyenne said. I hope not, because I'm not even going to charge you for use of the garage. Doug pointed a finger at Zack. But if she breaks or loses anything, then you're paying to replace it. Cheyenne folded her arms, looking insulted. Fair enough, Zack said before she could argue. He wasn't worried. We close each night at seven, so you can use the garage any time after that, Doug said. You've got to move the truck into and out of the bay each night, just like you said, and put everything back like it was when you're done for the evening. And then you'll have to lock up, of course. Got it, Cheyenne said. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Zack added. You have no idea how much. My dad had a truck too, Doug said, his tone gruff. It's a waste of money to fix up yours, but I get it. Don't forget to set the alarm when you leave each night. I won't, Cheyenne said. I'll start looking for engines tonight. Okay then. See you tomorrow. Cheyenne nodded, turning toward the door. Thanks, Doug. Come on, I'll drop you guys at the inn on my way home. Outside, Zack fought the urge to sweep Cheyenne into a bear hug. The sun had fallen below the trees, making the horizon glow orange and the air chilly. But Cheyenne had a bounce in her step, like it was the first day of summer after a long and dreary winter. Zack didn't want to ask, but felt he had to give her one more chance to change her mind. Are you sure that you have time for this? Zack asked. One of the floodlights in the parking lot made a buzzing noise as it flickered, casting shadows across the gravel. Are you kidding me? Cheyenne raised her eyebrows in disbelief. I think I might die of boredom if I spend all summer rotating tires and doing oil changes. 
This is going to be awesome. It's like Christmas morning and my birthday all wrapped in one. Zach chuckled, her exuberance infectious. I'm glad you're excited. Thanks for doing this. I should be thanking you, Cheyenne said. I've got to say, I'm kind of excited to see what you do with that truck, Sawyer said. As far as I'm concerned, your convertible is a ringing recommendation of your skills. I don't need a full restore, Zach said quickly, thinking again of his bank account. I just need it to drive. Cheyenne laughed, that sparkle in her eyes again. Oh, it'll drive. When I'm done with it, the truck will last you another twenty years, with proper maintenance, easy. Twenty years. The band around Zach's chest loosened. That long? She nodded, launching into an explanation. And as Zach watched her talk about cars, he couldn't help being a little grateful to John for forcing him to come to Sapphire Cove. Chapter 9 Zack slept fitfully that night, his rest interrupted by bizarre dreams he couldn't remember upon waking. By the time the first hints of dawn peeked around the curtains, he was awake and ready for a morning workout. Sawyer suggested they keep it light, since they were supposed to be on vacation, and Zack agreed. They ran five miles on the hard-packed sands of the beach. Once the sky was rosy with dawn, they finished their workout by swimming parallel to the shoreline for an hour in the frigid ocean. By the time they got back to the inn, their skin chilled, despite their wet suits, the rest of Sapphire Cove was barely waking up. The sounds of guests enjoying the inn's continental breakfast floated down the hallway as he and Sawyer headed for the stairs. Without glancing at his watch, Zack knew it was around eight o'clock. Breakfast had been underway for nearly two hours, which meant Cheyenne was somewhere in the hotel. He tried to imagine her filling hot plates with pre-made pancakes and placing little cups of yogurt in bowls of ice, like he'd seen at other hotels. When they'd exchanged phone numbers last night, she'd mentioned seeing him in the morning. Did that mean she expected him at breakfast? Better not disappoint her, just in case. In their room, Sawyer tossed his key card on the TV stand want to check out that new development Dan mentioned last night? It'll give us something to tell John when he calls today. Sure. Prickles of unease snaked up Zach's spine. Are you seriously considering buying a house here? No, of course not. Sawyer sat on the edge of his bed and kicked off his shoes. But it's not like we have much else to do today. We could run by Meredith's bungalow while we're in the area. Check out the neighborhood. Sounds like a plan, Zach said, although he wasn't interested in seeing the beach house John wanted to give up the team for. Sure, their digs on base weren't glamorous, but John had lost sight of the bigger picture, the sense of brotherhood, the way they fought tooth and nail every day toward a shared vision. Did he really want to give all of that up for Meredith and a life in Sapphire Cove? It was unimaginable. But Zack had promised to give the town a chance, and so he would. Besides, they'd be checking out of the inn and staying at Meredith's in a few days, anyway. Do you want to shower first? Zack asked. You go ahead, Sawyer said. I'm going to do some research and find out what else there is to do around here. Zack nodded, grabbing his duffel bag. In the shower, he let himself enjoy the warm water for far too long, nine minutes, a luxury, then quickly finished getting ready. When Zack emerged from the bathroom, Sawyer still sat at the small desk with his laptop open and attention focused on the screen. Find anything? Zack asked. Sawyer shrugged, shutting the computer's lid and rising. Quite a few mom and pop type businesses, most of them catering to tourists, restaurants, gift shops, that sort of thing. Two schools, a few doctor's offices, and a pharmacy. There's only one grocery store in town, but three bars. For most amenities, you have to drive 40 minutes to Paradise Green, although Harbor Bay has a residential treatment center and indoor movie theater. There's a drive-in theater here that seems pretty popular based on their online reviews. Zack nodded, already feeling more at ease with the information, unnecessary as it was. John had dropped the news on them right before their last op, and they'd left for Sapphire Cove only an hour after landing back in Coronado. So it's a tiny tourist trap town, just like Meredith said, Zack concluded. Pretty much. If you want t-shirts or shot glasses, they've got you covered 
but if you want a chiropractor or department store, you've got to go somewhere else. Sawyer headed toward the bathroom. I should be ready to go in about twenty minutes. Zack grabbed his room key off the table, trying to keep his voice casual. Cool. I think I'll go check out the continental breakfast while waiting. Meet you downstairs? Sawyer paused, his eyes narrowing. Sure. See you soon. Zack nodded, looking away. Why did he suddenly feel so guilty? He quickly left the room, jogging down the stairs. The banister was lower than typical, a sure sign it was original to the house, and Zack stepped aside to let an older couple with silver hair pass. He turned right at the bottom of the stairs and followed the noise to the dining room at the end of the hallway. Seven square tables were each surrounded by four chairs, and a large buffet was spread out next to a door he suspected led to the kitchen. Three of the tables were occupied, all with couples of various ages, but he didn't see Cheyenne anywhere. Zack swallowed, trying to hide his disappointment. That was okay. He was here for the food, not the girl. She had his number and would call him about the truck. He grabbed a plate from the buffet and loaded it with bacon, sausage, and eggs, along with a few pieces of toast. Plates clanking together echoed from the kitchen, accompanied by the low murmur of voices, two individuals, both female judging by the pitch. He hadn't spent enough time with Cheyenne yet to know if one of them was hers, but his stomach flipped at the possibility. At an empty table, he took a bite of sausage, a little dry, but palatable, and pulled up the banking app on his phone. Could it really cost more than a new truck just to get his running again? He took another bite of sausage, staring at his account balances. It had been a while since he'd bothered to look, but the totals were roughly what he remembered, not zero, but not hundreds of thousands of dollars, either. There had been little in the way of inheritance after his parents' passing, and while he didn't have many expenses with the Navy, he also didn't make a lot of money, either. A rustling came from the direction of the kitchen. Zack's heart skipped a beat. He flipped his phone over so the screen was face down and looked up just in time to see Cheyenne enter the dining room, a fresh plate of pastries in her hand. She set it on the edge of the buffet table, placing the two pastries from the current plate on top with tongs before swapping them. She wore long denim jeans today that hugged her legs and a checkered shirt with the sleeves rolled above her elbows. Her hair was in some sort of complicated bun that managed to look both messy and elegant, and honestly, he couldn't remember a woman ever looking more attractive. She noticed him then, her face breaking out in a smile that sent Zack's pulse racing. She walked over to his table without hesitating, the empty platter tucked beneath one arm. Good morning, she said, dropping into the chair beside his. Morning. Zack motioned to his plate of food. Why did she make him feel so self-conscious? Great job with breakfast. It's, uh, delicious. Cheyenne laughed. It's okay, you don't have to lie to me. Well, it's filling, at least. The eggs were rubbery and the bacon cold, but he wasn't about to tell her that. Cheyenne leaned forward, lowering her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. I'll let you in on a secret. Everything comes to us already cooked, even the bacon. All we have to do is heat it up and put it out, and the warmers aren't great at keeping things hot. It was still a step above the MRE meals that sometimes felt like a staple of his diet, so Zack wouldn't complain. Well, you do a good job heating it up, Zack said lamely. Oh, I'm great with a microwave. She raised one eyebrow, her lips quirked upward in a grin. This isn't the most glamorous job in the world, but it's only temporary and helps pay the bills. I'm grateful to Aspen for helping me get it. Not for the first time, Zack wondered why Cheyenne was working two jobs, and still willing to take on a third. Fresh guilt flooded him for hiring her to fix his truck. What other responsibilities did Cheyenne have in her life? He had no idea if her mother lived nearby, if she had brothers or sisters she hung out with regularly. Was she the type of girl who went to church on Sundays? Did she volunteer at community food drives? Place flowers on her father's grave every week? He wanted to know everything about her. That was dangerous. I should get back to work. Cheyenne rose, 
and the sharp pangs of disappointment caught him off guard. While I've got you here, I'll save myself a text. Any chance you can meet me at the garage tonight at 7? I started looking at engine options last night, and I want to discuss them with you. Zack set down his fork, the food suddenly congealing in his stomach. Did we run into a snag already? No, nothing like that. She shook her head, dislodging a few strands of hair from her bun. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you. I've already found a few different engines for you to consider, but the more I think about it, the more I wonder if rebuilding isn't the right call. We can go over the pros and cons of each option tonight. Sawyer walked into the room then, his hair still damp from the shower. His eyes searched the room, landing on Zack and Cheyenne, and his lips turned down in a frown. He walked toward them, a deep furrow forming between his brows. Zack looked away. Sawyer didn't need to worry. As attracted as Zack was to Cheyenne, he wasn't about to pull a John. Sure, I can meet you, Zack said. His stomach flipped at the mere thought of being alone with her. Okay. I'll see you at seven, and we can talk more. Cheyenne grabbed the empty platter, giving Sawyer a smile. I'll see you guys later. Yeah, Zack wasn't about to invite Sawyer to come with him. He didn't want or need the weight of Sawyer's judgments. What was that about? Sawyer asked once Cheyenne was out of earshot. Tonight she wants to go over some engine options for the truck. Zack motioned to the buffet. Why did he feel like he was hiding something? He had to shake off this guilt. You gonna eat? Sawyer grunted, which Zack took as a yes since he grabbed a plate and started filling it. They ate in silence, swiftly and efficiently, just like on base. It took all of Zack's willpower to not continuously glance in the kitchen's direction for a glimpse of Cheyenne, but he wasn't about to give Sawyer any more reasons to be suspicious. When they left the dining room 15 minutes later, Zack had to swallow back his disappointment. He'd hoped Cheyenne might stop by the table so he could say goodbye, but he'd been out of luck. Want to drop by the development or Meredith's first? Zack asked as they pushed through the front doors of the inn. The air had warmed since their swim that morning, sunlight hitting the wet pavement and making it mist. The development, Sawyer said. We have to pass right by it to get to Mare's anyway. Zack nodded, and they set off in that direction. It was a little over a mile from the inn, but they didn't jog this time, instead picking a steady pace that wouldn't attract too much attention. The streets were quiet, with very few cars out yet. Birds chirped in the trees. Humidity thickened the air, while the mossy grass, bordering the sidewalk, dripped with morning dew. You clearly like Cheyenne, Sawyer said. A lot. Zack shoved his hands in his pockets, nearly choking on his embarrassment. He hated that Sawyer had noticed. You don't like her? Not like you like her. Didn't we already have this conversation? Sawyer ignored him. She's a nice girl, but you're playing a dangerous game. I'm not John, Zack said hotly, instantly on the defensive. I never said you were. Then what are you saying? Sawyer blew out a breath. That long-distance relationships never work. That it seems like the two of you are going to be spending a lot of time together, now that she's working on your truck. It doesn't matter. We could spend every day together, or no time together, and the result would be the same. I'm not looking for a relationship. Zack kicked at a pebble, suddenly feeling forlorn. But the truck means something to me, so if she can fix it, I'm going to let her. I get that. They stepped aside, letting a woman jogging with her dog run past them on the sidewalk. Just be careful, okay? You've seen what dating Mare and being a seal has done to John. He's not as focused. Always worries about her when we're gone. And now he's leaving the squad. Well, I'm not leaving. Good, because if you and John both left the team, I don't know what I'd do. Zack swallowed, unable to even consider that scenario. It didn't matter how different Cheyenne was from other women. Didn't matter how much he longed to get to know her better. Zack knew where his priorities lay. How are we going to convince John to stay in the military? Zack asked. 
Sawyer heaved a sigh. I have no idea. They found the development easily enough, roughly four acres of soft dirt covered in weeds and crabgrass. Bundles of piping sat near an excavator on the far end of the parcel. A sign advertising the upcoming community had been erected in one corner of the plot, its crisp edges and bright colors indicating it hadn't been there long. The west end backed up to sandy beaches, and the crash of the waves made Zack eager for another swim. When he'd joined the Navy, he'd never even seen the ocean, plenty of rivers and a few lakes, but that was it in landlocked Kentucky. Now he loved it. It's nice, Sawyer said, placing his hands on his hips as he looked across the parcel. Twenty-two houses, though. Zack shook his head, visualizing it. They're going to be crammed in here like sardines. Some people don't mind that. Sawyer motioned to the sea. One of those lots with beach access must cost a fortune. Wonder if they're allowed to have a private dock? An interesting thought. Zack folded his arms, considering the possibilities. You could build something that doubled as a dock and boathouse so the boat was covered when not in use. They walked the perimeter of the development for a while, discussing the tactical advantage of one lot over another and the ideal layout of the community, not because they were considering moving, but because it was something they couldn't help but do at any new location. They were just about ready to leave for Meredith when Sawyer's phone rang. Zack held his breath, half expecting a call from Lt. Matthews asking them to hustle back to California. But Sawyer said, it's John, and answered the call, putting it on speaker. Hey, John said, his voice a little tinny through the line. Hey, Zack and Sawyer, both said. You're on speaker, Sawyer added. How's Portland? Zack asked. Great, John said. Mare's at a dress fitting right now and I just got done with my run. What did you find out about the truck? Zack sighed heavily, thinking again of his bank account. It's down for the count, at least for now. But we found a mechanic who's going to help. Good and bad news, then, John said. Mare's been worried. We know how much that truck means to you. I'm glad it can be fixed. Zack blinked, surprised, but touched at John's comment. Meredith had embraced their trio wholeheartedly, and Zack still hadn't yet gotten used to having someone else care about his well-being. Me too. Tell Mare to stop worrying and focus on the wedding stuff, Sawyer said, his voice gruff. We've got this handled. You know she can't help but worry about us. The affection in John's voice was unmistakable. She considers you two brothers now. Sawyer looked away, and Zack thought he caught a glint of moisture in his eyes. We consider her family, too, Sawyer said. Zack stared at Sawyer, but his friend wouldn't meet his gaze. Yeah, Zack said slowly. You're both family, which means we want to help however we can. Are you sure there's nothing you need us to do before you get here? Meredith probably didn't want them picking out flowers or whatever it was girls did to plan weddings, but they could help with other things. What those things were, Zack wasn't sure. No, just enjoy Sapphire Cove. John paused. When he spoke again, his voice was suspiciously thick. Thanks again, guys. I know how you feel about this, and it means a lot to me that you're even considering moving. Zack and Sawyer exchanged a glance. Were they really considering their options? Trying to, maybe, but having an open mind was easier said than done. We just want you to be happy, Sawyer said gruffly. We can talk more when you get here, Zack added. With any luck, they'd talk John right out of his crazy plan. Will do, John said. I'd better hop in the shower, I'm supposed to meet Mare in thirty minutes. See you in a few days? See you then, Sawyer agreed, and hung up. He stared at the phone, then stuck it back in his pocket. He seems happy, you know? Zack nodded, swallowing back his fear. Yeah. But after a few months at home with no ops and some boring desk job, he'd be losing his mind. Yeah, you're probably right. We'll talk to him when he gets here. Zack nodded. It wasn't like they were trying to get him to call off the wedding, just stay in the seals. Should we go by Meredith's now? Yeah, Sawyer said. 
Let's go check it out. Chapter 10 Cheyenne stared at the small stack of bills in her hands, the till open in front of her, and tried to remember where she'd been at last count. Seventy dollars? Eighty? She heaved a sigh, then started over counting again. Most people paid by card, but some of the locals preferred to pay in cash, so Doug always kept some on hand. A bead of sweat dripped down her back, the coveralls she'd donned, before doing an oil change, making the hot day even hotter. If she was this distracted, just anticipating Zach's arrival, she was in trouble. The bell on the front door chimed, making Cheyenne's stomach swoop like she was back on the Sapphire Pier roller coaster. Zach stood in the doorway, the sight of his sandy blonde hair and five o'clock shadow making her hands sweaty. Hey! He walked over to her, grinning, and leaned against the counter. Hey! Cheyenne clutched the money in one fist, trying to gather her thoughts into something coherent. Sawyer didn't come with you? Was it her imagination, or did Zach's expression fall at the question? No, he had some things he wanted to research online, so he stayed at the inn. Cheyenne curled her toes in her work boots. It would just be her and Zach then. They'd never been alone before. Cool, she said. I'm almost done closing things up here. Mike was off today, so it's just Doug in the garage. He should be done soon. Don't let me distract you, Zach said. Hilarious. Like every nerve in her body wasn't aware of his presence. Can I do anything to help? Zach asked. Cheyenne shook her head, turning back to the money. No, thanks. I've done everything except count the till for the night. As soon as Doug's gone, we can go over what I've found out about your truck. Perfect. That gives me time to answer a few texts. Cheyenne nodded, turning back to the small stack of ones, fives, and tens in her hand. She should focus on counting the till. She definitely should not obsess over whether or not Zach was texting a girl. His phone was sleek and expensive looking, which surprised her. She wouldn't have thought he was the kind of guy who needed the latest and greatest model. Had he chosen it himself, or was it work issued? What was Zach's job, anyway? Neither of them talked as Cheyenne focused on counting the cash. Zach sat on one of the barstools at the counter, his attention riveted on his phone. Sometimes she heard a faint click as he tapped the screen. The big wall fan whirred in one corner, Doug's shop didn't have an air conditioner, while an 80s rock ballad filtered through from the garage. The music shut off just as she finished her second count of the till. That means Doug's finished, she told Zach, who'd looked up from his phone. Her stomach fluttered with anticipation, and it wasn't just because of Zach. She couldn't wait to start on this project. It was exactly what she needed to get through the summer. Doug walked into the shop, a dirty rag tucked into his back pocket and his nail beds caked with grease and oil. Hey there, he said, giving Zach a nod. Hey. Zach rose, shoving his phone in his back pocket. Cheyenne looked away so she wouldn't be tempted to stare at his extremely nice rear end. Thanks again for helping me out like this. Don't make me regret it. Doug's tone was tough, but the toothpick stuck between his teeth twitched as though he was trying not to smile. I'm all done in there, so the garage is yours. Don't forget to put everything back where it came from and set the alarm when you leave. I won't, Cheyenne said. She'd closed up a few times and wasn't worried. You won't even know we were here. Doug grunted, waving a hand at them dismissively as he left the shop without another word. She locked the front door and flipped the sign to closed, then turned to Zach, feeling suddenly nervous. Okay then. I spent a couple of hours online last night looking for engines. Hang on a second. I wanted to talk to you about something first. Cheyenne licked her lips, mouth suddenly very dry. Did you change your mind? She hoped not. He wouldn't back out now, right? If he did, there went the extra money for her mom's treatment, the chance to keep her skills sharp over the summer. But more than that, she wanted to fix Zach's truck. To watch his eyes dance with approval as they restored it to its former glory. No, Zach said, and she breathed a sigh of relief. 
I just want to make sure we're on the same page before we begin. Oh. Maybe she'd relaxed too soon. Yeah, of course. I need to compensate you fairly, not only for your labor, but for your time. So keep track of the hours you spend searching for parts. Now she was melting under his earnest expression. He leaned toward her, arms folded and eyes sincere. That's not necessary, Cheyenne said. Paying me for labor is more than enough. Looking for parts is labor. And it's time-consuming. He pulled out his phone, showing it to her. I did some research of my own last night. Is this fair? I don't want to take advantage of your help. Cheyenne's eyes widened at the number he planned to pay her per hour, at least ten bucks more than what she usually charged. That's way too much. You need to cut that number in half. Half? That's practically highway robbery. If Doug was doing the job, it would cost at least that much. Cheyenne's pulse quickened at the playful banter. Yeah, well, Doug's been at this for decades. I'm just starting my career. Not true. You might have just graduated, but you've been doing this for a while. And while I'm sure that Doug is a fine mechanic, you are clearly an artist. They haggled back and forth for a few minutes, before finally agreeing on an amount that she felt was fair to both of them. Zack grinned in triumph, his enthusiasm contagious. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's get to it. You said you've got some options for me? Yes. She'd spent nearly three hours online last night, staying up way later than she should have. I found a few engines that will work, but none of them are great. The lowest mileage I could find was 180,000, which isn't ideal. If we instead rebuild the existing engine, it will give you a more solid, reliable machine that will last a long time. Hmm, Zach rubbed his jaw. Rebuilding sounds expensive. Cheyenne nodded, trying not to let her opinion sway him. If we buy one of the used engines I found, there's a good chance you'll start having problems again in a few years and be back to square one. If we rebuild the engine, it will be more money up front, but you'll basically have a new truck when it's finished and it'll last you another decade or two with proper maintenance, easy. She could see the wheels turning in his head as he analyzed every angle. He didn't rush to speak, seeming comfortable with the silence between them. She liked that about him, that he was confident enough to consider the options without wounding his pride. That makes sense, Zack said a few moments later. We should rebuild it then, right? I don't want you to go to all this trouble only for the truck to stop driving again in a few years. I think so, but I'm reserving final judgment until I can see what we're up against. Tonight, I'll take out the engine and assess what needs to be done to rebuild it. Once I know that, I can give you rough numbers for rebuilding the engine versus buying a used one, and you can choose whatever makes the most sense. Fair enough. Zack clapped his hands together, looking excited. Can I watch you take out the engine? Or maybe even help? Oh. Cheyenne blinked, her cheeks growing warm at the thought of working under Zack's intense gaze. Sure, if you want to. It'll probably be boring. Please. I'm stuck in Sapphire Cove for three weeks without much going on. Zack grinned, and for the first time, she noticed a dimple pop in one cheek. Watching you fix up my truck will be the most exciting thing I do this entire trip. If you're willing to put up with me, I'd love to watch you work and learn more about maintaining my truck. I promise not to get in the way and only help when it won't create more work for you. Cheyenne tried to ignore the way her stomach quivered. Suddenly, this project was even more appealing. If that's what you want. Only if you're comfortable with it. Her heart glowed at the sincerity in his expression. She knew that if she refused, he wouldn't bring it up again. The more time she spent with Zack, the more she realized how respectful he was of others. She should tell him no, that his presence would distract her, and she worked more efficiently on her own. That showing him how he could help would be more time-consuming than doing the work solo. But what she said was, I don't mind. Let's get started. Her heart thumped loudly in her chest as she led Zack through the garage and out the open metal door to the gravel lot. It was Zack's money. Zack's truck. 
If he wanted to watch her work, that was his prerogative. And that's all it would be, work. They could spend time together without anything happening. She wasn't about to get involved with any man, let alone a tourist. This relationship was strictly professional, and she intended to keep it that way. I moved it off the toe this morning, Cheyenne explained as they walked over to his truck. There was a wreck out on the scenic highway and we had to bring in that SUV. Zack glanced at the white explorer she was pointing to and winced. Its front bumper was a crumbled mess and the passenger side door had been pushed in. Yeah, it was a bad one, Cheyenne said. Was anyone hurt? She had worried about the same thing when she drove up and saw the wreck. Did this smashed vehicle remind Zack of the car accident that had orphaned him? No, thank goodness. Doug declared it totaled and now we're just waiting on the report from the insurance adjuster before sending it to the dump. Zack nodded, his eyes darting away. Cheyenne motioned to his truck. I'll just load this back onto the tow and pull it into the bay, then we can get to work. Zack eyed his truck, then glanced back at the garage, seeming to assess something. Why don't you just put it in neutral and I'll push it into place? Cheyenne raised one eyebrow, looking at the roughly 50 feet between his truck and the garage. She supposed it was a pretty straight shot. Are you sure? Yeah. Zack grinned, motioning for her to get in the cab. It'll be quicker and easier than using the tow truck. She ran her eyes over his physique, then blushed when Zack caught her staring. He looked like he pushed cars across gravel lots in his spare time. Yeah, okay. In the cab of his truck, she cranked down the window so they could hear each other. Zack took his place, sandwiched between the front bumper and the maple trees, lining the edge of the employee lot. He rested his hands on the hood, watching her expectantly. She put the truck in neutral, stuck her head out of the window, and said, Ready. Zack leaned down, his muscles contracting as he pushed. The truck rolled backward slowly at first, then picked up speed. Holy crap. She'd never been more attracted to a man in her life. Cheyenne quickly threw an arm over the seat so she could watch out the back window as they approached the garage, focusing on steering the truck into place. She risked another glance at Zack, who was continuing to push. He wasn't even breaking a sweat. She glanced back over her shoulder. The truck was in the bay now. Just a few more feet. That's good, she called, pressing on the brakes. Zack took a step back, and she put the truck in park. Were her hands shaking, or was she imagining things? Calm down, she told herself sternly. He was a client, not a crush. She couldn't do her job while mooning over him. Thanks, Cheyenne said as she stepped out of the truck. Zack wasn't even winded. You were right, that was a lot faster. No problem. What do we do now? Uh. She ran a hand through her hair, trying to focus. I need to clean off the engine before I lift it out of the truck. Then, once it's out, I can start disassembling it. Awesome. How do we get the engine out? She opened her mouth to respond, but the buzzing of her phone interrupted her. Dread instantly filled her mouth, hot and bitter. Cheyenne's hands shook, and she fumbled for her phone. Over the past few years, she'd grown to hate unexpected calls. They rarely meant something good. Sorry, she muttered, bringing the screen to life. Her heart dropped even further when she saw it was a text from Dr. Robbins. I need to take this. Just a sec. She opened the text, already expecting the worst. Your mother had another challenging day. Nothing you can do, but I wanted to make you aware. She talked about leaving again. We convinced her to get a good night's rest and see how she feels in the morning. Cheyenne closed her eyes against her tunneling vision, feeling nauseous. Why wouldn't mom commit to the program? Cheyenne couldn't decide if she was angry, hurt, or just sad. Maybe she was all of the above. What happened? Cheyenne texted. Mom had been there almost two weeks now, long enough she should be on the tail end of detox. Why was she still struggling so much? There had to be a way to turn this around. 
to make mom give rehab a real shot. Nothing specific, came Dr. Robbins' reply a moment later. Just another hard day. If we can get her through the next few days, I'm hopeful she'll turn a corner. Most patients are over the worst of the withdrawal symptoms in 14 days. Cheyenne closed her eyes, helplessness washing over her. She wanted to beg Dr. Robbins for more information. Demand to speak to her mother. But she knew it wouldn't do any good. For years, Cheyenne had tried to help her mother on her own. All it had resulted in were increasingly frequent overdoses. Cheyenne had to trust Dr. Robbins to do her job. Surely, mom wasn't even close to the toughest addict Dr. Robbins had worked with. She'd find a way to turn this around and make mom better. Cheyenne hesitated, then texted back a simple, thank you for letting me know. She was earning money to keep her mom in rehab. Right now, that was the most, and best, she could do for her. Everything okay? Cheyenne spun around, startled to find Zach standing so close. She'd almost forgotten he was here. Uh, yeah. No. She shook her head, worry making her sick. The urge to hide her concern was powerful, but something in Zach's expression made her want to tell him her secrets even more. It's my mom. He didn't press, like most people would have, but his light green eyes urged her on. She's. She's in a drug rehabilitation center in Harbor Bay. Just saying the words made Cheyenne's eyes sting with tears. For so long, she tried to ignore her mother's addiction and make excuses to chase away the problem. But it hadn't fixed anything. It's been hard for her. She doesn't want to stay, but she needs this program. I'm so sorry. Zach reached out, his hand covering hers for the briefest of moments. I can't imagine. Yeah. It's been hard, but I've got everything under control. Cheyenne shoved her phone in her pocket, motioning to the truck. She made her voice purposefully bright, not wanting to discuss her mom further. At least, not now. So, are you ready to learn how to clean an engine? Chapter 11 Cheyenne's mother was a drug addict. Zach watched as Cheyenne flitted around the shop, gathering supplies. Each movement said loud and clear that she didn't want to talk about her revelation. Maybe even was embarrassed by it. But Zach had heard it all the same. The weariness that sometimes flashed in her eyes, the quiet depth that said she was wise beyond her years, suddenly made sense. Addiction was often genetic. Was it something Cheyenne might one day struggle with, too? She bent over, picking up a stray wrapper someone had dropped on the floor, and Zach's thoughts scattered. Cheyenne was every bit as attractive in coveralls as he'd imagined. Dark gray fabric clung to her hips and chest in a way he'd never noticed on a man. The pants were rolled at the ankles, and she'd pushed the sleeves up past her elbows. Maybe she hadn't been able to find any coveralls in a small enough size? Her hair was gathered into a messy ponytail bun contraption once more, most of it hidden beneath a red bandana. He swallowed, forcing himself to look away. The last thing she needed right now was someone ogling her, even if she was the most attractive woman he'd ever met. It wasn't just her physical appearance, Zach had never been this tongue-tied around other beautiful women. Cheyenne had depth, and their shared grief had forged a connection between them he'd never experienced before. Stop staring, he commanded himself. Whatever pull he felt toward Cheyenne, one thing was clear, she carried just as much emotional baggage as he did. Maybe more. That meant he should avoid forming any emotional attachment to her. Cheyenne popped the hood on his truck, her face pinched. Her sparkle from earlier was gone, replaced with worry, and Zach wanted so much to bring back the joy he'd seen in her. But sometimes moving forward required acknowledging the pain first. As much as she didn't want to talk about it, Zach couldn't help wondering if that was exactly what she needed. How long has your mother been an addict? He kept his tone gentle and free of pity. He knew all too well how much the oh you poor thing act could hurt. Honestly, I'm not sure. Cheyenne bent over the engine block, fiddling with something. At least four years, that's when my dad died. I can't imagine. Losing both of his parents at once had been horrendous, 
but somehow losing one to death and one to addiction seemed even worse. Yeah, life's a real peach, Cheyenne said flippantly. She motioned to the truck. All right, the first thing we're going to do is completely remove the hood. With as much work as we have to do, it'll just get in the way. Zack nodded, backing off. That was twice now that she'd hinted that she wasn't interested in discussing her mother further. I didn't even know you could remove the hood, but that makes sense, Zack said. It would be nice not to worry about banging his head on it. Would make things inside more visible, too, without the hood casting shadows. How do we do that? It's pretty simple. First, we disconnect the wiper blades. She stood on tiptoes, reaching to the middle of the open hood, where it nearly touched the windshield. See these plastic covers? We'll pop them open and wiggle the connectors loose. I'll show you. Zack watched as she used a flathead screwdriver to do just that, deftly exposing and disconnecting the wire. Some of the lines had eased from her expression, and he had a feeling that this, working in a garage, was how she coped with her mother's addiction. Once it's out, we're going to pop this cover on the end near the hydraulics and pull out that cable. See? She demonstrated, dropping the cable once it was free from the hood so that it hung down the side of the truck. Now you try. Okay. Zack accepted the outstretched screwdriver and moved to the still-connected wiper blade. He removed the first plastic cover easily enough, all too aware of Cheyenne's appraising gaze. He could hit a target from a mile away with precision. Swim a thousand yards in less than fifteen minutes. But this connector was stubborn, and Zack felt himself flush as he applied more pressure. Careful, Cheyenne said. We don't want to break it. Zack nodded, softening his approach. His hand slipped on the connector, and he took a deep breath before trying again. What was it about this woman that had him so rattled? The blade disconnected, and Zack let out a satisfied whoop. It had taken him three times as long as Cheyenne, but he'd done it. There you go, Zack said, motioning to the loose cable dramatically. Cheyenne's smile glowed with approval. There was no hint of condescension in her eyes, and it made Zack like her even more. She grabbed a ratchet screwdriver, handing it to him. Great job. Now we can remove the bolts on the hood. They worked together, loosening the bolts and then disconnected the safety clip before ultimately removing the hood. Zack stepped back, admiring his truck's fully exposed components. That was a lot easier than I thought it would be, he said. Cheyenne grinned. Yeah, it doesn't take much. He motioned to the green fluid that seemed to cover everything. That's not supposed to be there, is it? Uh, no. That's antifreeze. She motioned to a stool tucked against the wall. If you want to take a seat or something, I want to look everything over before we start taking stuff out. Zack nodded, pulling the stool closer so he could watch her work, but also making sure not to crowd her. Cheyenne leaned over the truck, her hands deftly examining various parts that Zack could only vaguely guess at. Her hands were slender, almost delicate looking, but they moved with the purpose and precision of someone who'd done this a million times before. So tell me about the truck. Cheyenne reached for a crescent wrench and started loosening something. What did your dad love about it? Zack paused, the question catching him off guard. You know, I'm not even sure. I never thought to ask. Cheyenne glanced over at him, then back at the truck. It's kind of sad how that happens, huh? Zack nodded, sobering. There were so many things he'd never bothered to ask his parents as a self-absorbed teenager. He hadn't been a bad kid, but 18-year-olds were prone to selfishness, and Zack had only been a few weeks out of high school. He'd been bending under the weight of constant inquiries into his future by the adults in his life, not just his parents, but teachers and church leaders, too. He'd applied for college at a few state schools and had some options there. Dad had pushed him to pick a school a few hours away, said it would be good for him to live on his own. Mom kept hinting it would be much cheaper to live at home for a few more years. Sawyer and John, meanwhile, had been selling Zack hard on the military. Tell me your first memory of the truck, Cheyenne said. My first memory? Hmm. 
Zack leaned forward, resting his arms on his knees. Cheyenne had removed some part of his car, the alternator, maybe, and set it on the ground. I guess I would have been around three or four years old. It's not that exciting of a memory. I just remember sitting between them in the middle of the seat, eating a giant vanilla ice cream cone. We were probably coming back from the grocery store. Mom used to get me ice cream at the deli counter there sometimes. The image was fuzzy, country music playing low on the stereo, mom and dad laughing as they talked, the vanilla ice cream dripping onto his hand as he slowly savored each cold bite. But he'd felt safe in that memory. Happy. Complete. When was the last time he'd truly felt like that? Zach thought back over the past ten years, and soon other memories were forcing their way through, ones filled with the rat-tat-tat of gunfire and pulse of adrenaline. There was fear and blood and violence in those memories, but there was also a sense of purpose, of duty, of brotherhood. In California? Zach blinked, trying to remember what he and Cheyenne had been talking about. Sorry? She glanced over her shoulder at him, one eyebrow raised. The memory. Was it in California? Oh. She would assume that, since that's where he currently lived. No, Kentucky actually. Our town wasn't nearly as small as Sapphire Cove, but it wasn't big, either. About 20,000 people. The kind of place that lived by Friday night lights and where everyone came out to cheer for the homecoming parade. A town where any major life event, be it a birth, death, or surgery, was marked with covered casseroles and good OL Southern hospitality. He'd almost forgotten about that. Hadn't let himself truly think about home in years. I thought I detected a hint of a southern drawl in your voice. Cheyenne turned back to the truck, her voice muffled. What brought you to California? That's a pretty big change. Yeah, it was. How much should he tell her? Zach wasn't in the habit of outright lying about his career, but he also didn't like to overshare. I moved to California for work. What do you do? She pulled something else from the truck's insides and this he definitely recognized as the battery. Zack breathed deeply, the tang of oil and mechanical fluids burning his nostrils. They would be spending a lot of time together over the next few weeks, and his job was bound to come up again. He would give her part of the truth, he decided. Why was he suddenly so nervous? I'm in the Navy. Sawyer, John, and I are all on the same squad. He winced at the use of the word squad, a more SEAL-specific term. Cheyenne had stopped working and was fully facing him now. Was she familiar enough with the Navy to realize what that word meant? He'd never told a girl he was a SEAL. Not once. A soldier, Cheyenne said, nodding. That makes sense. What did that mean? Zack didn't know whether to be insulted or flattered. We're sailors, actually. Soldiers are in the army. Cheyenne nodded. I can see the serve and protect mentality in you and in Sawyer. You're both very chivalrous, but also very confident. My dad was the same way. Oh. Zack swallowed, the puzzle pieces of information Cheyenne had given him forming a picture. Was your dad? A policeman. Cheyenne turned back to the truck, her movements slower than they'd been before. That's how he died. Killed in the line of duty. The words hit Zack right in the chest. He ran a hand over his face, feeling sick. Images flashed into his head that he quickly buried. I'm so sorry. Me too. Cheyenne kept her back turned, but she also kept talking. It was supposed to be his last day in the field. Mom had begged him to stop patrolling the streets for years and I guess he finally agreed with her because he asked for a transfer to the police academy. To teach new recruits, you know. That's awful, Zack said quietly. Cheyenne didn't turn around. It was only an hour before the end of his shift, too. Then a robbery went sideways. He was the collateral damage. She spoke in such a clinical way, and yet he could hear the undercurrent of emotion in her words. His heart ached for her and he longed to pull her into a hug. That must have been so hard for you and your mom. Yeah. 
mom didn't handle it well. She swiped the back of her wrist against her forehead. Okay, I think I'm almost ready to remove the engine. You ready to put those muscles to use, Navy boy? Another deflection. But that was okay. Zack understood running from memories better left buried, and he sensed that Cheyenne had already shared more with him than she did with most. He'd shared more with her than he was used to, as well. So Zack let Cheyenne change the conversation once again. When she was ready to talk, he'd listen. He stood and flexed his arm, gratified when she laughed. At your service, ma'am. Ma'am? She placed a hand on her hip, looking all too adorable. What am I, a hundred years old? Miss, then. She wrinkled her nose into a grimace. I think I prefer ma'am. And I'm kidding about the engine. No sense breaking our backs when we can use a pulley to help lift it out. Give me a few more minutes and we'll start. I'm here to help whenever you're ready. The words felt weighty on his tongue, like a promise he was powerless to break. And that's when Zack knew that, despite his best efforts, he was tumbling headfirst into the same trap that John had. Despite all of Zack's denials, he realized that Sawyer's worries were justified. Zack could no longer deny the truth. Not even to himself. He was falling for Cheyenne. Chapter 12 Cheyenne bit her lip, focusing on the bolt, stubbornly clinging to the engine of Zack's truck. Country music crooned over the stereo, some guy she didn't recognize singing about a lost love. A few feet away, Zack sat at a workbench, a rag in one hand and the truck's alternator on the table, before him. Outside it was well past dark, but the bright fluorescent lights of Doug's garage made that fact inconsequential. The song switched, and Zack began singing along, his surprisingly good voice echoing around the garage. Cheyenne's frustration instantly melted away, and she looked over at him with a grin. She'd suspected that Zack's Kentucky roots meant he enjoyed this type of music, and so today she'd changed the radio station from 80s rock to test her theory. Johnny Cash, she asked. Zack's face twisted into a thoroughly insulted grimace. No, John Denver. Don't you listen to country music? Not really. Cheyenne turned back to the engine. But I like listening to you sing it. You have a good voice. Your southern accent becomes more pronounced when you're singing. Thanks, I think. My mom used to sing in the church choir. Zack's voice softened, and Cheyenne's heart twisted on his behalf. There was a quiet ache when he talked about his parents that she recognized in herself. I thought Christian rock and country were the only kinds of music in existence until I met John and Sawyer in middle school. Back then they were both into heavy metal and rap. Well, John more than Sawyer. Sawyer likes a good emo love ballad. Both heavy metal and rap played into Cheyenne's stereotypical idea of a soldier, sailor, she reminded herself. Emo love ballads? Not so much. It was easy to imagine Sawyer as a military man, with his imposing presence and gruff demeanor. Sack? Cheyenne had a harder time envisioning him in such a dangerous career. He was so friendly, so easy to talk to. But then sometimes a darkness would flash in his eyes that reminded her they barely knew each other. She imagined him charging into battle like a character in a blockbuster film, wearing camouflage fatigues and carrying a rifle. The image morphed into one of her dad, his handgun outstretched as he ordered a perp to stand down. Cheyenne blinked, pushing away the images. Both were probably inaccurate. What did someone enlisted in the Navy do, anyway? Did Zack spend most of his time on a ship? Did he even carry a gun? Music. She should focus on the conversation at hand and forget about Zack's job. What kind of music do you like? Besides country, obviously. Zack grinned. Will you make fun of me if I say all kinds of pop? Cheyenne laughed trying to picture Zack secretly buying the latest album of some teen boy band. Yet another thing that didn't fit her idea of military men. Only if you don't make fun of me for liking it, too. Never. Zack squinted at the alternator, rubbing vigorously at a particularly stubborn spot of grease. 
What other music do you like? Oh, a bit of everything. Alternative rock. Funk. Broadway songs. I love movie soundtracks. That's probably what I listen to most. The socket slipped on the bolt and she cursed, positioning herself to better leverage her strength. Engine being stubborn? Zack asked. Yeah, the bolt stripped. Cheyenne gritted her teeth, trying again. What a pain. Zack turned back to the alternator he was cleaning. Should I spray this with more degreaser? He wasn't going to pull his man card and offer to get the bolt off for her? Most guys would have immediately flexed a bicep, metaphorically, if not literally, and taken over. But not Zack. As they'd worked together over the last few days, she'd learned that he wasn't threatened by her knowledge of auto mechanics and always deferred to her. He was also an excellent student, quickly grasping the concepts she went over. Cheyenne couldn't stop smiling as she examined his work on the alternator. Yeah, maybe use a little more degreaser. It's looking good. Cool. Zack reached for the bottle, not mentioning the stripped bolt again. Cheyenne returned to the engine, and a few minutes later, she had the bolt removed. Zack appeared to have forgotten all about it. He was singing along to the radio again, his hands stained with grease as he worked on the alternator. She'd never been attracted to a man she worked with in a garage, until now. Sometimes her friends would tease her that she worked in auto mechanics because of all the hot men, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It was hard to be attracted to someone when they were constantly belittling you. In school, both when obtaining her technical certifications and her degree, she'd often been the only female in the class and the top student to boot. Her peers hadn't appreciated that. No one wanted to work with her on group projects, and she'd been subjected to a lot of muttering and outright hostility throughout her schooling. She'd encountered a similar attitude at the garages she'd worked at, another reason she wanted to open her own, and it was exhausting to have to constantly both defend and prove herself. But with Zach, Cheyenne didn't feel the need to do either of those things. He seemed both completely confident in his abilities and completely comfortable with hers. Maybe that was the sailor in him, or maybe it was just Zack. Either way, it was a refreshing change. The song switched again. Zack hummed along to the new tune, apparently not familiar enough with it to sing the lyrics. Cheyenne turned back to the engine, her heart beating hard in her chest. Zack was absolutely adorable. That fact was getting harder and harder to ignore. But he also had chosen a career that constantly put him in harm's way. A career that would take him back to California in a couple of weeks. Sure, she was enjoying their time together, but it wouldn't last. When did you know you wanted to be a mechanic? Zack asked. Cheyenne laughed, the memory instantly warming her soul. When I was about four. Dad young? The incredulity on his face was adorable. When I was four, I didn't even know what I wanted for dinner. Well, I didn't know much else, but I did know that I wanted to work on cars when I grew up. For Christmas that year, my parents got me one of those little jeeps you can drive that goes like one mile an hour. I loved that thing and rode it constantly, until it broke. Oh, bummer. I bet you were one sad little girl. He frowned in sympathy. I had a car like that too as a kid, and I cried for days when it broke. I was pretty upset. Cheyenne confirmed. She could still remember the way her entire body had felt light when Dad said they'd fix it together. Most of her early memories were of that little jeep. My dad opened it up to see if he could fix it. I sat in the garage with him for an entire Saturday while he tested wires and checked connections, and at the end of the day, it was running again. From that moment on, I was hooked. After seeing the car in a toy catalog, She'd written Santa a letter every week until Christmas. Years later, she'd asked her mom how they had afforded such an expensive gift on a police officer's salary. Mom had laughed and said that on Black Friday she had woken up at 4 in the morning to stand in line at a department store where it was on sale for nearly 70% off. Cheyenne blinked, surprised by the sudden tears. Where was that version of mom? Would she ever come back? She'd gotten another text from Dr. Robbins today. 
mom had refused to go to group therapy again. What I can't figure out is what a talented mechanic like you is doing working at Doug's. Zach looked up at her, his eyebrows raised. You must have had other job offers. Yeah. Cheyenne twisted off another bolt, setting it aside with a satisfying clunk. But none close enough to Harbor Bay. And to your mother, Zach finished, his brows knitting together. Cheyenne nodded, looking away. She needs me right now. And while I don't especially love working at the front desk, I'm grateful to Doug for hiring me. Rehab isn't cheap. So that's why you're working two jobs. Well, three, including this. Thanks again. Cheyenne smirked, then turned back to the engine. It's not forever. One day, I'll open my own garage and restore cars full time. Not just classics either. I love taking crappy, broken down vehicles and giving them new life. I can't wait to see your garage someday, Zach said. It's a good plan. She loved that he spoke as though opening the garage was a foregone conclusion. What about you? Cheyenne asked. Zach paused, the greasy cloth hovering over the alternator. What are my plans? Cheyenne nodded. Well, I thought I might go to the drive-in movie tomorrow. They're showing a new action flick. Cheyenne laughed at the unexpected response. Wow. Don't go crazy visualizing the future. I try not to. Something in the way he said that made her heart twist again, but she pushed it aside. If he didn't want to talk about his career plans, that was his prerogative. She wasn't sure she was ready to hear them, anyway. Do you want to come? Zach asked. Come where? Cheyenne reached for a crescent wrench, her hands nimbly working on disassembling the engine. To the movies. Wait a minute. Was Zach asking her out? Cheyenne struggled to keep her hands steady, not daring to look at him. She hadn't been on a date in years, but suddenly she desperately wanted to go on one with him, which meant she absolutely shouldn't. What about the truck? Isn't tomorrow your day off? Yeah, but I still planned on working on it after Doug closes the shop. The rest of her day off would be filled with overflowing laundry baskets and filling an empty fridge. Part of her was tempted to drive to Harbor Bay and demand to see her mother, but she was trying to trust Dr. Robbins and follow her lead. You deserve a break, Zach said. Let's go to the movie instead. Cheyenne bit her lip, finally daring to meet his expression. His eyes were unreadable, and she couldn't figure out how to interpret his invitation. Aren't John and Meredith coming back into town tonight? Yeah. She's the one who mentioned seeing the movie. I think it's a comedy. Meredith said there's plenty of seating for people without cars, and I guess it's a pretty happening place on a Saturday night. Could be fun. Cheyenne still wasn't sure if he was asking her out on a date. Either way, part of her longed to accept his invitation, while the rest of her knew she should say no. Zach was reeling her in, with his lazy smiles and easy acceptance of her authority on cars. She'd loved their conversations in the garage. He made her want to open up and share all of her innermost secrets. Which is exactly why she should say no. I should probably work on the truck. Zach's expression fell, but his voice was still upbeat when he spoke. Yeah, of course. I'm sure you'll meet John and Meredith some other time. Cheyenne bit her lip. She did want to meet his friends, especially John. Zack and Sawyer both spoke so highly of him, and it was obvious the trio of sailors were very close. What time is the movie? Zack's attention was back on the alternator. Dusk, but the gates open at 8 o'clock. What harm was there in seeing a movie? Cheyenne took a deep breath. Yeah, let's go. Zack looked up his eyes wide. Are you sure? Of course. It'll be great to meet John and Meredith, and the drive-in sounds like a lot of fun. I'm guessing Sawyer will be there, too? Yeah, and Aspen and Dan are welcome to come. Cool. Cheyenne could already feel butterflies of anticipation building. Let's skip working on the truck, then, we'd barely get started before it was time to leave. 
meet you at the drive-in at 8? I'm sure Aspen knows where it is. Sounds great, Zach said. This will be fun. Fun, but not a date, Cheyenne told herself sternly as they finished cleaning up the garage. She wasn't about to fall in love, especially not with a sailor. Not after what had happened to her dad. This isn't a date, she repeated to herself. Just a group of friends hanging out. It couldn't be a date, there was an odd number of people in their group, for starters. By the time Cheyenne got home, she was already second-guessing tomorrow night. Chapter 13 Just a few more hours until he'd see Cheyenne again. Zack gazed out the window of Meredith's Toyota Camry, watching the ocean speed by. The road was narrow, barely wide enough for two vehicles to pass, with houses on one side and a 15-foot drop-off to the ocean on the other. There were no beaches here, just the surf slapping against the cliffs. In the front seat, John and Meredith weighed catering options for the reception. Zack tried to focus on the discussion, but he didn't really care. Fish, chicken, pork, he'd eat whatever Meredith told him to without complaint. Sawyer wasn't doing a much better job taking part in the conversation, although Zack doubted it was because he was also obsessing over Cheyenne. More than likely, Sawyer was worrying about how they'd bring up staying in the seals, to John. After Zack had gotten back from the garage last night, he and Sawyer had agreed it was best to mention the subject as soon as possible. Zack should also focus on their upcoming conversation. He should be carefully arranging talking points in his head and crafting rebuttals for John's arguments. But Zack couldn't get Cheyenne out of his head. Would she back out tonight at the last minute? She didn't strike him as flaky, yet she'd also seemed hesitant to accept his invitation. Maybe, like him, she'd sensed the ambiguity of tonight. Were they on a date? Hanging out? Zack hadn't placed a label on it. Funny. He'd never before acted the coward, not when rescuing hostages, not when infiltrating secure military compounds, not when facing down a gun. We're just friends, he reminded himself. Friends could spend time together outside of work projects. They rounded a curve in the road, bringing Meredith's house into view. It was a one-story bungalow with clobbered siding that had weathered from white to gray over the years. There was no driveway, just a yard filled with sparse crabgrass and moss. Packed dirt peeked through in places, making it obvious where Meredith parked her car. Despite the home's rundown appearance, there was something charming about the flower boxes beneath the front windows and cheerful patriotic themed wreath on the front door. Meredith smiled brightly over her shoulder at where Zack and Sawyer sat in the back seat. Her blonde hair fell in waves around her oval shaped face. She had brown eyes that were a little too wide set but balanced out by a broad nose and full lips. Pretty, when Zack first met her, that was the word that had come to mind. Not gorgeous like Cheyenne, but nice looking. A year ago, they'd been running on the beach in Coronado when John literally ran into Meredith, who was in town for a photography conference. He'd invited her to dinner as an apology and the rest was history. Home sweet home, she said. It's a little dated, but I cleaned everything really well before flying down to Coronado to meet John. You didn't need to clean for us, Sawyer said as they climbed out of the car. It could be condemned by the health department and we still would have slept in worse, Zack agreed. We're just happy to have somewhere warm and dry to stay. Sorry that means kicking you out. Hey, I'm the one who offered, Meredith said. I don't mind staying at my friend's for a couple of weeks if it means having John here, and you guys too, of course. I'm so excited that all of you are in Sapphire Cove. Her tone was completely genuine. She leaned into John, smiling up at him, and the look in their eyes made Zack feel as though he was intruding on a private moment. For the first time, he wondered if leaving the seals was the right choice for John. He and Meredith seemed so happy together, and John had been distracted during their last few ops, never a good thing. John wrapped an arm around Meredith's shoulders, pulling her against his side. Home improvement projects are at the top of my list once I'm home permanently. Promise. Good, because I've got a long list of them. Meredith smirked as she pulled her keys from her purse. Come on in, guys. Meredith's home was tidier than Zack had expected 
based on her creative personality. Two twin-sized air mattresses were crammed on the floor of the small living room, neatly made up with fresh bedding. Part of the dated kitchen was visible from the front door, complete with cheap forward cabinets and gold countertops. Doors off to the left probably led to the bedrooms and bathroom. It's kind of small, Meredith said, her tone apologetic. I would have put the air mattresses in the spare room, but it's filled to the brim with photography backdrops and props. One of you can sleep in my bed. This is great, Sawyer said, giving Meredith a warm smile. Zack and I don't mind air mattresses. Better than the floor, Zack agreed. John would take Meredith's bed. Thanks so much for this. Seriously. Of course. We're family now. She offered them both a warm smile. Let me show you around. The tour of Meredith's house didn't last long, two bedrooms, a single bathroom, and a small breakfast nook. Zack couldn't help but grin at the cluttered spare room. It was jam-packed with photography equipment, just as Meredith had said it would be, and in the chaos, he saw glimpses of her creativity. But the rest of the house was tidy and spotless, if a little dated. Zack knew her grandfather had built the home when the couple first married, and he suspected Meredith hadn't known how to do many of the repairs it needed since she'd inherited the property after her grandmother's death. Meredith didn't strike him as the type of girl who was handy with a hammer. Cheyenne, on the other hand. Zack had no doubt she could install new cabinets in a kitchen if she wanted to. Meredith stuck around for a little while, making small talk, but Zack's mind was lost in an alternate reality, one where he and Cheyenne were remodeling a small beach bungalow together. He imagined her style to lean toward industrial, concrete countertops, exposed brick, reclaimed wood floors. She'd need a large garage out back to restore cars in, of course. Zack's toes curled in his boots. The image was nothing more than a fantasy. Seals didn't have time to remodel beach bungalows. Soon, Meredith was waving goodbye as she drove away. Silence descended over the three men, thick with discomfort. Zack folded his arms, feeling awkward around his friends for the first time in years. They hadn't been alone since John's revelation, just before their last stop. Should we relax for a bit? John asked, motioning to the living room. Zack and Sawyer exchanged a look, then nodded. They stepped around the air mattresses and settled into the faded floral couch and love seat. Thanks again for coming down here, guys, John said. It means a lot to me. Of course we'd come, Zack said. It's a nice town, Sawyer added. Zack glanced to where Sawyer sat on the opposite end of the couch. He raised his eyebrows, and Zack responded with a brusque nod. They wouldn't find a better opportunity than this. It was time to hash things out. Zack took a deep breath, then dived in. You kind of dropped a bomb on us, before that last op and we haven't had time to talk about it. Leaving the seals, are you sure about this? John sighed, leaning forward. His eyes were earnest as he looked back and forth between them, elbows resting on his knees and fingers steepled. You know as well as I do the divorce rates for a seal, John said. Over 90 percent? I'm not willing to bet on those kinds of odds. Which was pretty much what Sawyer had guessed when they discussed this, just the two of them. Cheyenne flashed into Zack's mind, followed quickly by the memory of his conversation with Sergeant Matthews Wright before leaving for Oregon. The two realities couldn't coexist, and he'd made his choice, military over a traditional family life, when he walked into that recruitment office. Meredith is a strong woman, Sawyer said. His eyes were troubled, his expression a confusing mix of regret and determination that Zack didn't understand. I know you guys would beat the odds and be in the 10%. John inclined his head. Maybe we would. But I won't do that to her. The thought of marrying Mare, having a kid or two, and then dying, leaving her to deal with life alone, his Adam's apple bobbed as he ran a hand roughly down his face. Zack shifted on the couch, his hair standing on end. He'd never seen so much fear and worry in John's eyes. When I asked Meredith to marry me, I promised I would give us a normal life. One with apple pie and small-town routes and all of that cheesy crap I never thought I would have. 
John was talking about exactly the kind of life Zach had been lucky enough to enjoy as a child. Maybe our life isn't a Norman Rockwell painting, but what we do is important, Zach said, unable to hide the edge in his voice. The seals have given us everything. I know. John's eyes were pained, but his jaw was set. I've given my country a decade of my life, and I don't regret a single minute of that. I thought I'd give them at least another decade, then retire. But when I met Meredith, everything changed. He held up his hands, as though trying to find the words. She's an undertow, you know? She sucked me in before I even realized what was happening, and I want to be with her more than I ever wanted to be a seal. The snatches of time we'd get between missions aren't enough for me. Zack looked away, the sincerity in John's expression too much. He hated that he understood where John was coming from, at least a little. Hadn't Zack been counting down the minutes until he would see Cheyenne tonight? On the opposite side of the couch, Sawyer's fists rested on his knees. We worked so hard to get to this point, he said, his voice strained. Are you sure you're ready to give it all up, just like that? Once you turn in your official orders, there's no coming back. No changing your mind or rejoining the team. Zack held his breath, watching John closely. There was a bittersweet pain behind his smile, but there was joy, too. When had John changed from a sailor into a husband-to-be? I won't change my mind, John said. And I won't regret my decision. The seals seem like a small sacrifice in the grand scheme of things. I would give up anything for Meredith. The conviction in John's voice was unmistakable. Zack let the words sink in, finally accepting the truth. He and Sawyer had lost. John would marry Meredith. He would leave the seals and move to Sapphire Cove. The only question that remained was what would Zack and Sawyer decide to do. Zack slumped back against the couch, feeling as though he'd surfaced too quickly from a dive. He studied both his friends, the anguish in their expressions mirroring the pain he felt in his chest. What if this really was where their paths diverged? John leaned forward, his elbows resting on his knees and hands clasped together. Look, I'm not an idiot. I know that asking you both to leave with me and move to Sapphire Cove is a long shot, at best. If you choose to stay, I'll understand completely. But we joined the military because we had no family, no direction, no plan. And it served us well. I'll always be grateful for my time there, and I'll always be a SEAL at heart. But we've got, what, maybe five more years on the front lines. And then what? What happens next? Zack flinched. What happened next was every SEAL's worst nightmare, a desk job. Being stuck as support instead of in the heat of the action. We might get more than five years, Sawyer said, but there was no conviction in his voice. There'd been a close call on the last op. There was a close call on nearly every op. You know as well as I do that SEALs are rarely operational past 12 years, John said. We've already used up most of those and we're staring down our thirties. Be realistic. Wouldn't you rather leave the seals on your terms? Zack clenched his jaw, feeling sick. He'd be 29 on his next birthday. Had already been in the Navy for a decade, and a seal, for nearly that long. Through the years, they'd watched members of their team be forcibly discharged because of injury or moved to desk jobs because of age. Zack hadn't kept in touch with most of them, but none had been happy about the change at the time. Maybe there was something to be said for choosing to leave instead of being forced into it. I know you might not agree with my choice, but I hope you can at least understand why I made it, John said. I know this wasn't our plan, but I love Meredith. I never dreamed I could be this happy. All I want now is for my two best friends to be happy for me. Zack stared at Sawyer, his eyebrows raised. How could they argue with that? As much as it would hurt to watch John leave, Zack didn't want him to stay if it would make him miserable. They were brothers, no matter what. And that meant wanting what was best for John, even if it wasn't easy. Sawyer's shoulders sagged, and he turned his focus on John. Of course, we're happy for you. We just wanted to make sure you were confident in your decision, Zack added, forcing out the words. 
no regrets. John straightened, his eyes turning to steel. I'm sure. Meredith and Sapphire Cove aren't some consolation prize. This is the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I hope you guys can see that before we head back to California. The best thing that could have ever happened to me. Cheyenne's face was at the forefront of Zach's mind again, that sparkle in her eyes as she worked on his truck. Maybe leaving was the right choice for John, but that didn't make it the right choice for Zach. His path led to officer candidate school. So what if he was benched in another five or six years? Zach would make sure they were the best years of his life. When his time came, he'd graciously move into a support position and continue to be part of the team. Part of the family. If he was really lucky, he'd get another decade on active duty. Enough sad talk, John said. Zach, I want to hear about your truck. Someone's fixing it, right? Yeah, Zach said, thinking again of Cheyenne. She's an excellent mechanic. It's going to be expensive, but she's confident she can get the truck running again. We were lucky to find her, Sawyer said. I'm not sure we could have found another mechanic willing to take on the job. She's great, Zach agreed, the words such an understatement that they felt like a lie. He paused, not sure how to phrase the next part. He didn't want John or Sawyer to get the wrong impression. You'll get to meet Cheyenne tonight. She doesn't know anyone in town yet, so I invited her to see the movie with us. I think you'll like her. Chapter 14 On Saturday, the hours until Cheyenne's not-a-date with Zach dragged by. Her shift at the inn seemed to last days instead of hours, and back at the bungalow, she was pretty sure the clock was defying the laws of nature and moving backward. It didn't help that she hadn't heard anything else from Dr. Robbins. Hopefully, no news was good news on that front, and Mom was finally adjusting to the program. Cheyenne tried to calm her nurse with boring, mundane tasks, but it was no use. She thought of Zach while grocery shopping at the small mom and pop store in town. Did he prefer red meat or white? What sort of food did he eat in the Navy? Was he extremely health conscious, or did he indulge in treats occasionally? While doing laundry, she wondered if Zach did his own, or if someone else took care of that for him while he was on base. Vacuuming her bedroom only made her wonder if he had hardwood floors or carpet in his apartment in California. Did he even have an apartment, maybe one he shared with Sawyer and John? Or did single men in the military have to live in barracks on base? And how long had Zach been single? That thought led to wondering about Zach's last serious relationship, which soon spiraled into hating every girl he'd ever kissed. It had only been a few days since Zach had rolled into town, and yet she missed him terribly when they were apart. That unsettled her almost as much as the lack of communication from Dr. Robbins about her mom. Cheyenne vigorously scrubbed the bathtub, putting all of her nervous energy into cleaning. She should have said no to the movie tonight. Should have insisted she needed to work on the truck. Even now, her hands itched for a crescent wrench. But she couldn't bring herself to text Zach and cancel. The thought of not seeing him tonight, of saying she wasn't coming, made her stomach ache. What was she doing? That question ran on a constant loop as she stared blankly at the contents of her closet, a bath towel tucked tightly around her. Although she'd moved out of her apartment in Portland, she hadn't brought everything to Sapphire Cove, choosing instead to leave most of her things at her mom's. There was a dressy blouse she'd only worn once, for the interview at the job she'd ultimately turned down, tucked into one of those boxes. She hadn't thought she'd need something that classy in Sapphire Cove. With a sigh, she reached for her favorite pair of jeans and a fitted blue t-shirt that brought out the color of her eyes. This wasn't a date, so she might as well be comfortable. The outfit seemed appropriate for a drive-in movie, and she could dress it up a bit with her tailored leather jacket and silver hoop earrings. She spent way too much time straightening her hair and applying makeup, something she hadn't done with any attention since graduation. Cheyenne tried not to think about how that evening ended. Tonight would be different. But it's not a date, she reminded herself as she applied mascara. There was no harm in hanging out with new friends. She wished Aspen could come as a buffer, but she and Dan were wedding shopping tonight in Paradise Green. 
at least Sawyer would be there, ensuring their group was an odd number. Not a date. She'd meet John and Meredith tonight. It was obvious by the way Zach talked about John that the two were very close. She wanted to make a good impression for reasons she didn't dare examine. Cheyenne gave herself one last once over in the mirror, then grabbed her car keys. She couldn't let tonight be a date. The drive-in theater was located on the east side of town in a large open field. Towering Douglas firs encroached on the screen, eager to reclaim the land at the first sign of apathy. Grass and clover peeked out of the tightly packed dirt that served as the floor. Picnic tables peppered the area closest to the screen while the back two-thirds of the lot was left open for parked cars. As Cheyenne walked toward the ticket counter, she could just make out the red and white checkered awnings of the concession stand. Cheyenne. That voice made her insides flip more than any roller coaster. She shielded her eyes against the setting sun as she searched for Zack. It didn't take long to find him standing off to one side of the ticket line, an arm raised in a wave. He wasn't alone. Zack and his friend stood out, all three of them well-muscled and over six feet tall. She lifted her hand in acknowledgement, stomach quivering with nerves. As she drew closer, Zack's enthusiasm at her arrival was obvious. His face was bright, smile wide. He gelled his sandy blonde hair into a spiky style she liked more than she wanted to admit. You made it, Zack said, but his smile seemed to say, I'm so glad you're here. I did. Cheyenne hugged the leather jacket she'd folded over one arm tighter to her body. She knew she shouldn't let her pulse skip erratically at just the sound of Zack's voice, but she also couldn't seem to make it stop. Thanks for inviting me. I wouldn't want to spend the evening with anyone else. Zack's voice was low and sultry, his green eyes nearly liquid in the waning light. Someone cleared their throat, making Cheyenne jump. Three people were looking down at them, Sawyer, with a rueful half-smile, the other two with confusion. Cheyenne felt her cheeks heat with embarrassment. Here, let me introduce you to everyone. Zack placed a gentle hand at the small of Cheyenne's back. She could feel the heat from it seeping through her shirt. Cheyenne, I want you to meet John and Meredith. Guys, this is Cheyenne, the genius mechanic who's fixing my truck. I don't know about genius, Cheyenne said, accepting John's handshake. He was even taller than Zack and Sawyer, and just as handsome, with a wide jawline and broad cheekbones. Thick, dark hair was trimmed military short, but his eyes were warm and friendly. Nice to meet you, John said. Meredith didn't bother with a handshake, instead startling Cheyenne with a quick hug. She was of average height and slender, with wavy blonde hair and arresting green eyes. Cheyenne wasn't a particularly touchy-feely person, but something about Meredith's easy smile made the hug feel natural. You have no idea how glad I am that you're here, Meredith said with a smirk. Are you trying to say you're sick of spending all of your time with us guys? Sawyer asked, pretending to be wounded. Meredith shoved him playfully. I'd just like to have a conversation about something besides dive schedules and weapons training. John wrapped an arm around Meredith's shoulder, the action easy and his smile carefree. You love us and you know it. I do, Meredith agreed, rising on tiptoes to meet John's kiss. Cheyenne looked away, her cheeks heating at the open display of affection, but neither Zack nor Sawyer seemed phased. She guessed that this kind of behavior was typical for Meredith and John. Zack motioned with his head toward the back of the growing line. Should we get our tickets? We'd better, John said. Cheyenne trailed the group, and Zack slowed his step to match hers. John said something that made Meredith shove him, and Sawyer laughed. The sound was open and full, something Cheyenne hadn't heard before from the reserved sailor. It was obvious this group was tight-knit. Family, even. They had a closeness and easy camaraderie about them she envied. She loved Aspen, of course, but her roommate and best friend had her own family, one Cheyenne wasn't a part of. And Cheyenne's family was only a shadow of what it once had been. Had mom attended therapy today? Was rehab getting any easier for her? Meredith gave Cheyenne a friendly smile as they took their place at the back of the line. Zack tells me you just moved to Sapphire Cove. 
Cheyenne quickly tried to reorient her thoughts. Meredith seemed willing to be friends, and she didn't want to ruin that by coming across as detached. Yeah, about two weeks ago. But I'm only here for the summer. We'll see, Meredith said with a laugh. Sapphire Cove is the greatest town in the world. Once you're here, it's hard to leave. That's what Aspen says. The more she got to know the town, the more Cheyenne suspected it wasn't all talk. Aspen's my roommate who talked me into coming here. Meredith snapped her fingers. That's right. Zach mentioned your friends with Aspen Porter. It's kind of a funny coincidence, huh? What is? Cheyenne asked. That you're friends with Aspen, and that Sawyer and Zach stayed at her family's inn. Dan did such a great job on the renovation and I knew it would be the nicest place in town to stay, which is why I booked their room there. The inn was nice, Zach agreed. He was standing close enough to Cheyenne that their arms were nearly touching, and it scattered her thoughts. Yeah, the inn looks great, Cheyenne said. She should pay attention to the conversation and try to make friends with Meredith. She definitely shouldn't focus on how much she wanted to hold Zach's hand. You've lived here your entire life, right? Yes. Meredith leaned into John, smiling up at him. Her expression was one of total contentment. It's the perfect place to raise a family, and I can't wait until John is here with me all the time. The guys are gone so often. Cheyenne glanced over at Zach, her concentration momentarily broken by the way his dark green t-shirt deepened the green of his eyes. You're deployed a lot. He lifted his shoulders in a shrug. It's part of the job. Huh. Cheyenne hadn't realized that the Navy deployed so often. She folded her arms, feeling suddenly on edge. It doesn't matter, she reminded herself. Zach could be gone one day a year or 365, it wouldn't affect her either way. In another couple of weeks, he'd head back to California. Aside from the occasional exchange about his truck, they'd probably never see each other again. She had to be okay with that. After buying their tickets, they headed to the concession stands. If you like ice cream, you have to try the stuff they have here, Meredith said. It's from Granny's Ice Cream Parlor, this cute little shop on Main Street. They make it fresh daily, hand-churned and everything. I worked there in high school. I never say no to ice cream, Zach said, winking at her. What about you, Cheyenne? She grinned, knowing he was remembering their conversation about his first memory in the truck. Let's get some ice cream. According to Meredith, the concession stand had an abbreviated menu from what was available at Granny's. Cheyenne wasn't much for sweets, so she chose a single scoop of raspberry cheesecake ice cream. After they'd all paid, Meredith led them to one of the picnic tables with a great view of the gigantic movie screen. Cheyenne took a bite of ice cream, her eyes popping open in surprise. The rich flavor of the cream perfectly balanced the tangy raspberries. She took another bite, her eyes rolling back in her head. That good? Zach asked with a grin. He was watching her with an amused expression, and she felt her cheeks heat with embarrassment. Told you, Meredith said, taking a bite of her mint chocolate chip. I gained 15 pounds working at Granny's. Didn't regret it one bit. No ice cream can be that good, Zach said. Cheyenne pointed her spoon at his bowl of Rocky Road. That's big talk from someone who hasn't even tried it yet. Zach laughed, lifting his spoon theatrically. Fine. I'll try it. His eyes didn't leave Cheyenne's as he dug into his bowl and lifted a full spoon to his lips. Her mouth grew dry, the taste of the raspberries disappearing as she watched Zach's tongue flick out and his mouth close over that spoon. Slowly, deliberately, he pulled the spoon from his mouth, now clean of ice cream. She watched as he ate, his eyes widening at the flavor. See? Cheyenne said, her voice oddly breathy. I told you it was good. It should be, considering how much work goes into it. Meredith flexed her arm. You should have seen my biceps in high school. It's hard work to hand churn ice cream. Worth it, though. Definitely worth it, Zach said, his eyes still on Cheyenne. 
Better than the ice cream your parents would get you in Kentucky, she murmured. He inclined his head to the side, taking another slow, deliberate bite. Maybe. They ate their ice cream, chatting about trivial things as the sky deepened from blue to purple. The floodlights near the concession stand dimmed, and then the movie blinked to life on the screen. Cheyenne honestly couldn't remember the last movie she'd seen. Between work, school, and her mom, there hadn't been a lot of time for entertainment. She tried to focus on the storyline, some action-packed spy thriller with a humorous bent and lots of romance, but kept getting distracted by Zack. He sat beside her on the picnic bench, slowly eating his ice cream. With each lift of the spoon, she felt the tension inside her grow. There was no denying it, she was attracted to him and it had been embarrassingly long since she'd been on so much as a date. Which this definitely wasn't. What was the harm in spending time with Zack while she could? It was only two weeks, and she felt lighter around him. Happy. Zack was fun to talk to. A great listener. Definitely nice to look at. He didn't mansplain to her when they worked together in the garage and eagerly lapped up anything she was willing to teach. She met his gaze as he took another bite of ice cream, his eyes luminous in the light of the movie screen. His lips curved up in a slow smile. Cheyenne's phone silently vibrated in her pocket, pulling her from the moment. She scrambled for it, heart thumping and palms sweaty. The name of the treatment facility flashed across the screen. Cheyenne sucked in a breath. Everything okay? Zack whispered, setting down his spoon. I need to take this, she said in a low voice. I'll be right back. Cheyenne speedwalked toward the concession stand, intent on ducking to the side of it, where she wouldn't disturb anyone with her conversation. She pressed the phone to her ear, cold tendrils of anxiety snaking up her spine. Hello? Hi, Cheyenne. It's Dr. Robbins, from the center. What's wrong? Cheyenne demanded. Dr. Robbins sighed, the worry coming through the line loud and clear. It's your mom. She wants to go home, and this time, I don't know if I can talk her out of it. Chapter 15 Cheyenne felt blindly for the wall of the concession stand, black spots darting across her vision. One hand brushed against the rough planed wood siding as she escaped deeper into the anonymity of the shadows. What happened, she demanded. An extreme anxiety attack brought on by stress, which seems to have led to an emotional breakdown. Dr. Robin's voice was gentle. I've been speaking with her for almost two hours, but I'm not getting through. She won't answer my questions, won't do the mindfulness exercises, is refusing a sedative. Every time I think we're getting somewhere, she shuts down and says she needs to talk to you. Cheyenne clutched at the phone, the memory of her mother's limp body sprawled on the kitchen floor making her sick. She can't leave. She has to stay there and get better. That's what I want, too. We're on the same team, Cheyenne, Dr. Robbins said. But your mother isn't here under court order and has no obligation to complete the program. So, what? You're giving up? Cheyenne's voice pitched higher on the last word. No, no, Dr. Robbins said quickly. I'm calling because I think talking to you might convince her to stay. She loves you very much and, despite her actions, which suggest otherwise, she wants to make you proud. Cheyenne leaned heavily against the wall, hearing the faint murmur of the employees inside the concession stand. An image surfaced of her mother cheering loudly from the audience during Cheyenne's fourth grade play. She'd been a tree, hardly the star of the show, but after the performance, mom had praised her like she'd won an Oscar. What do I say to her? Cheyenne choked out. Tell her you love her. The slight lilt in Dr. Robin's voice became more pronounced. Remind her of all the reasons why she entered the center in the first place, and all the reasons she needs to stay. I've already done that, but it will mean something different coming from someone she loves. And she does love you, Cheyenne. I know. Cheyenne's voice hitched on the last word. She swallowed back oceans of tears. If she let them loose, they might drown her. Put her on. I'll try my best. Thank you. Dr. Robbins paused. 
Just know that if she still decides to leave the center after your conversation, it isn't your fault. Ultimately, these choices are hers alone. You aren't culpable for her actions. Cheyenne squeezed her eyes tightly shut. What if she does leave? I mean, she's detoxed now. That means her system can't handle the same amount of drugs as before, right? The line was quiet for a beat too long, Dr. Robin's hesitation obvious. Yes, that's true. But let's not jump to the worst-case scenario, quite yet, okay? I'm very hopeful that once she's spoken to you, she'll decide to stay. Cheyenne nodded, even though Dr. Robbins couldn't see it. Her voice was too clogged with tears to speak. I'm going to place you on hold while I go get her, Dr. Robbins said. Cheyenne put a hand to her mouth, fighting to hold back her emotions. She couldn't lose it now, not when mom needed her to be strong. There would be time later, after she was alone in her bedroom, to have a breakdown. Goosebumps prickled on her arms as the cool Oregon breeze drifted by. Crickets chirped in the tall grasses just beyond the concession stand. She'd left her leather jacket at the picnic table. Cheyenne wished she had it now to shrug into. How could the outside world feel so normal when inside she was falling apart? If mom left the treatment center, Cheyenne would have to return to Portland early to keep an eye on her. Leaving Aspen high and dry with the rent payment on the bungalow wasn't an option, so Cheyenne would continue paying her half through the summer, which meant she'd have to move back home with mom. Doug would be upset Cheyenne was quitting early, and she hated the thought of leaving either him or the inn in a bind. But what else could she do? If the tables were turned, if mom wasn't such a mess, she'd do the same for Cheyenne. Hadn't she done as much the year Cheyenne caught mono? She'd been in bed for a month, hardly able to function, and mom had waited on her hand and foot. She'd gone down to the school every day to collect Cheyenne's schoolwork so she wouldn't fall behind, and made sure she always had a collection of her favorite movies close at hand for when she wasn't sleeping or doing homework. The next year, a bullet had grazed dad's arm during a traffic stop, gone bad. For six months, mom had mostly stayed in bed, paralyzed with fear and worry. Cheyenne had been 14 at the time, plenty old enough to take on all the household responsibilities permanently. It hadn't been easy, but at least mom hadn't been on drugs. In the evenings, after cleaning up the dinner dishes, Cheyenne would snuggle in bed with her mom and they'd watch old musicals together. A cricket chirped loudly near Cheyenne's foot, making her jump. She closed her eyes, forcing herself to focus on the present situation. What good would it do to relieve the past? She'd move in with mom and find a job somewhere in Portland. Maybe the car museum hadn't found someone else yet. Suddenly, irrationally, Cheyenne wished she hadn't been so cautious with Zach. Why hadn't she realized how much she was counting on their next two weeks together? One action from her mom could end their evenings in the garage. Cheyenne would tow his truck back to Portland and keep working on it, but they might never see each other again. The line clicked on again. Are you still there, Cheyenne? Dr. Robbins asked. Yes. She was pleased that her voice held little indication of her emotional distress. Okay. I've got your mother with me. We're in my office, so she has some privacy, but I'm going to stay with her while you two talk. Talk? That was a nice way of putting it. More like it was up to Cheyenne to save her mother's life. That was how vitally important it felt to keep mom in rehab. If she left now, Cheyenne had no doubt that she'd return to the drugs and overdose again, whether by accident or intentionally. Thank you, Cheyenne said. Why had dad felt the need to pick such a dangerous career? Why had he had to die in the line of the duty? Why couldn't mom have handled his death without turning to pills? There was rustling as the phone changed hands, and then her mother's ragged voice said, Cheyenne? Hey, mom. Tears pressed at the back of her eyes, making her head throb, but she refused to let them make her voice warble too. Refused to give her mother so much as a hint of an excuse to return home. Oh, Che. Mom's pitch was high, her voice tight and thready. You have to get me out of here, baby. Please, come and take me home. Cheyenne pinched the bridge of her nose, looking up into the deep purple sky. Clouds covered the view, 
wiping out any evidence of stars. I can't, Mom. I'm in Sapphire Cove with Aspen, remember? Mom's voice turned pleading, the guilt coating it like peanut butter, thick and hard to swallow. That's not far from here, right? I need you, baby. This place is like a prison. They make me meet with people all day long and talk about, she cut off abruptly. I just can't talk about it anymore. It's too hard, baby. Talking about dad was hard for Cheyenne, too. But she also longed to relive the good memories with someone who shared them. Mom had shut down every attempt. I think talking about dad will be good for you, Cheyenne said, trying to sound positive. Maybe if you talk about it, you wouldn't have. I know it looked bad, Mom cut in. When you, when you found me. But I swear, baby, Mom's words were rushing out now, tumbling over each other like rocks in a river. It was a simple misunderstanding. I wasn't trying to do anything, you know. Anything bad. If trying to kill yourself wasn't bad, then what was? Cheyenne still wasn't sure whether to believe her mom's claims that the overdose had been an accident. How could she not have realized that she'd taken nearly ten times the recommended daily dose of a highly potent drug? If Cheyenne had been running late that day, mom would probably be dead right now instead of in a treatment center in Harbor Bay, trying to get clean. I need you to stay at the center, Cheyenne said, making her voice pleading. I know it's hard to be far away from home, but Dr. Robbins is trying to help you. She thinks it's dangerous for you to leave right now, and I agree. If you'd just let her help. Help? Mom cut in, her voice turning hard. You think Dr. Robbins, or anyone in this godforsaken place, is trying to help me? This place is absolute hell. Mom, please. I came and got you. Mom rolled right over Cheyenne's attempts to speak. On the first day of kindergarten, when you called me crying at recess, I came right down to the school and picked you up. Remember that? We went and got pretzels at the mall, and then I spent every day helping in your class until you felt more comfortable. Cheyenne put a fist to her mouth, holding back the sobs. She did remember that. Maybe Dr. Robbins was wrong. Maybe mom would be better off at home. The pain in her voice nearly broke Cheyenne. But she couldn't forget how it felt to race across the kitchen floor, pills crushing beneath her heels, and bend down to check for a pulse, terrified she was about to touch a corpse. Whether or not mom wanted to admit it, she had a problem. One Cheyenne wasn't equipped to handle on her own. You always tried to do what was best for me, Cheyenne said, her voice quiet. Now it's my turn to return the favor. If I come and get you tonight, that awful detox will have been for nothing. I don't have a problem, Mom said, her voice sharp. A doctor prescribed those pills to me. Cheyenne bit the inside of her cheek. In the beginning, maybe. But you and I both know they haven't been for a while. Please, Mom. I'm begging you. Stay at the center. Do what Dr. Robin says. Won't you at least try to get better for me? The line went silent. Cheyenne held her breath, hoping against hope that she'd convinced her to stay. She didn't want to leave Sapphire Cove. Didn't want to play prison warden to her mom's pill addiction. Instead, she wanted to flirt with Zach each night while they worked on his truck. She wanted to be young and carefree. Maybe even happy. When mom finally spoke again, her voice was soft and broken. So what you're saying is that you won't come and get me. Cheyenne closed her eyes, biting back the words she wanted to say, of course, I will. I'm already on my way. No, not tonight. I want you to stay there and do the program. Can't you at least come and visit me? A tear trickled down Cheyenne's cheek and she quickly brushed it away. I will as soon as Dr. Robbins decides you're ready for me to come. She'll never decide that. Mom's voice turned hard again. Dr. Robbins hates me. No, she doesn't. She's trying to help you. Please, baby. Come and pick me up. The trickle of tears had turned into a river, and Cheyenne couldn't stop them from falling any more than she could stop a waterfall. 
everything in her said she was being a selfish brat for denying such a simple request. But one of them had to be strong. Cheyenne would be strong enough for both of them. I'm not coming to get you. I know it's hard, but things will get better soon. At least, they would if mom did the work. She had to do the work. Mom was crying now, her broken sobs crackling across the line. I miss him so much. It hurts so much. Cheyenne stared up at the starless sky, blinking furiously, but the tears continued to fall. I know. I miss him too, and I don't want to lose you as well. That's why I need you to stay at the center and really put forth the effort. I need you to get better, okay? The line went quiet. Was mom marshalling another rebuttal? I'll stay, mom said finally. At least for now. Relief made Cheyenne's limbs weak, and she slumped against the wall of the concession stand, letting her head hang. I'm glad. Promise you'll come visit me soon. I promise. Just as soon as Dr. Robbins says I can. Try to stay positive, okay? I'll try. There was a muffled voice, then Mom said, Dr. Robbins wants to speak to you again. Okay. Bye, Mom. Cheyenne pinched her nose, blinking quickly. I love you. Her mother didn't reply. She never repeated the words anymore, not unless she wanted something. Dr. Robbins was back on the line again. Thank you. I promise I will do my best to help your mother. But she has to put in the work, too. I know, Cheyenne said. I appreciate everything you're doing for her. Hang in there, Cheyenne. You still have the number for the support group I gave you, right? Yes. Not that she had any intention of using it. Good. I'll keep you updated. Have a good night, Dr. Robin said and hung up. Cheyenne clutched the phone to her chest and slumped to the ground. Gravel bit into her skin and she pulled her legs to her chest, resting her head on her knees. Silent sobs shook her shoulders. Life had been so impossibly hard since Dad's passing. She missed him with a fierceness that still took her breath away at times, even after four years. But watching her mother's retreat from the world felt like losing her, too. It was almost more painful than losing Dad. The crickets chirped lazily, accompanying the bangs and energetic music that floated over from where the movie played a fight scene. She could still hear the faint murmur of the employees inside the concession stand, but no one seemed to know she was crying on the other side of the wall. That was fine with her. Cheyenne gulped in air, trying to pull herself together enough to go back to the group. Am I doing the right thing, Dad? She silently begged. The soft crunch of gravel made her look up abruptly. Zack approached slowly and crouched down beside her. His eyes were dark with concern in the faint glow of the moonlight, his figure a dark silhouette against the growing blackness. Hey, he said, holding her leather jacket out toward her. I thought you might be cold. Thanks. Cheyenne took the jacket from him and slipped it on, not meeting his eyes. She hated that he was seeing her like this. It was so obvious that something was wrong. The jacket's fabric lining was cool from the dipping temperature, but she pulled it around herself like a shield, breathing deeply. It smelled faintly of Zack. Is everything okay? he asked, still crouched. I got worried when you didn't come back. Yeah, everything is fine. More tears streamed down her cheeks in direct contrast to her words, and she struggled to wipe them away. Mom had agreed to stay in rehab, at least for now. That was something. She had to focus on the positives. You're not fine. Zack motioned to the hard ground beside her. Mind if I sit? The movie. I'm not worried about that right now. Zack effortlessly dropped to the gravel, leaning up against the side of the concession stand so that they were seated side by side. What I'm worried about is you. Something is obviously wrong, and you are not okay. You are not okay. When was the last time someone had acknowledged that? Cheyenne certainly hadn't. Falling apart was a luxury she couldn't afford, not when mom so desperately needed her to hold it together. 
but tonight, the words made her entire body shake. Mom wanted to walk out of a treatment program Cheyenne could barely afford. Sure, she'd agreed to stay, for now. But what if she changed her mind in the light of day? Cheyenne was so tired of being strong. Tired of shouldering it all alone. I am not okay, she whispered, her shoulders hunching as she hugged her knees, closer to her body. Another sentence was on the edge of her tongue, I need help, but she couldn't quite force that one out. Zach's strong arm wrapped around her shoulder, pulling her against his side. Come here. She curled into the warmth and comfort he offered, tears pricking her eyes afresh. When was the last time she'd been held? She honestly couldn't remember, and Zack was solid and warm and steady. What did it matter that Sapphire Cove was just a rest stop for both of them? That she'd sworn off relationships? She'd deal with that later. Right now, she needed him. Cheyenne slid her arms around his waist and leaned her head against his broad chest. He pulled her closer, his breath warm in her hair. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, he said quietly, his lips nearly touching her ear. But I'm happy to listen if you do. She tightened her hold on him, burrowing into his warmth. For years, decades, maybe, she'd kept everything inside. Even with Aspen, she had held back more than she'd shared. But something about Zach made her want to open up. My mom wanted me to come and pick her up from rehab, Cheyenne said, keeping her face turned into Zach's chest. She laid on the guilt when I refused. Oh, Cheyenne. He kissed the top of her head, making her shiver and soothing some of her pain. I'm so sorry. More tears fell at his kind words. She brushed them away with the sleeve of her jacket. This is silly. I shouldn't be falling apart like this. I disagree. You've got a lot on your shoulders right now. She peered up at him. His mouth was pulled down in a frown, his concern apparent. When was the last time someone other than Aspen had worried about her? I guess everything just sort of hit me at once, she muttered. Not surprising, all things considered. He gently wiped away a tear she'd missed, making her breath catch. His fingers were warm and rough against her cheek, and she was suddenly very aware of just how close they were. How intimately they embraced. She bit her lip, staring up at him as thoughts of her mother slipped away. Zack's eyes darkened in the moonlight, and he eased away from her. Che. What? she challenged, tightening her hold on him. She was tired of putting up walls. Tired of maintaining her distance. Tired of dealing with everything alone. He ran his hands slowly up and down her arms, as though trying to warm her. You've had a rough day. I'm not going to take advantage of that. She knew she should drop her arms. Pretend this moment between them had never happened. He was right, she was vulnerable right now, her emotions raw. But she was tired of fighting. For years, she put her life on hold. Couldn't she live for herself, just for the next few weeks? Slowly, she slipped her hands to the back of his neck, watching as his Adam's apple bobbed. Am I imagining the chemistry between us, she asked. His hands slowed on her arms. No. But I have to go back to California in just a few weeks. My job isn't conducive to relationships. She flinched at the last word, her mom's tortured screams from the day her father died echoing in her memory. I'm not looking for a relationship. I don't want to think beyond Sapphire Cove. You might feel differently later, Zack said. Her fingers needed the corded muscles of his shoulders, and she heard his breath hitch. If you aren't interested, say the word, and I'll back off. He groaned. She almost pulled away, but then he said, you're killing me. Of course, I'm interested. What red-blooded man wouldn't be? She could think of more than a few who'd been threatened by her expertise with cars, but she didn't feel like bringing that up right now. Instead, she kept kneading his shoulders, her heart hammering furious in her chest. What would she do if he took her up on her offer? She thought of mom at the funeral, wearing the black dress Cheyenne had purchased for her. It had been a size too big. Mom had been too distraught to notice. 
You're incredible, Zach said, his voice husky. You know that, right? You're smart. Work harder than most of the men I know in the Navy. Have the biggest heart of anyone I've met. Is this your polite way of saying no thanks? Cheyenne asked. I'm leaving Sapphire Cove. So am I, she shot back. Che. She didn't move away. Didn't back down. Was it so bad to want someone to hold her? Someone to share her burdens, even temporarily? Cheyenne wasn't looking for a relationship, just a little relief from her worries. A small dose of happiness. With a groan, Zack took her face gently in his hands. All her worries scattered at his touch. His hands on her face felt better than she'd imagined, like a warm cup of cocoa on a stormy day. There was a fire in his eyes that made her feel as though she was burning from the inside out. When was the last time she'd felt this alive? Just a summer fling, Cheyenne whispered, running her hands over the breadth of his shoulders. She wouldn't let it turn into anything more. Zack responded by lowering his head toward hers. She bit her lip, her heart picking up speed. He paused, their lips almost touching. His thumbs caressed her cheeks, sending shivers to her entire being. Last chance to change your mind, Zack whispered. She slipped her hands around his neck. Stop offering me an out. He chuckled, the sound making her stomach quiver. Okay then. His mouth was warm and soft, tasting faintly of Rocky Road ice cream. Cheyenne urged him closer, deepened the kiss. She felt light enough to float. Was this what it felt like to be a whole person instead of a broken corpse? His hands moved from her face to her back, pressing her closer. She could feel the strength of his hold and the intensity of his kiss, but his hands never strayed. Somehow, she had known they wouldn't. Emotion welled up in her as she cradled his jaw, the stubble on his cheeks sending tingles down her arms as his lips moved in time with hers. When was the last time she'd felt this safe? This complete? It was like he pulled her worries into himself with each brush of his lips against hers, not erasing the burden, but sharing it. Every kiss before this one was wiped from her mind as she connected with Zack on a level that felt so much deeper than the mere physical. His hands pressed against her back, urging her closer. I'm here for you, they seemed to say. His lips moved against hers, skillful yet respectful. I want to help, they seemed to whisper. She squeezed her eyes tightly shut, pressing closer to him. The acceptance he offered was almost too much to bear, and yet she wanted more. Several long moments later, he pulled away, resting his forehead against hers. I've been all over the world with the Navy, he said quietly. She raised one eyebrow. That's not what I expected you to say. He chuckled, his arms tightening around her. I've been all around the world, and yet I've never met a woman quite like you. You're incredible. You know that, right? Her cheeks warmed, and she ducked her head against his shoulder. You're pretty incredible yourself. Two weeks, he said, the words almost a question. She bit her lip, the solid foundation he'd set her on with his kiss suddenly feeling as unstable as sand. Two weeks, she agreed. He nodded, kissing her on the forehead. I have no idea how I'm going to let you go. Chapter 16 Zack couldn't get Cheyenne out of his mind. His feet slapped against the pavement in time with Sawyer and John's. Their breathing was even and steady beside him, and Zack tried to focus on nothing but the run. They'd only done one mile on the sandy beach today, before transitioning to the paved bike path that curved around a park in town. The cool early morning breeze whipped against his face, but Zack barely felt the cold. He was thinking about the way Cheyenne's warm hands had felt on his face. He'd never experienced a kiss like that, so much more than physical. At that moment his world had realigned and now he could only see Cheyenne. He knew she wasn't the kind of girl who had summer flings, whatever she'd said last night. Deep down, he knew he wasn't that kind of guy, either. So where did that leave him? When he'd seen her crying last night, it had broken his heart. At that moment, he would have done anything to see her smile. Was this how John felt about Meredith? 
Zack could never lead the seals himself, but he was starting to understand what might compel John to do just that. Three older ladies speedwalked on the trail ahead, and Zack and his friends fell into single file as they ran past them with a nod. Everything was so Mayberry here in Sapphire Cove. Up ahead, a middle-aged couple held hands while walking a fluffy white Pomeranian. The sun rose just above the trees, casting delicate shadows across the dew-covered grass. It was such a far cry from the violent, often war-torn locations where Zack usually hunkered down. John looked at his watch, then over at Zack and Sawyer. One more lap, then a cool-down, he asked. Works for me, Sawyer said. They'd started their run later than normal today, John had never been a morning person, and it was nearly eight o'clock. That meant Cheyenne was probably at the inn right now, serving breakfast. Zack could almost see her smirk as she leaned close and told him that the food had all come pre-cooked. What did she do when not at the inn or at Doug's? Zack knew she'd recently graduated from college, and he had a feeling that her mother took a lot of Cheyenne's free time up. What else? He wanted to know everything about her. What did she do for fun? How did she unwind after a stressful day? Had she cried herself to sleep last night, sick with worry for her mom? They completed their lap and slowed to a walk, their breath steady and even. Maybe Zack would go for another, harder run this evening. If he didn't put in more effort during this leave, he'd struggle when back to regular training on base. That wouldn't be a great look when applying to officer candidate school. What do you two have planned for today? John asked as they walked. Sawyer looked at Zack, who shrugged. Nothing really, Sawyer said. What did you have in mind? They were heading back toward Meredith's, their pace having slowed from cooldown to leisurely. Birds chirped loudly in the pine trees, and the streets were quiet. I want to show you both the research I've done on opening a scuba company, John said. I've already got a few locations in mind to check out, and I'd love it if you guys came with me. Zack shoved his hands in his pockets, suddenly uncomfortable. Even after yesterday's conversation, he'd hoped John would change his mind. But it seemed he was pressing forward, both with the move to Sapphire Cove and with opening the scuba company. A week ago, the thought of leaving the seals to take tourists on dives had been laughable. But Zack was starting to see the appeal. It might be fun to work with his two best friends on something that wasn't life-threatening. Yesterday's conversation replayed in Zack's head. John was right about one thing, their time on active duty was ticking down. No, Zack told himself sternly. They still had a few good years left, even more, if luck was on their side. He wanted to spend them as an officer. That sounds good, Sawyer said easily, looking over at Zack. You up for it? Yeah, of course, Zack said. We're at your disposal. Cool. John grinned, scratching the back of his neck. I know I sprung this on you, but I really appreciate the support. Support. Zack mulled over the word. Did he support John's choice? He'd accepted it, but support felt like a step further. One he wasn't entirely sure he was ready to take. Back at the house, Meredith had arrived and prepared a big breakfast. Zack tried to focus on the conversation as they all sat down to eat, but his mind was back with Cheyenne, replaying that incredible kiss. Zack? Meredith asked. He blinked, looking up from his plate of waffles. Sorry. What did you say? Meredith leaned back, a sparkle in her eyes. Never mind. Everything okay, man? John asked, his brows knitting together in concern. You've been pretty quiet this morning. Kind of distracted. Oh, I can guess why. Meredith took a bite of her eggs, looking smug. How did things go with Cheyenne last night? John shot Zack a glance, his eyebrows raised. Wait, are you into her? No, he invited her to the movies, because he hates her, Sawyer said, rolling his eyes. John tried to slug Sawyer, who scooted away with a laugh. Not in the house, Meredith said mildly, but she was smiling. How would Cheyenne react to the roughhousing that inevitably erupted between Zack and his friends? He had a feeling that, like Meredith, 
she wouldn't mind it much, either. Sorry, babe, John said, focusing again on Zack. Of course, I knew you liked her, but I didn't realize it was like that, between you two. It's not, Zack said, focusing on his breakfast. They'd definitely been eating better since Meredith entered their lives, at least when she had access to a kitchen. Sawyer snorted, reaching for another piece of bacon. You can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to us. You like her. Like her? No one could meet Cheyenne and not feel that way. She was strong and fierce, and yet also somehow vulnerable. Zack had seen the way she put everything into caring for her mother, and he'd seen the toll it took. Of course I like her, he snapped. She's a likable person. But it doesn't matter, okay? Seals aren't made for relationships, so I'm not going to do anything about it. She's better off without me. Thick silence blanketed the room, and Zack was instantly awash with shame. He looked over at Meredith, contrite. Oh geez, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. You can be a seal and a husband, John cut in. Just because I've chosen not to do both doesn't mean you can't make a different decision. Who said anything about marriage? Zack stabbed at his waffles, suddenly feeling warm. John didn't back down. Yeah, we're seals. But we're still allowed to date, fall in love, get married, have kids. All that stuff. And I'm fully supportive of John remaining a seal, if that's what he wants, Meredith broke in. It's important to me that you guys know he isn't leaving, because I've asked him to. We don't think that, Sawyer said, leaning across the table toward Meredith. We know you're made of stronger stuff than that. Meredith's right, this decision is all mine, John said. And maybe, in some parallel universe, I would decide to stay a seal and be happy with that choice. Zack looked down at his waffles, suddenly morose. If you like Cheyenne, you should go for it, John said. What does it matter if she lives in Sapphire Cove, or Portland, or Coronado? We're gone so much that any relationship is a long-distance one. He threw an arm around Meredith's shoulders, giving her a kiss on the cheek. We've managed. And so will you, for the right woman. You all are reading way too much into this. Zack tried not to think any more about that kiss. She had a tough night and needed to talk, so I listened. And yeah, we like each other, okay? But we've both agreed it won't go anywhere past the next two weeks. And even that felt like a maybe. In the light of day, would Cheyenne have changed her mind? Zack wouldn't blame her. Whatever she wanted, he'd respect. Sawyer sighed, scrubbing a hand over his face. Zack. He knew what that worried, sympathetic tone meant. What was implied with that single word? I don't want you to get hurt. Have you told her? John asked. He didn't need to specify what it was. They all knew. Zack thought of the devastation on Cheyenne's face as she revealed that her dad had died in the line of duty. It seemed that had been the beginning of her mom's spiral into addiction and Cheyenne's parent-like role. She knows we're in the Navy, but not that we're special ops, Zack said. And I've been very clear that I'm not in a relationship place right now. She's not, either. Meredith glanced at John. Didn't you say something similar to me the first night we went out? He chuckled, returning to his plate of food. Yeah, and look how that turned out. Those words stuck with Zack throughout finishing breakfast and helping Meredith clean up. He was quiet as John took them around town, showing them various property options for the scuba shop. He tried to focus as John and Sawyer discussed the financial feasibility of the scuba company, discussing numbers and running through scenarios. But he wasn't paying attention. Not really. Meredith had a photo shoot that evening, and John went with her to help, leaving Sawyer and Zack alone in the bungalow. The front door had scarcely closed when Sawyer heaved a sigh, his shoulders rolling with the motion. You're still thinking about her, Sawyer said, his tone flat. John and Mare might have been too wrapped up in each other to notice, but you've been distracted all day. It's eating you up inside. I'm worried about you. Zack rubbed a hand over his face, the promotion flashing into his mind again. 
should he tell Sawyer? I just never thought I'd meet a girl like her, you know? Sawyer's lips pursed in a frown. It was the same look he had when contemplating a tough mission with no clear exit strategy. Yeah, I know. You aren't reconsidering our plans, are you? Of course not. Zach heaved out a sigh, making a decision. Lieutenant Matthews spoke to me right before we left. Let's just say I have good reason to stick with the seals. Sawyer's expression remained the same for half a second, then his eyes widened in understanding. Congrats, man. Zack felt hollow, despite the sincerity behind Sawyer's words. It's not even close to official, but you see why I have to stay. It's what you've wanted, Sawyer said. You've worked really hard for it. Zack blew out a breath. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. What you're telling me is that you have no intention of leaving the seals and moving to Sapphire Cove? No, Zack said, flinching. Do you? Sawyer shook his head. No, obviously. So we're still on the same page, then. Even though John seemed set in his course, Sawyer agreed. Zack nodded, standing. Good. I'm going to head over to the auto shop and see if Cheyenne needs help with the truck tonight. You coming? Nah, I'll stay here, Sawyer said. See you later. Try not to let her change your mind. Chapter 17 Zack passed Granny's ice cream on the way to Doug's auto shop and, on impulse, ducked inside. Cheyenne's hand-churned raspberry had melted into a creamy goo last night while they talked, okay, mostly while they kissed. She'd thrown the bulk of it away uneaten, which was a shame because the ice cream had been fantastic. Main Street was the most crowded Zack had seen it so far, the streets dotted with tourists strolling in and out of shops. The long line inside Granny's almost made him change his mind. But it seemed to move quickly, so he settled in to wait. The shop was quaint, with a few eclectically matched tables and chairs filling up most of the space and a wide glass-fronted case holding all the various flavors in giant tubs. It fits Sapphire Cove perfectly. He watched as, at the front of the line, a woman with dark hair and a slender build similar to Cheyenne's, crouched down next to a small boy, pointing at the case. The boy chattered in a sing-song tone, making the woman laugh, while the tall man beside her ruffled the child's hair. Growing up, Zack had been so certain that would one day be him, a husband and father who took summer vacations to idyllic places like Sapphire Cove with his growing family. He was only 28. Did he want to give up that opportunity simply because he had a dangerous job? Maybe his friends were right, and it didn't have to be all or nothing. A loud sound ricocheted around the shop, making Zack's entire body tense. He quickly scanned the room, hands clenched into fists at his side. He'd only been caught unaware a few times in his life and each instance had left a powerful impression. But it was nothing, just a dropped metal ice cream scoop that had clattered against the hard tile floor. The server had already dropped it in the sink, and no one but the little boy and his parents, whose ice cream was being scooped, had seemed to notice. Zack let his shoulders slump, the release of adrenaline leaving him weak, while the reality of his situation made his mouth taste bitter. If he ever dared attempt a relationship, what kind of baggage would that place on his other half? When he finally escaped Granny's, Cheyenne's raspberry ice cream in hand, he sucked in a deep breath. Tonight the air was warm and balmy, with a hint of sea breeze flavoring it. Zack had the sudden urge to go for a run like he did so often in California. There, he loved to run along the sandy beaches and watch the sea lions sun themselves on large rocks. Something told him Cheyenne would like the warm temperatures and perpetual sunshine that characterized Southern California. He had a feeling she'd appreciate the light after the heaviness her life had become. San Diego was only a few miles from base, and one of the biggest cities in the state. There might even be more job opportunities as a mechanic there than in Portland. He was pretty sure there was even a classic car museum at Balboa Park. Not that Cheyenne would ever move away from her mom. Still, it would be nice to have a friend to visit in his downtime. Portland was only a three-hour flight from San Diego. They could talk on the phone when his job allowed, and he could visit when he had leave. Not a relationship, exactly, 
but maybe he and Cheyenne could share their emotional baggage with each other. It wouldn't change anything about their circumstances, but it might lighten the load. He thought of the feel of her hands in his hair last night. Maybe they could be more than friends. Not friends with benefits, exactly, what he felt for her went much deeper than such a superficial label, but friend who sometimes kissed. The crowds thinned as he turned off Main Street and down one of the side roads, the ice cream securely in hand. His heart raced as he approached Doug's, and he suddenly felt like an idiot for bringing the ice cream. Cheyenne had seemed to enjoy it, but he knew from their conversations that she preferred salty foods. Last night, with the cover of darkness and romantic moonlight streaming through the trees, he'd felt completely at ease kissing Cheyenne. But how would they treat each other now that there was nowhere to hide? The shop was empty of customers, not surprising since it was nearly closing time. Cheyenne stood behind the counter, that red bandana tied like a headband again and her hair falling like a fountain from the ponytail high on her head. Her face lit up when she saw him, her cheeks glowing an enticing pink. Hey, Zach. Fifteen minutes and I can lock up, then we can go work on the truck. Doug's already left for the day, and Mike's just finishing up. She craned her neck, looking through the glass door into the garage. Actually, he might already be gone. He usually leaves through the garage. Been slow today? She nodded. Surprisingly, yes. Good. Then you'll have time to eat your ice cream. He held it out to her, feeling shy. You didn't get to finish yours last night, so I thought I'd bring you some. Her eyes softened. She took the ice cream from him, clutching it in both hands. You remembered my order. Of course. He remembered everything about Cheyenne. The way her eyes brightened when explaining something about his car. The diamond tears sparkling in her dark eyelashes as she cried. How his heart felt lighter when she laughed. The way he felt whole, like his world was okay for the first time in years, when she kissed him. Well, this is pretty much the sweetest thing anyone's ever done for me. She took a bite of the ice cream, giving a satisfied groan. This is just what I needed today. Thanks. Rough day? She shrugged, her eyes dropping to the ice cream. She tapped it with the spoon, lips pursed. No more than usual. Dr. Robbins texted me this morning, and my mom is still at the center, at least. The urge to help, to fix everything and make it better, was almost overpowering. That's good, right? I think so. She took another bite of her ice cream, not quite meeting his eyes. I'm sorry about how I acted last night. I didn't mean to lose it like that. He longed to hop over the counter and pull her into his arms, but he didn't want to overstep his bounds. She'd been scared and vulnerable last night, and he shouldn't have taken advantage. If she wanted to keep her distance now, he'd respect her wishes. Don't apologize for your feelings. You have every right to cry if you need to. I can't imagine the stress you're under right now. Her mouth quirked up in a half grin, but she still wouldn't look at him. Kissing you proved to be a pretty good stress reliever. Yeah. His heart thudded in his chest as forcefully as before he headed out on a mission. But this felt very different. She finally peeked up at him, her cheeks rosy and eyes uncertain. Yeah. I know it was kind of a heat of the moment thing, but. I like you, Zach. This girl was killing him. Last night was hard for you. If you've changed your mind. No, she blurted. But if you have. He should change his mind. But he was helpless when it came to resisting her. Zach leaned over the counter, capturing her face in his hands. Her breathing hitched, and she pulled her bottom lip in with her teeth. Slowly, deliberately, he covered her lips, with his. She leaned into him, her free hand threading into his hair. He could taste the raspberries from her ice cream. Delicious. He kept the kiss shorter and sweeter than the ones they'd shared last night, not trusting his self-control. Eventually, he let her go, and she put out a hand to steady herself against the counter. I like you too, he said, simply. And I haven't changed my mind. Right. Cool. 
She adjusted her headband, her entire face red. I mean, it's just until you go back to California. Her words were a misfired weapon in the heat of battle, and the cold dose of reality hurt. He swallowed, knowing this was for the best. Of course. And you'll probably head back to Portland after your mom's done with the program. Cheyenne nodded, staring down at her ice cream. I don't have relationships. I don't date, and I don't do casual flings. I'm not sure how to do either of those with you, a relationship or a fling. I don't know how to do it, either. Zach ran a hand through his hair. If you're uncomfortable with it, we don't have to. We can go back to being friends. I'll even stop hanging around while you work on the truck, if you want. It hurt to say the words, but he'd do whatever she asked. No, the quickness of her reply made him grin. I don't know what we are, or what we can be. But I'm tired of worrying about the future. For once in my life, I just want to live in the moment and enjoy it. But if you want something different. No, Zach broke in. He reached his hand across the counter, and her fingers curled into his. I want to live in the moment, too. We can figure everything else out when the time comes. Maybe I can call you sometimes while I'm away. Maybe, Cheyenne said, inclining her head to the side. But I don't want to think about that now. Right now, we've got an empty garage, a dismantled truck, and a whole evening of work ahead of us. Perfect, Zach said. I wouldn't have it any other way. Chapter 18 Cheyenne climbed out of her convertible and stared up at the bright cobalt blue door of Meredith's bungalow, taking a steadying breath. A red, white, and blue wreath with an American flag in the middle decorated the doorway, adding a cheerful splash of color to the otherwise plain home. When Zach had invited her to dinner with the group tonight, she'd wanted to say no almost as much as she'd wanted to say yes. It had only been one week, one crazy, unbelievable week, since she'd met Zach, and she knew dinner with his friends was akin to dinner with his family. But time seemed to move differently in Sapphire Cove. Yes, it had only been a week, but she felt like she'd known Zach for months. Years, maybe. They'd spent every free minute together since their kiss three days ago. They'd discussed a variety of subjects while working on his truck and stealing kisses, everything from their childhoods to their hobbies to their worst first dates. Already her heart ached at the thought of losing him. Time was ticking down, and she wanted to enjoy every second they had together. So she'd said yes to tonight, even though she knew the smart thing to do would have been to say no. Stop standing here like an idiot, she murmured to herself. What if someone saw her from the window? It wasn't like this was her first time meeting Zach's friends. Aside from the drive-in movie, she'd seen Sawyer twice in passing, and John and Meredith once. Cheyenne picked up the apple pie she'd purchased at Baylor's Diner from where it rested on the passenger seat and marched determinately to the front door. It opened almost immediately after she knocked, and one look at Zach melted away all of Cheyenne's worries. Hey, he said, his gaze electric. Hey, she replied, grinning. He pulled her in for a hug that had her entire body buzzing. She pressed her cheek into his broad chest, tightening her one-armed grip around his waist, the pie safe in her other hand. It had been so long since she'd been regularly hugged. She was still getting used to it. I missed you, Zach said, leaning down to give her a soft kiss. Her toes curled inside her shoes. He'd stopped by just a few hours ago to say hi, but a customer had shown up, so he hadn't stayed for long. I missed you, too. Thanks for coming. His hand slid down her arm before capturing her hand in his. It means a lot to me. I'm glad you invited me. Cheyenne realized that, as apprehensive as she'd been about coming, it was true. She loved that he felt comfortable enough to invite her along to an evening at home with his friends. The back door banged open, and Meredith appeared with a plate in hand. Her hair was pulled back in a half-clip and a frilly apron was tied around her waist. Judging by the frayed bric-a-brac ribbon, it had probably belonged to her grandmother. Her eyes brightened when she saw them together. Good, you're here. John and Sawyer are outside, fighting over who should man the grill. They just put the burgers on. 
I decided to stay out of it. Zack squeezed Cheyenne's hand, leading her toward the kitchen. I'd rather spend my time in here with you than out there grilling hamburgers, anyway. His words made her feel as warm as an engine that had been running all day. Meredith just laughed, setting the plate in the sink. It's good to see you again, Cheyenne. Thanks for inviting me. Cheyenne held up the boxed pie, suddenly feeling self-conscious. Maybe she should have baked a dessert herself. She wasn't horrible in the kitchen, but she didn't exactly enjoy spending time there, either. I brought dessert, as promised. Oh, 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 Baylor's. Good choice. Meredith motioned to the counter with her head, not seeming the least bit annoyed that Cheyenne had bought dessert instead of baking it herself. Would you mind setting it over there? Of course. Cheyenne set the pie where instructed, looking around the tiny galley kitchen. It was dated, with gold countertops and faux wood cabinets, but clean and somehow cheery. Put me to work. What can I help with? Meredith didn't hesitate. If you want to cut the tomatoes, I'll work on washing the lettuce. Zach, start slicing cheese for the burgers, will you? By the time Cheyenne finished cutting the first tomato, she felt completely at ease in Meredith's small home. The other woman chatted animatedly about a beach photo shoot she'd done that morning, where mid-shot the couple's dog had bolted after a crab and ended up drenched with seawater. Cheyenne glanced over at where Zach carefully sliced cheese from a block. There was a small smile on his lips and a soft look in his eyes that perfectly mirrored the contentment she felt. When was the last time she'd enjoyed a barbecue with friends? Cheyenne wasn't sure she ever had. Dad had worked a lot growing up, always willing to take on overtime for the extra pay, and mom's cooking tended more toward casseroles. Based on what Zach had shared with her over the past few days, Cheyenne would guess his dad had been the type to grill. Yesterday he'd talked about neighborhood block parties on the 4th of July. It had sounded so nice, friendly and warm and fun. Sapphire Cove was probably the type of town where neighbors threw block parties. For a moment, Cheyenne imagined what it would be like to live here permanently. Maybe even get married and settle down. She slipped, cutting the next tomato slice at an odd angle and narrowly missing her finger. Who was she kidding? None of that was for her. She'd moved back to Portland once mom finished rehab and work on getting her better. Save up for a garage. Keep restoring cars. If she could run her own garage and have mom healthy and happy, that would be enough for her. Under no circumstances would Cheyenne allow her heart to be held in the hands of someone else, like mom had. That would only give that person the power to crush it. Cheyenne wouldn't allow her life to be destroyed like mom's had been. Soon, everything was ready for dinner. They moved into Meredith's backyard, where a picnic table sat on a small patio. It amazed Cheyenne how completely at ease she felt with this group of strangers that somehow felt more like family. How is your mom doing today? Meredith asked as she passed Cheyenne the plate of burgers. About the same, Cheyenne said, her spirits dropping. After her meltdown at the movie, she'd given the group a brief explanation. They'd all been empathetic to her situation, but she'd spent years avoiding the subject and discussing it now wasn't easy. She hasn't left the treatment program yet, so I'm taking that as a good sign. Dr. Robbins wanted to try to arrange another phone call this weekend. Cheyenne knew she should look forward to the direct contact with her mom, but instead she was dreading the guilt trip she'd no doubt be put on. I hope she can stick it out, John said, his tone sincere. Addiction is a beast. Sawyer nodded soberly, his eyes darkening. Cheyenne didn't know much about their pasts, John had been a foster kid, and Sawyer had been raised by a single dad, but she'd heard enough to read between the lines and guess that addiction had devastated their lives every bit as much as it was destroying hers. I'm hopeful we're on the upswing, Cheyenne said. Even she could tell that her words lacked conviction. But mom hadn't left yet, and that was a good thing. She had to keep reminding herself of that. Sawyer gave her a half-smile, reaching for the pickles. And how are things with the truck? She recognized the subject change for what it was and mouthed a quiet thank you to him. Sawyer gave an almost imperceptible nod as Zach took up the conversation. Cheyenne's working her magic, Zach said. 
We're, what, halfway through rebuilding the engine. Yeah, about that, Cheyenne agreed, shooing away a fly buzzing near her ear. They'd made good progress in a short amount of time. We're waiting on a few parts before we can continue, but we replaced the timing belt and battery yesterday. She would have gotten more done, but Zack had suggested they grab dinner at the pier. After eating, they'd walked hand in hand along the beach for nearly an hour. He'd told her about a bad ice storm when he was eleven that had left them without power for three days, and she'd told him about the time she rode with her dad in a parade and he'd let her run the siren on his squad car. By the end of the evening, she'd felt closer to Zack than ever. Even though they hadn't worked on the truck much, she'd gone to bed happier than she could remember being in a while. It would make the loneliness she'd feel when he left in two weeks that much more acute. Soon she wouldn't even have Aspen around to keep her company. Even if Cheyenne stayed in Sapphire Cove, Aspen was getting married soon. After Zack left town, when would Cheyenne see him again? Surely he'd return to Sapphire Cove for John and Meredith's wedding. She tried to imagine running into him on the street and having the kind of stilted, awkward catch-up conversation that always resulted when unexpectedly running into an ex. The thought was physically painful. She looked over at Zack, whose brow was knit together in concern. Are you okay? He mouthed, reaching under the table to take her hand in his. Cheyenne nodded, giving his hand a reassuring squeeze. Hadn't she decided not to worry about the future and just enjoy the moment? When Zack left, she'd deal with it. Right now, she just wanted to enjoy being with him. As they ate, their conversation drifted from the truck to Meredith and John's wedding plans. Cheyenne laughed as Meredith told them, in a comically exaggerated tone, about going all bridezilla when the dress shop accidentally ordered her gown in champagne instead of white. She listened intently when John discussed the pros and cons of the various properties he was considering for his scuba shop. She really tried to be present in the moment and just enjoy the evening. But in the back of her mind, a clock was ticking. The sky had turned dusky when John finally leaned back in his chair with a groan, patting his flat stomach. That was amazing as usual, Mare, he said. Much better than the cafeteria food on base. I won't miss that when my time is up. A pall fell over the group, blanketing them in silence. Sawyer's eyes grew pained, while Zack's expression hardened, his jaw clenched in a frown. Cheyenne held her breath. She knew how much John's leaving troubled Zack, although she didn't quite understand why. Silence stretched uncomfortably across the picnic table. For the first time all evening, she heard the crash of waves from the nearby ocean, accompanied by the squawks of seagulls. Whenever a topic had come up that upset mom, she would start crying and leave the room. Sometimes it was days before she emerged from her slump. A rock lodged itself in Cheyenne's stomach. Would Zack respond similarly? The food on base isn't so bad, Zack said, his voice tense. In fact, I prefer their pizza over anything we can get by going into San Diego. But their food still isn't as good as yours, Mare, Sawyer cut in quickly, lifting his burger in appreciation. Zack's eyes flashed, making Cheyenne's stomach churn. No, of course not, Zack said. I didn't mean to insult your cooking, Mare dinner was delicious, as always. I know you didn't mean anything by it, Meredith said quickly. She looked back and forth, between the three men, biting her lip. Che, want to help me dish up that pie in the kitchen? Cheyenne jumped to her feet, knocking her knee on the underside of the picnic table. Pain zinged down her leg, but she didn't allow herself to grimace. Yeah, of course. The tension in the air was making her sick. Growing up, her parents had spent months at a time avoiding any discussion of Dad's job. Inevitably, the silence would build into an explosion that left Dad angry and Mom locked in her room for days while Cheyenne tiptoed around the house. She hurried to follow Meredith across the yard while the men's voices rose. I know you don't like it, but I am leaving soon. John's words cut off abruptly as the back door shut behind them. Meredith let out a heavy sigh, rolling her neck back and forth as though it ached. Sorry about that, she said, leaning against one of the kitchen counters. It's okay, Cheyenne said, though it felt anything but. Meredith folded her arms, making no move to dish up the pie. 
we'd better give them a minute. The three of them are closer than brothers, and this is killing them. Cheyenne bit her lip, not sure how much she should say. Zack doesn't talk about it often, but I can tell he's sad that John is leaving. Meredith nodded, blinking rapidly. I hope they believe that I didn't ask John to do this. When I agreed to marry him, I was fully prepared to be a Navy wife. Sometimes I worry that Zack and Sawyer hate me because of everything. They don't hate you, Cheyenne said quickly. She'd never sensed any animosity from Zack toward Meredith, and even though they didn't know each other well, the urge to comfort her new friend was overpowering. Meredith folded her arms tighter. They don't? No. Zack's glad you and John have found each other. Meredith sighed. But he doesn't understand why John can't be a husband and a military man. Right? Cheyenne lifted her shoulders helplessly. I honestly don't know. No, but I do. Meredith looked pensive, as though swept up in memories Cheyenne wasn't privy to. I might not have asked John to leave, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't glad. He's gone all the time, and I'm constantly worried. It's dangerous, what they do. Cheyenne leaned back against the opposite counter, feeling nauseous. She hadn't realized the Navy was so intense, had always assumed that it was more the Army or Marines on the front lines. The thought of Zack in danger. How do you do it? How do you not drive yourself insane with worry, knowing he's out there putting his life on the line every time he heads to work? Meredith behaved so differently than Cheyenne's mother. Worried, sure. But she also somehow managed to function instead of falling apart. Meredith played with a necklace that Cheyenne had never noticed before, rubbing one thumb over the pendant that was now obscured. I didn't think I could do it at first. When I realized what John does, she dropped her hand, revealing an anchor, and looked directly at Cheyenne. I almost broke up with him when he first told me. Cheyenne nodded, squeezing her hands tightly together. No one would have blamed you. After all, she was planning on breaking up with Zack. Wasn't she? They'd both agreed that this was just a fling, and neither of them was looking for a relationship. Not even John would have blamed me, Meredith agreed, her thumb caressing the anchor pendant once more. But it didn't take long to realize that I was going to worry about him whether or not we were together. In the end, I decided I'd rather be with him and worried than alone and wondering. Cheyenne squeezed her eyes shut. Maybe that was the conclusion Meredith had reached but she'd no doubt been in love with John by that point. Cheyenne and Zack were just passing the time together. They weren't in love. I'm sorry this is so hard for all of you, Cheyenne said finally. Me too. Meredith gave her a sad smile. John hoped he could talk them into leaving with him, but I told him it was a lost cause. Sawyer and Zack are both too loyal to the Navy. It's their entire life. They'll never leave willingly. Their entire life. Cheyenne curled her fingers into her palms. That was how the police department had been for her dad. She'd watched him struggle for years before finally giving in to her mom's pleas and requesting the transfer to the academy. Had either of her parents ever been truly happy together? Cheyenne had never doubted their love for each other, but it also had never seemed to be enough. We'd better get back out there. Meredith turned to the cupboard, pulling out plates. They're probably done talking by now. There's a knife in that drawer if you want to cut the pie. Outside, the men seemed back on friendly ground. Zack wasn't cold or closed off, like Cheyenne's mother would have been, and the lingering tension had completely disappeared by the time they finished eating their dessert. But Meredith's words kept running through Cheyenne's mind. Here in the vacation bubble that was Sapphire Cove, it had been easy to forget that Zack was a sailor. His job was every bit as dangerous as her father's, maybe even more. It doesn't matter, she reminded herself. But she was starting to worry that when the time came to say goodbye to Zack, she wouldn't be able to. The five of them worked together to clean up the dishes, then sat around the picnic table and played a rousing game of Monopoly while the sky grew dim. Once everyone but Sawyer was bankrupt, Cheyenne decided it was time to leave. I've got to be up early in the morning, she said regretfully as she rose. 
Thank you so much for dinner, Meredith. I had a great time tonight. You're welcome here anytime. We love having you around, Meredith said warmly, while John and Sawyer echoed the sentiment. I'll be back soon, Zack said, rising to follow Cheyenne. Outside, Zack linked his hand with Cheyenne's as they walked slowly to her convertible. I'm going to drive you home, he said. I don't like the idea of you being out so late alone. Cheyenne laughed, rifling in her purse with one hand for her keys. She didn't want to let go of Zack's hand with the other. And then you'll, what, walk back to Meredith's in the dark? He smirked. Walking is a little slow. I figured I would run. Cheyenne rolled her eyes, finally relinquishing his hand when she still couldn't find her keys. That's just silly. I don't mind. Zack took the keys from her, leaning down to give her a slow kiss that scattered her thoughts. Besides, this gives us a few more minutes to hang out. I won't argue with that, Cheyenne said. His body felt strong and warm against hers. Had she ever felt this safe? He was leaving in two weeks. She had to remember that. She snatched the keys back from him with a playful grin. Okay, you can escort me home. But I'm driving. Zack held the door open for her as she climbed in. Fine with me. I like watching you drive. It's sexy. Cheyenne laughed, waiting until he was in the car to start the engine. You're seriously going to run home? Sure. What if there's someone, I don't know, hiding in the bushes, to jump you? At that, Zack smirked. I think I can hold my own in a fight. Cheyenne's smile faded as she remembered the pinched look of worry on Meredith's face. Sure, Zack could hold his own in a fight. But the thought of him fending off blows made her stomach churn. She backed out of the driveway, the cool air making her shiver as it blew through her hair. Maybe he could fight off a thug in a physical attack. But even someone as strong as Zack would be helpless against a bullet. Her father certainly had been. Hey! Zack tugged at a strand of hair that had come loose, curling it around his finger. Where did you go just now? Nothing. It's fine. Cheyenne gripped the steering wheel tighter. Would she worry about him any less once they were no longer dating? I'm sorry about tonight, Zack said. Is that what's bothering you? I know things got a little awkward there at the end. It's okay. Cheyenne glanced over at him. I know this is really hard for all of you. Yeah. Zack dropped her lock of hair, instead resting his arm over the back of her seat as she drove. I don't know when everything got so messy. Life used to be simple, you know? Meredith is worried you guys hate her. She thinks she'll blame her for John leaving the military. No, of course not. Zack blew out a breath. I'll talk to Sawyer, and we'll both talk to Meredith. I don't want her feeling like that. It's not true. I know. Cheyenne blinked quickly, biting her lip. The brisk breeze was making her eyes water. Do you think Sawyer will take John up on his offer and stay in Sapphire Cove? Zack was silent for a long moment. She glanced over at him, but his eyes were unreadable in the darkness. No, I don't, he said finally. And I won't leave the Navy, either. Cheyenne had already known that, but the words still hit her like an alternator dropped on a foot. She gripped the steering wheel, pulling into her spot in the driveway of her shared bungalow. When she killed the engine, Zack made no move to get out of the car, instead angling to face her. She did the same. You love the Navy. Cheyenne couldn't keep the emotion from her voice. I get it. It's more than that. Zack's eyes glowed in the moonlight. John doesn't know yet, but right before leaving base, my commander pulled me into his office. He's being promoted, which means there's an opening on the squad. And he wants you to fill it. Cheyenne's throat tightened. Did commander spend more or less time on the front lines? That's great, Zack. A promotion. Another reason to stay in the military. To keep putting his life on the line. It's not a guarantee 
but his recommendation is an enormous foot in the door. Zack leaned forward, his expression earnest. I don't want to lose my shot at that. No, of course not. This is a big opportunity for you. Congratulations. Thanks. I've wanted to take this step for a long time. Why wouldn't he? Zack was a sailor. It made sense that he'd want to move up the ranks. Cheyenne wasn't his girlfriend, entitled to an opinion. She needed to be supportive. So this promotion. You'll be like the captain of a ship or something? Cheyenne shrugged apologetically, feeling stupid. Sorry, I'm not that familiar with the Navy, and you haven't told me much about the specifics of your job. Zack took her hand in both of his, rubbing a thumb along the back of it. No, I haven't. We don't usually talk much about what we do. Oh. Cheyenne swallowed back her disappointment. He was shutting her out, but that was okay. Flings didn't need more than surface-level answers. Yeah. Of course. At first I didn't tell you because we were strangers, and then everything happened between us so quickly. You don't have to tell me anything that will make you uncomfortable. Cheyenne tried to keep the edge from her voice. He owed her nothing. That's the thing. For the first time, I actually want to tell someone. Cheyenne's heart skipped a beat, then started pounding. Her hands suddenly felt sweaty, and her ears buzzed. Oh. Yeah. He took a deep breath, looking her straight in the eyes. His grip on her hand tightened. If I get the promotion, I won't be the captain of a ship or anything like that. My squad doesn't spend that much time aboard, especially for Navy men. It was hard to breathe. Cheyenne tried to focus on the feel of her hand in Zack's, but the gravity in his eyes had her panicking. You don't? No. Sawyer, John, and I are special ops, Che. We're not just in the Navy. We're Navy SEALs. Chapter 19 Zack watched as Cheyenne's eyes widened, her eyebrows nearly touching her hairline. Heard the way she sucked in air, like a new diver, hyperventilating around his regulator. What if she decided this was too much and called it quits early? Zack hadn't realized just how much he was counting on the next two weeks with her until he faced the reality of losing them. Her hand had turned ice cold and clammy in his. Someone, Aspen, probably had left the light on over the front door. It mingled with the moonlight and cast weakly across the driveway, obscuring Cheyenne's face in shadows and making her expression hard to read. Che? He rubbed his thumb along the back of her knuckles, hard in his throat. How are you doing? Fine. She nodded, the motion too quick, then kept nodding like a possessed bobblehead doll. He'd seen similar shell-shocked expressions in sailors after the explosion stopped. A seal. Special ops. Wow. That's, huh. Okay. Was she mad? Surprised? I know this is a lot to spring on you. Well, it's not like you owe me an explanation. He flinched like she'd just pulled the trigger on a gun. No, but I want to give you one. She tucked her hand from his, creating craters in his heart with the movement. The breeze had turned chilly, and the faint glow from the porch light highlighted the goosebumps on her arms. Cheyenne was pulling away from him, and it felt like losing a limb. I know special ops stuff is kind of hush-hush, she said, not meeting his eyes. And we've only known each other a week. It's not like you lied to me. You just omitted part of the truth. A week that had felt like a lifetime. His soul connected to Cheyenne's in a way he'd never experienced with a woman, and he was just now beginning to realize how much it would hurt when he had to let her go. What had he filled his evenings with, before hanging out with Cheyenne in the garage? He barely held back a snort. What evenings? When not on base, his days were long, often 12 or 14 hours, and more if they were on an op. He had time for work, sleep, and little else. It was why he'd neglected the maintenance on his truck so badly. Once this leave was over, there wouldn't be room in his life for Cheyenne, even if he wanted there to be. He swallowed, trying to clear the catch in his throat. 
shunning relationships had been easy when there was no one he wanted to share his life with. Now it was much harder. Meeting Cheyenne had made it harder. Zack had always been grateful to the Navy for giving him a purpose after his parents' deaths. But as he watched Cheyenne build up walls thicker than any terrorist compound, for the first time he wished he'd chosen a different path. Che? Zack prodded. Her shoulders nearly touched her ears as she seemed to hunch into herself, arms still tightly folded. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Everything about you screams, special ops, same with Sawyer and John. The country is lucky to have you three on our side. You're some of the best men I've ever met. He sensed an unspoken, but, in that sentence. Zack tried to breathe evenly, to keep his expression neutral. Was she going to tell him this was too much, and she didn't want to see him again? If that's what she wanted, he'd respect her wishes. Wouldn't try to convince her otherwise. But the thought of saying goodbye made his entire body ache with tension. Should I not have told you, he asked finally. No, her eyes flicked to his, then away again. I'm glad you did. Maybe she was, but Zack was second-guessing his decision. I felt like you deserved to know, but I wasn't sure how to bring it up delicately. She laughed, but it sounded off. Yeah, I guess there's no easy way to say hey, by the way, I have an incredibly dangerous job as one of the country's top protectors. A gnat buzzed in front of his face, and he batted it away, impatiently. No, not really. Silence stretched between them, the only sound crickets in the nearby trees. Cheyenne wouldn't look at him. Talk to me, Zack finally begged. I know this is a lot, but don't shut me out. What is there to say? She sighed, rubbing her forehead with one shaky hand. I still like you, Zack. The words flooded him with relief. Being a seal is part of what makes you, well, you, Cheyenne continued. She finally looked at him, her eyes hooded. I mean, this is surprising information, but I guess it doesn't change anything. We both know this is just a summer fling, so what you do for a living doesn't matter any more than my job does. Zack's eyes smarted. She was right, of course. But it didn't make it any easier to hear. Two weeks, he reminded himself. She wasn't kicking him to the curb yet, and he still had two weeks with her. He would make them count. Zack forced himself to give her a half-smile and made his tone teasing. I'd argue that your job matters, quite a bit, at least to my truck. She laughed, but there was no joy in the sound. True. Silence fell between them again. Her eyes were shuttered, face carefully blank, those arms wrapped so tightly around her waist they reminded him of a tourniquet. She said it didn't matter. But her body language clearly said that it did. I should go to bed, Cheyenne said. I'll drive you back to Meredith's first so that you don't have to walk. He wanted to continue talking until he was certain that Cheyenne was okay, but she clearly needed time. No, I'll run. Really, I don't mind. All right, if you're sure. He wasn't sure of anything right now. Can I walk you to the door first? He held his breath, wondering if she'd refuse. She'd said this changed nothing between them, but did she mean it? Finally, she nodded. They walked side by side to the front door, not touching. Zack had no idea how to cross the canyon between them. Could he even build a bridge? Maybe his job was the knife that had forever cut all the ropes. Thanks for inviting me tonight. Cheyenne unlocked her front door, not looking at him. I had a great time. Thanks for coming. He wanted to pull her into his arms for a goodnight kiss, but she made no move toward him and he wasn't about to force the issue. See you tomorrow? She nodded. Yeah. Zack shoved his hands in his pockets so he wouldn't be tempted to hold her. I'll meet you at the garage, then. Same time as usual. Another nod, her eyes still avoiding his. Night. The door shut between them like a barricade. He didn't know how to cross it. Should he build a ladder? Tunnel under it? Or should he accept what he'd always known, that the career he loved was incompatible with a relationship? 
Zack pressed a fist to his mouth as he turned and walked away. He broke into a jog, his chest aching in a way that reminded him of the dull throb he'd dealt with for weeks after being knifed in the side. He'd dropped a pretty big bombshell on Cheyenne tonight. She'd shared enough about her father's profession for him to guess why his job made her leery. Maybe she just needed space, and everything would be back to normal tomorrow. Two weeks, he reminded himself. You only get her for two more weeks. It was silly to worry so much about something so fleeting. Zack arrived back at the bungalow to find Sawyer and John sitting at Meredith's small kitchen table, the blueprint schematics of a building spread out before them. Zack peered over their shoulders, his anxiety instantly spiking. Had they been called back for a mission? But no, he would have gotten a text or phone call for that. What are you doing? he asked. John didn't even bother to glance up. Looking at an old clothing store on the beach, to see if I could retrofit it for the scuba shop. Picked up the plans from City Hall earlier. Zack grunted, his mouth suddenly tasting bitter. Oh. Why did everything have to change? He wanted to rewind time to a year ago, when everything had been easy. They'd all been single then, worried about nothing more than the next stop. Sawyer did look up, one eyebrow raised. You were gone a while. Everything okay? Zack sank into a chair, exhaustion enfolding him like a blanket. He was bone-tired, like he'd just run fifteen miles uphill, with a full pack. John looked up from the building plans, a furrow between his brows. Wait, you don't look so good. Did something happen with Cheyenne? Zack kicked off his shoes with a growl. Yeah. Like a freaking idiot. I told her I'm a seal. Ah. Uh. John's voice was thick with empathy, and somehow that made everything worse. More real. Maybe he shouldn't have told Cheyenne. What if he'd just ruined their two weeks together by giving her information she didn't need to have? But something about tonight, about seeing Cheyenne fit in so perfectly with his friends, had made him want to share that part of himself with her. No one but John and Sawyer knew all of Zack, and he wanted that to change. He wanted Cheyenne to really know him. But now that she did, would his career be too much for her to handle? How did she take it? Sawyer asked. I wish I knew. Zack ran his hand through his hair with a sigh. She didn't get mad at me for not telling her sooner, or yell, or anything like that. That's good. John slapped a hand on Zack's shoulder. She also got really quiet and kind of shut down, Zack said morosely. Meredith did that when I told her, too. John gave him a sympathetic smile. Don't worry. Cheyenne seems like a strong woman. She'll come around. Zack pushed away from the table, suddenly filled with anger. What does it matter either way? We're leaving in a couple of weeks, and that's if we're lucky. When was the last time we got to enjoy an entire leave before being called up? I give it another week, tops. Sawyer's eyes narrowed, and he folded his arms. If we're leaving so soon, then why did you tell her? I don't know. Zack threw his hands up in the air. Because I'm an idiot, I guess. I just felt like she should know. You dated that girl in Los Angeles for five months and never told her. What was her name? John snapped his fingers. Cheryl. No, it was Sherry, Sawyer corrected. Her name was Sharon. Zack rubbed a hand over his face. Wow, I'd forgotten about her. I mean, we weren't that serious. That's my point, Sawyer said. You dated Sharon for five months and never once considered telling her you were a seal. But you told Cheyenne after only a week. Zack was too tired for these conversational gymnastics. All he wanted was to brush his teeth and go to sleep. I don't know what you're getting at. I do. John looked back and forth between them. Cheyenne is important to you. That's why you told her when you have never told anyone else you've dated. Drop it. Seriously, guys. Zack rubbed his eyes, the truth of their words making him queasy. I'm not in the mood. Cheyenne was important to him. But did that change anything? 
fine, we'll let it go, Sawyer said, and John grunted in agreement. If you don't want to talk about Cheyenne, then help me figure out if this building is a possibility, John said, tapping the building schematics. Sawyer nodded, leaning over the blueprint once more. We're trying to decide if we could take down a few of the walls in the back to make room for the scuba gear. Yeah, but this wall right here is load-bearing, and it's creating serious design issues. Putting in a beam would be expensive, Zach said. Yeah, and I'm not sure that I'll have the cash, John agreed. We keep coming up blank for any workarounds, Sawyer said. Got any ideas? Zach leaned forward, dutifully studying the plans. But his mind was still back in Cheyenne's convertible, wondering if he'd done the right thing by telling her who he really was. Chapter 20 Cheyenne placed the last bottle of motor oil on the bottom shelf, then rose with a grunt. She rested her hands on her hips and twisted, groaning in relief when her back let out a satisfying crack. For three mind-numbing hours, she'd been cleaning, straightening, and restocking the few shelves worth of car maintenance basics that Doug kept on hand for the locals. It had been an unusually slow Thursday, leaving way too much time for Cheyenne to worry over Zach's revelation last night. Doug had even sent Mike home an hour ago since they only had one car in the garage and the simple brake pad replacement was a one-man job. She could hear Doug out there, the faint click of a socket wrench, just audible beneath the pulse of 80s rock music. What was Zach doing right now? Cheyenne grabbed the box cutter off the shelf to break down the last few cardboard boxes, trying not to imagine him holding an assault rifle. Not that he'd be doing that in Sapphire Cove. At least, she didn't think so. When it came right down to it, she had no idea what Navy SEALs did while on leave when they weren't kissing their summer fling or fixing their truck. It wasn't that she hadn't asked Zach about what he did while she was at work. They always discussed the highlights of their day when working in the garage, and he usually talked about how he'd looked at properties with John or hung out around town with Sawyer. But what was he leaving out? Maybe he wasn't on leave at all, and this was some super secret mission. Or was she mixing up Navy SEALs with secret agents? Everything she knew about the elite special ops group came from Hollywood, and who knew how accurate that was? Her grip on the box slipped, the cutter just nicking one finger. Cheyenne let out a curse, sucking on the cut. Luckily, it was shallow and had only drawn a few drops of blood, barely more than a paper cut. Maybe it was a good thing there hadn't been many customers today. She didn't trust herself to hold it together around other people, not when her emotions were running so wild. She finished collapsing the box and dropped it on top of the small stack as she continued to process the bombshell Zack had dropped on her last night. Whatever Hollywood had told her about Navy SEALs, she knew one thing for certain. Zack put his life on the line every single day. He woke up, went to work, and stared down danger. Hadn't it been a SEAL team who assassinated the world's most wanted and notorious terrorist a few years ago? If her dad's profession as a police officer had been scary, well, this was downright terrifying. Maybe she'd been too hard on mom. Cheyenne put a hand to her forehead, taking a shaky breath. She was unraveling after a day. Mom had been weighed down with this worry for decades. Cheyenne knew she had no right to feel this way. Zack was her summer fling, not her boyfriend. But no matter how many times she told herself two weeks, then he's leaving, she couldn't get him out of her mind. Yes, Zack was a seal. But he was also the guy who'd held her while she cried. Who'd brought her ice cream and asked if she was okay? He was the man whose face lit up when he told her about his childhood in Kentucky, and whose soul understood the pain of losing a parent. He was the first boy who'd let her teach him about cars instead of being threatened by her expertise, and she'd been happier spending time with him than she'd been in years. The bell above the front door jingled. Cheyenne took a deep breath and blinked quickly, trying to compose her expression, then poked her head out of the aisle. Right now, she was eager for a customer who might distract her from her spiraling worries. A blonde woman stood just inside the door. She was dressed casually in jeans and a t-shirt, her hair pulled back in a ponytail and a camera bag slung over one shoulder. Meredith, Cheyenne said in surprise. Oh good, you're here. Meredith pulled off a pair of oversized sunglasses, resting them on top of her head. 
I figured you would be. Uh, yeah. Cheyenne folded her arms, her stomach suddenly hollow with uncertainty. Is everything okay? In a manner of speaking. Meredith gave her an apologetic smile. I want to talk to you about Zack. Ah. Uh. Cheyenne turned back to the shelf, pretending to straighten a row of air fresheners she'd just hung up that afternoon. How much did Meredith know? I'm listening. Meredith scanned the small space, one hand gripping the strap of her camera bag. It might be better to wait until we can go somewhere private. Cheyenne bit her lip, focusing intently on the small row of keychains she was now rearranging. Her entire body felt hot, and she couldn't make herself look at Meredith. He told you, didn't he? About our conversation last night. Yes. Cheyenne paused, finally giving Meredith her full attention. She wasn't going to beat around the bush then. Please don't be mad at him, Meredith continued. He was upset, and Sawyer and John forced it out of him. Cheyenne folded her arms, feeling her emotions being drawn way too close to the surface. What was Zack upset about? She'd done her best to play it cool and had told him she wanted to keep seeing each other until he went back to Coronado. But Zack wasn't stupid, and she knew he'd noticed how the news had rattled her. We're alone, Cheyenne said finally. If they had to have this conversation, and Meredith seemed determined, she'd rather get it over with. Well, Doug's in the garage, but he can't hear anything over the stereo and tools. It's been a slow day, and no customers have been by for a couple of hours. We might as well talk now. Meredith's shoulders relaxed, and she nodded. I just wanted to check in on you. How are you doing? Cheyenne dropped her arms to her sides in surprise. She'd been prepared for an argument, to defend her reticence. How am I doing? Well, yeah. Meredith shifted from foot to foot, looking uncomfortable. I know I was pretty freaked out when John told me the truth. We'd been dating for two or three months, but it had mostly been long distance. I had no idea what to do with the information. I was shocked when Zach told me. The honesty slipped out, maybe because Cheyenne was still stunned that Meredith had come to console, not chastise. Right? Meredith sank down into one of the worn chairs, dropping her photography bag to the ground beside her. Cheyenne took a seat too, figuring there was no harm in taking a break for a few minutes. It's a lot to take in. Absolutely, Meredith agreed, seeming more at ease now. When John told me, I had to realign my expectations for the future. I'd started imagining our lives together, and suddenly the picture was all wrong. It sucked. Cheyenne clasped her hands tightly together, focusing on a freckle on one thumb. I can only imagine how hard it was for you. For me, it's different. Zach and I aren't in a relationship, not like you are with John. We both know this isn't going anywhere. We're just... Enjoying each other's company. Meredith smirked. I'm not getting in the middle of that one, how you define the relationship is between you and Zach. But I wanted to make sure that you know I'm here to talk if you ever need to. Dating a seal isn't easy, and us girls have to stick together. Cheyenne swallowed, sadness unexpectedly stealing over her. She had a feeling that she and Meredith could be good friends, maybe as good of friends as she was with Aspen. But Cheyenne knew she wouldn't be in town long enough to find out. I thought you were here to tell me to leave him alone, Cheyenne said. Meredith's eyes widened. Why would I do that? Because Zach deserved more than a broken girl who wasn't capable of a real relationship. Cheyenne didn't say that aloud, though. I don't know. Because it's so temporary, I guess. Meredith held up her hands. Like I said, that's nobody's business, but yours and Zach's. All I know is that he's seemed a lot happier since meeting you. I think you bring out the best in him. Cheyenne curled her fingers into her palms. She'd been happier since meeting Zach, too. Why did that suddenly feel like a bad thing? Thanks. It means a lot to me that you came down here to talk. I hope you know how much I appreciate it. I like you, Cheyenne, Meredith said, blunt once again. 
I hope things work out between you and Zach, but I'm here for you either way. Thanks, Cheyenne repeated, her throat clogged with emotion. Meredith nodded, rising. I should let you get back to work, and I need to get home before the guys realize what I'm doing. Cheyenne rose as well, surprised at how disappointed she was at Meredith's parting. Zach doesn't know you're here? No, and neither does John or Sawyer. Not that it's a secret or anything, but they probably wouldn't approve of me interfering. Meredith made air quotes on the last word, then rolled her eyes. You still have my number, right? I do. She grabbed her camera bag, hiking it on her shoulder. Good. Use it if you need to. I'm serious. I will, Cheyenne said, and it felt like a promise instead of the lie she intended it to be. Same goes for you. After Meredith left, Cheyenne's mind stayed on their conversation. Maybe she would call Meredith sometime. Cheyenne loved Aspen, but she also worried that she took advantage of their friendship by constantly burdening Aspen with her family drama. Having another friend, someone like Meredith, would be nice. Someone to text funny memes to and go out to dinner with occasionally. Even if Cheyenne kept dating Zach, which she definitely wasn't considering, she wouldn't be able to do those things with him that often. Once mom completed the treatment program, a fresh start could be good for both of them. They could sell the house in Portland and probably walk away with enough equity to buy a cute little bungalow on the beach here in Sapphire Cove. It wouldn't have any memories of dad, which might make things easier on mom. Cheyenne straightened the stack of invoices in the outbox, letting her mind wander. She could convince Doug to give her more responsibilities while she saved up for her own garage. Surely completing Zach's truck would prove to him she was a capable mechanic. Mom could paint, like she used to when Cheyenne was younger. Maybe get a job as a waitress at one of the restaurants in town. Things might be hard in the winter months when the tourists mostly stayed home, but it would be easy to pick up a part-time job in the summer if they needed more cash. Once Cheyenne had her garage, people would come to wherever she was, Portland, Sapphire Cove, San Diego. There weren't a lot of garages that did full car restoration, and owners were used to transporting their projects to wherever the mechanic was. She placed the loose pens on the counter, back in the cup. It would be nice to stay close to Aspen. Meredith, too. And when Zach came to visit. Cheyenne swallowed, forcing that thought out of her mind. It was a waste of time to imagine a life in Sapphire Cove. Mom would never agree to leave Portland, and the job opportunities for a female mechanic were a lot more plentiful there, anyway. The door from the garage pushed open, startling Cheyenne back to the present. Doug walked through, wiping his hands on a greasy rag. Are you okay if I leave a few minutes early? he asked. Sure, Cheyenne said. If anyone shows up, I'll have them leave the car overnight or come back tomorrow. Doug grunted, which she supposed counted as agreement, then left with a wave. Cheyenne had just finished counting the money in the cash register when her phone rang. The sight of Dr. Robin's number instantly turned her insides to ice. When had she ever called with good news? What would it would be today, mom refusing to go to therapy? Staying in her room instead of attending group? Not taking her medications? Cheyenne cleared her throat, bracing herself for whatever was coming. Hello? Hi, Cheyenne. Dr. Robin's tone was graver than Cheyenne had ever heard it, making her stomach clench. I'm calling to inform you that your mother has voluntarily left the program, against my recommendation. No sugarcoating it. No beating around the bush. Just the straight, honest truth, a punch right to the gut. Cheyenne sagged against the counter, her heart pounding furiously in her chest. What do you mean, she left? Just that, Dr. Robbins said. I had the day off, so I only know what the staff told me. Which is? Cheyenne demanded. Left the program. She was going to be sick. After group therapy this afternoon, she went to the front desk and signed herself out, Dr. Robbins said. She'd already packed her bags, without the knowledge of the center's staff. The front desk clerk said she called someone on the phone and left in an unfamiliar silver car. A silver car. 
Mom didn't have many friends, and Cheyenne couldn't think of anyone with a vehicle matching that description. Maybe she'd called a rideshare or something? How was she supposed to track that information down? Do you know where she went? Cheyenne asked, clutching the phone. No. I'm sorry. How could you let her leave? Cheyenne demanded. You know the answer to that. Dr. Robin's voice was that smooth, gentle lilt that Cheyenne hated so much. She was here voluntarily, and the therapist who ran the group session said she exhibited no signs of suicidal thoughts or emotional distress. Since she wasn't deemed a threat to herself or anyone else, they had no choice but to let her go. Cheyenne laughed, running a hand roughly through her hair. No signs of distress? She was nothing but distressed when I talked to her last. How is that possible? It's more common that you'd think. Deciding to leave is a relief to many patients. Dr. Robbins was quiet for a moment. Do you have any idea where she might have gone? Cheyenne racked her brain, coming up blank. No. Dr. Robbins was silent, and Cheyenne felt the censure in that quiet. How could she not know where her own mother was? I'm so sorry, Dr. Robbins said finally. When you speak to her, please encourage her to return to the center in the future. You know we can't hold her spot, but the waiting list is only about two weeks long right now. Cheyenne swallowed back bile. She knew the center couldn't legally prevent anyone from leaving, but she was still angry with Dr. Robbins for not being there, for not talking her mom into staying, for not giving Cheyenne a different outcome. She was mad at herself for all the same reasons. Why hadn't mom called? I know this isn't the outcome either of us wanted, but you did everything you could, Dr. Robbins continued. Cheyenne clenched her free hand into a fist and pressed it against her stomach. Most addicts go to rehab multiple times before finally moving into recovery. When she's ready to try again, we're here for both of you. What Dr. Robbins meant was that the center was ready to take Cheyenne's hard-earned money. She squeezed her eyes tightly shut. Rehab had been her Hail Mary pass, and she'd barely managed to scrape together the funds. How would she possibly come up with enough money for a second shot? I'm so sorry, Cheyenne, Dr. Robbins said. I hope to see your mother here again soon. Cheyenne couldn't even say goodbye. If she opened her mouth, nothing but a torrent of hateful words would emerge. So she hung up without a word, forcing back the sobs. There would be time later to cry. Right now, she had to find mom. She fumbled to pull up mom's number in her contacts list. It went straight to voicemail without ringing. The center didn't allow residents to have cell phones on their person, but it would have been given back to her when she checked out. Why hadn't she thought to ask Dr. Robbins how long ago mom had left? Cheyenne drummed her fingers on the counter, trying to think. She had to slow down and stop reacting. Where would mom go? Her immediate thought was back to Portland. Before rehab, mom had spent most of her time at home, in bed, with the curtains closed. But why hadn't she called Cheyenne first? Asked her to pick her up, even? Cheyenne dug the heels of her hands into her eyes, pressing until she saw stars on the backs of her eyelids. She knew why mom hadn't called her, because Cheyenne had made it abundantly clear that she wanted mom to stay in Harbor Bay. Okay, so she hadn't called Cheyenne. But that didn't mean she wasn't on her way home right now. Mom's first thought was probably her next hit. Cheyenne had never figured out how exactly Mom got her drugs, but she knew that Mom had her wallet with her, her bank card and credit cards. So would Mom go looking for her supplier, or would she head home and hope to find some secret stash of drugs that Cheyenne had missed? What if she overdosed? Cheyenne dialed Mom's number again. Voicemail. She dialed again, and again, and again, alternating between her mom's cell phone and the home's landline, but with the same results. Hi, you've reached Rayanne Miller. Cheyenne threw the phone across the room with an animal like yell. It crashed against the floor just as the front door opened. Zach's mouth popped into an O as he stared at the shattered phone. Cheyenne stared as well, her chest heaving. Stupid, stupid, stupid. 
How was she supposed to find mom without a phone? I'm sorry, Cheyenne gasped. Zach was across the room in seconds. He easily hopped over the counter, and she sank into his warm embrace, clinging to his shirt. She left, Cheyenne said, her voice choked. The treatment program. I have no idea why, or where she went, or anything. Zach tightened his grip on her, and it felt like he was somehow holding her together. She isn't answering her phone? No. Straight to voicemail. I got frustrated and, well, you saw. Cheyenne pushed away from him, searching for her purse. She was too worried to feel embarrassed at her display of anger. I need to drive to Portland. Home is the only place I can think that she'd go. You're not going by yourself. Zach reached behind her, grabbing the purse she'd been searching for. I'll drive you there. Cheyenne swallowed back her argument. She didn't trust herself behind a wheel right now. If Zach wanted to help, she would let him. Are you sure? Absolutely. Okay. She took a shuddering breath. Thank you. Don't worry, Che. We'll find her. I promise. Zach pulled her close, pressing a kiss to her forehead. I'm a seal, remember? Finding people is sort of my specialty. Cheyenne nodded, blinking back tears. Just a few hours ago, she'd been panicking over his career. Now she was grateful for it. She took her purse from him, fumbling for the keys. I'm not sure how much of a head start she has on us, Cheyenne said, dropping the keys in his hands. Let's go. Chapter 21 Zack gripped the steering wheel of Cheyenne's convertible as tightly as he'd ever gripped his gun. Most of the nearly three-hour drive had passed in silence, but he could see the skyline of Portland in the distance now and figured they'd be to Cheyenne's childhood home in less than an hour. He darted a glance over to where she sat, hunched in the passenger seat. She stared out the window at the car zipping past on the freeway, arms tightly folded and her shattered cell phone clutched in one hand. It didn't work, had refused to turn on when she tried back at the auto shop, but she'd brought it with them, anyway. He focused again on the road, pressing the gas pedal a little harder. They'd made good time, but had no idea how much of a head start her mother had. Zack had given Cheyenne space during the drive, but now it was time to form an action plan. If your mom isn't at the house, where should we check next, he asked. I don't know. Cheyenne's words were listless and flat. It reminded him of the way seals sometimes sounded in the weeks after surviving a tough mission. She doesn't go anywhere. Zack ran a hand through his hair. He'd been coming up with possibilities to suggest the entire drive. What about the grocery store? Unlikely. I do all the shopping. Sometimes she'll order stuff online and have it delivered if she doesn't want to wait. Zack grunted. Their conversations about Cheyenne's mother had mostly centered on Cheyenne's childhood. Of course, he'd known her mom struggled with depression and anxiety, in addition to the prescription drug abuse, but he hadn't realized it was so bad. He quickly tried to think of the next most likely location. What about a friend's house? Cheyenne glanced over at him, her brows scrunched together in confusion. What friends? Zack rubbed a hand over his jaw, feeling sick. She doesn't have anyone she calls? Maybe someone she goes to the movies or dinner with on the weekends? No, Cheyenne turned back to the window. When I was a kid, she'd take me to the park sometimes and chat with the other moms. But that was years ago. No friends. He'd known Cheyenne was being crushed under the weight of caring for her mother, but hadn't quite appreciated that she really was all her mom had. That burden, that feeling of responsibility, must be suffocating. Zack had never experienced that. His parents had died when he was still a child, and he'd never had to care for them. He signaled to pass a minivan driving under the speed limit. It gave him a few precious seconds to think. Okay. What about a favorite coffee house? he asked. She doesn't drink coffee. Cheyenne's voice was almost a monotone. Or tea. Or anything but water, really. Sometimes I'll convince her to go out to dinner with me, 
but she doesn't go to restaurants or cafes on her own. Come on, Che. Zack tried to make his voice upbeat, but he had a sinking feeling about this mission, and his gut was rarely wrong. If she's not at home, where can we look next? If we figure that out now, we'll save time later. I don't know. She ran a hand through her hair, sitting up straighter. Maybe the bookstore? There's one a mile, or so, from the house. About a year ago, I came over for an unplanned visit and she was gone. When I called her, she was there buying a cookbook. Okay, that's something. Zach tried to hide his worry. It concerned him that she had to go back an entire year in her memory for any potential places her mom might have gone. She likes to bake, right? She did when I was a kid, but she hasn't spent much time in the kitchen since, Cheyenne cut off abruptly, her voice raspy with pain. Anyway, I don't think she ever made anything out of the cookbook she bought. Zack ate to comfort Cheyenne. To say the words that would make this all better. It's hard to lose someone you love, he said quietly. Everyone handles their grief differently. Yeah. Cheyenne's voice turned hard. I just wish she wouldn't have handled hers by self-medicating, leaving me to deal with everything alone. The pain behind her words made his heart ache, but he didn't know how to fix it. Cheyenne pointed at a sign. Our exit's in five miles. As he followed Cheyenne's directions, Zack considered how she'd lost both her parents too, in a way. Sure, Cheyenne had only buried one of them. But this somehow seemed worse. There had been no funeral for her mother. No closure. Instead, she lived every day with a mom who was physically present, but emotionally unavailable. Their roles had flipped, forcing Cheyenne to become the caretaker. Zack blinked back his emotions. He missed his own mother fiercely and clung to his memories of the vibrant woman she'd been. What if all of that had been erased by an addiction? Cheyenne's childhood home was in an older neighborhood, not far from the downtown area. The homes were set far back from the road, with lush green front lawns and mature trees. Garbage cans stood next to mailboxes, and at the end of the street, a green truck emptied the last of the cans before turning the corner. Garbage day. It felt wrong that something so mundane could happen when Cheyenne was in such distress. Turn left up there, Cheyenne said, pointing. It's at the end of the cul-de-sac. It was just the kind of neighborhood Zack would expect a police officer to live in with his family, quiet and respectable. The type of neighborhood you wouldn't expect to find a drug addict in. Zack drove slowly, mindful of any children who might be playing outside. Which house is it? The one with no trees in the front yard, Cheyenne said, pointing. Zack nodding, hiding his surprise. Cheyenne's yard was every bit as well-maintained as the others on the street. With no one home, Zack had assumed it would have an air of neglect about it. But he should have known better. Cheyenne would never let that happen. There were fresh lines in the grass from a lawn mower, and while the flower beds were sparsely decorated, they were also free of weeds. Zack was certain Cheyenne and not her mom was paying for the maintenance. How had she afforded it on top of everything else? The home was a squat rambler, with brown brick and a carport. An older-style dark blue Toyota Camry was parked there, but he couldn't tell by looking at it if it had recently been driven. If they didn't find Cheyenne's mom inside, Zack would go and feel the engine to see if it was warm. The curtains on the front windows were all drawn tight, and junk mail flyers hung off the front door handle. A detached garage peeked through the trees, Cheyenne's garage that he'd heard so much about and a weathered wood fence surrounded the property. He could easily imagine a younger Cheyenne here, grease smudged on one cheek and her dark hair in pigtails as she followed her dad around the yard. This was the place where Cheyenne had grown up. Graduated high school. Found her mom unconscious on the kitchen floor. What memory would she be forced to attach to this home today? Cheyenne was out of the car and sprinting across the green grass before Zach had pulled fully to a stop along the curb. He quickly turned off the ignition and ran after her. Keys, please, she demanded, holding out her hand. Zack dropped them into her palm. There were three flyers on the front door handle, all of them advertisements. 
He could see now that the paint on the door trim was peeling, and there was a large crack in the concrete on the front porch. Do you see any signs that she's been here? Anything out of place? To him, the house looked deserted. He would have liked to do full reconnaissance of the premises before entering the home, but knew Cheyenne wouldn't allow it. She fumbled with the keys, letting out a curse. Not really. That's her car in the driveway, but that means nothing. It's been there since she entered rehab. Cheyenne finally jammed the correct key into the lock and thrust the door open. Mom, she called into the emptiness, looking around frantically. Are you here? Zack barely had time to register faded wallpaper and a brown leather sectional in the front room before he followed Cheyenne through a formal dining room with solid-looking darkwood furniture, no mom there either, and to the dated kitchen. Where the rest of the house had been immaculate, the kitchen looked like an unsupervised toddler had raided it. Nearly every cabinet door hung open, and the kitchen floor was littered with items. Canned vegetables mixed in with pots and pans, and what looked like an entire drawer of silverware had been dumped out. Cheyenne let out an expletive, kicking aside a frying pan. She was looking for pills. Do you think she found them? Zack asked, noting which cabinets were empty and which appeared more undisturbed. No idea. I threw away everything I could find the last time she was in the hospital, but I probably don't know all of her hiding places. Zack left Cheyenne in the kitchen and backtracked to the dining room. It didn't take long to determine there weren't any clues there. A china hutch in one corner looked undisturbed, and all the chairs were uniformly pushed underneath the empty table. Where would she go? Zack asked as he moved back into the living room. He opened the drawer of an end table, finding only the television remote and a dog-eared phone book that looked at least twenty years out of date. If she found pills, or if she didn't. I don't know. Cheyenne wandered into the living room, then down the hallway. Mom? Mom, are you still here? Zack held his breath. All that answered her call was an eerie silence. Not that he'd expected anything else. She's probably left. She'd answer me if she could. Cheyenne's voice was breathy now, as though she was struggling to force air through her lungs. Let's keep looking, Zack said. She might have left a note. He hoped she'd left a note. That Cheyenne was right and she was gone and not somewhere in the house, unable to answer. They moved to the hallway next. It was long and narrow, with framed photos hung on the walls in between open doors, a young couple he guessed were her parents in wedding attire, that same couple a few years later holding a baby, and a toothless grade school photo of a girl that could only be Cheyenne. In any other circumstances, Zack would have stopped to examine the photos. Soaked up these tidbits of her past. Cheyenne poked her head into the first room they passed. Mom? It was a bathroom, all the drawers hanging open. Zack pulled back the shower curtain but found nothing. The craft room appeared mostly untouched, as did the bedroom, which he assumed belonged to Cheyenne, the walls were covered with posters of vintage cars and cardboard moving boxes were stacked in front of the closed bifold closet doors. Cheyenne seemed to slow as they cleared each room, and he could feel her tension mounting. Soon, they only had one door left. It stood partially open at the end of the hallway. I'm almost positive I left it open when I was here last, Cheyenne said, her voice tight. Zack took a step forward, nudging her aside. He tensed, peering around the edge of the door before pushing it open. A queen-sized bed filled most of the room, the blankets and pillows undisturbed. An antique wooden dresser held a flag folded into a triangle and preserved in a display case. Beside it was a framed photograph of a man in uniform. Cheyenne's shoulders slumped as she let out a sigh. She's not here. No, but it looks like she was. Zack's heartbeat slowed, the adrenaline of the moment wearing off. He took in the open dresser drawers and the clothes strewn about the floor. Where would she go? Cheyenne put a hand to her forehead, looking around the room as though it would give the answers. I mean, the car's still in the driveway. I saw her keys, hanging on the hook, by the back door. We can try the bookstore, Zack said, stepping around the bed. That's when he saw a pair of feet just visible through a door, he assumed, led to a bathroom. 
Zack strode quickly toward the woman as the world seemed to still. Cheyenne, call 911, he said, keeping his voice calm. She inhaled sharply, her fear almost palpable. But Zack couldn't focus on that now. He pushed it aside, zeroing in on his current objective. Slowly, he pushed open the door. There, lying on her side, was an unconscious woman with the same dark hair and tanned skin as Cheyenne. Mom. Cheyenne dropped to the floor beside the woman, her tone frantic. Zack yanked his cell phone from his pocket. Make the call. Cheyenne fumbled, nearly dropping the phone. Zack bent down, but no puff of air reached his cheek. He felt the woman's wrist. Nothing. His mind cleared as his training kicked in, lending him the focus he so desperately needed. He rolled the woman onto her back and checked her airway, then began chest compressions. In his head, he counted. One, two, three, four. She couldn't be dead. Hello? Cheyenne said into the phone, her voice shrill with panic. Ten, eleven, twelve. Zack kept his arms locked, shoulders directly above his hands. Yes, I need an ambulance, Cheyenne continued. I think my mom might be dead. She's probably overdosed again on drugs. Chapter 22 The next few minutes were a blur. Zack went into battle mode, blocking out the sounds of Cheyenne's distress and focusing on keeping her mother's heart beating. He'd done this before. Could almost smell the coppery scent of blood and hear the distant sounds of gunfire. He forced himself to focus. Now was not the time to get emotional. Sirens blared in the distance, growing louder with each passing second. He heard the stumble of feet down the hallway as Cheyenne raced to let them in. Up, down, up, down. He tried to keep the compression steady and even. Thirty compressions to every two rescue breaths. Footsteps clomped into the room, heavy and urgent. Someone crouched down beside him. We'll take over from here, sir, the woman said. Zack forced himself to take a step back, breathing heavily, and the paramedic immediately took over chest compressions. He didn't know if Cheyenne's mom was alive. If the paramedics could revive her. But what he did know was that this was creating an incredible amount of trauma for Cheyenne. Just the thought of what she was going through right now made him ill. He found her sitting on the edge of her mother's bed, one hand pressed to her lips and her face alarmingly pale. Zack's stomach clenched at the sight, and he approached her as he would one of the civilians unwittingly caught in a gunfight. Slowly he sat down next to her, careful to keep his movements even, and slid an arm around her shoulders. If her mother didn't survive this, would she blame him? Some of his tension dissipated when she leaned into him, her small frame trembling. He could feel the chill of her skin through the thin fabric of her t-shirt, and he rubbed his hand up and down her arm, trying to restore some warmth. Is she dead? Cheyenne asked, her voice cracking on the last word. Zack looked up at the ceiling, blinking rapidly. I don't know. He'd done everything he could, everything his training dictated. But had it been enough? In minutes that felt like hours, the paramedics loaded Cheyenne's mom into the back of an ambulance, still doing CPR. Cheyenne climbed in after the gurney. Zack moved to follow, but one of the paramedics stopped him with a hand. I'm sorry, sir but only one person is allowed to accompany the patient in the ambulance, he said. Everything in Zack wanted to argue, Cheyenne shouldn't be left alone right now, but he knew there was no time for that. So instead, he forced himself to take a step back. To not make this worse for Cheyenne. I'll meet you there, he told her. I'm right behind you. She nodded, and soon the ambulance was pulling away. Zack pushed away the guilt and instead jumped into action. Cheyenne hadn't left her car keys, but it didn't take him long to locate a spare in the house and to GPS the location of the hospital. He made sure the house was locked up tight, then sped to the hospital. This loss had the potential to destroy Cheyenne. But the alternative, an addict who refused to accept help and was always one overdose away from dying, didn't seem much better. He hoped the doctors would continue to work on Cheyenne's mother when she arrived. That they wouldn't pronounce her dead on arrival. 
Cheyenne shouldn't have to be alone when the worst happened. Not when, he reminded himself. If. There was still a chance that her mom was alive. At the hospital, Zach found the parking garage. He'd just pulled into a spot when his phone buzzed, a text. Probably John or Sawyer wondering where he was. Zach quickly put Cheyenne's convertible in park, killing the engine. But the text wasn't from Sawyer or John. It was an official, encrypted message. Zach skimmed through it, feeling sick. They were being called back early from leave and had orders to take the first available plane back to San Diego. He slammed a hand against the steering wheel, cursing loudly. How could he leave Cheyenne alone to deal with her mother's overdose, whatever the outcome? Depending on the op, he might not even be able to call and check in on her. Zach wouldn't know for sure until they were briefed back on base. His phone rang, and Zach picked it up immediately. Did you see? Sawyer asked. Yeah, Zach said. John's already looking at plane tickets. Are you still at the garage? We're leaving for the airport in 15 minutes. Zach pinched the bridge of his nose, hating, for perhaps the first time in his life, that he was a SEAL. How he would love to simply call his boss, cite a medical emergency, and take the day off. Cheyenne deserved a man who could stay and support her through this. But SEALs didn't get days off, and the job always came first. I'm not at the garage, Zach said. I'm in Portland with Cheyenne. There was silence, then a muffled noise. When Sawyer spoke again, his voice was distant. I just put you on speakerphone so John can hear, too. What are you doing in Portland? Zach quickly explained, starting with the call Cheyenne had received from Dr. Robbins and ending with finding her mother unconscious on the bathroom floor. Sawyer swore. Is Cheyenne's mom going to be okay? Mrs. Miller had looked more dead than alive when they found her. Even if she survived, there might be lasting effects, brain damage from lack of oxygen, for one. They had no idea how long she'd been unconscious. I don't know, Zach said, running a hand over the steering wheel. I just arrived at the hospital and am about to head inside and find out. I'm sorry, man, John said. I hope her mom is okay. Me too, Zach said, squeezing his eyes shut. How could he leave now? How's Cheyenne doing? Sawyer asked. About like you'd expect. Zach glanced over at her destroyed cell phone, which rested on the passenger seat of the car. I can't leave her here alone. Maybe I can call Aspen and have her meet Cheyenne at the hospital. No, I'll bring Meredith, John interrupted. She's great with this kind of thing, and someone's going to have to drive us to the airport, anyway. We'll pack up your stuff and head out soon. I'll text you the flight information and keep you updated on when we'll be there to pick you up. Zach wasn't sure how Cheyenne would feel about that, Meredith was still practically a stranger, but Aspen also didn't know he was a SEAL, and he didn't have time to come up with an explanation for his sudden departure. Okay, Zach said. Thanks. Plan on seeing us in about four hours, John said. I'm booking our flights now. It'll be tight, but we can make the connection if we hurry. I'll grab your stuff, Sawyer said. Everything is in your bag? Yeah, Zach said. He'd learned long ago to always be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Thanks. We'll text you updates along the road, Sawyer said. See you soon. Zach hung up and stepped out of the car with a growl of disgust. Talk about awful timing. Right now, he would give almost anything to stay in Oregon with Cheyenne. But he was a seal. Somewhere in the world, something awful was happening, and it was his job to fix it. He found Cheyenne alone in the waiting room, a hand pressed to her mouth and her eyes wet with tears. Zach raced to her, hard in his throat. Is she? I don't know, Cheyenne cut in, collapsing into him. They won't let me back there to see her. Zach tightened his hold on her, resting his chin on her head as she fisted her hands around his shirt. He didn't want to tell her that he was leaving in only four hours. Didn't want to leave her here to deal with this alone. But he had no choice. Duty called, and he was compelled to answer. 
Che, Zach said, brushing a strand of hair behind her ear. I have to tell you something. She peeked up at him, her cheeks stained with tears and eyes red. What? He tried to swallow the grenade lodged in his throat, but couldn't. So he pulled the pin and threw it instead. I got a text just a few minutes ago. He rubbed his hands up and down her arms, hoping she could see how much he hated doing this to her. We've been called back to base for a mission. Sawyer and John are already on their way to pick me up, then we'll head to the airport. Her mouth fell open. She blinked up at him with an expression that transitioned from confused to betrayed in a heartbeat. You're leaving? Cheyenne asked, her tone disbelieving. He nodded, the censure in her eyes, cutting him to the core. I don't want to, but... I know. She shrugged off his hands, taking a step back. It's the job. I get it. She was building walls, just like when he told her he was a seal, and doing it quicker than he feared he could tear them down. Zack tried to keep the emotion from his voice, but didn't quite manage it. Believe me when I say I would stay if I could. I hate leaving you here when everything is so uncertain. You mean with a corpse in the next room? She folded her arms tightly across her stomach. Don't apologize. Duty calls. I get it. She was breaking his heart. If there was any possible way he could stay, then he would, but it was out of the question. He'd be court-martialed if he tried. Che. We always knew we had an expiration date. She took another step back. He could feel the distance growing between them with every word. Just a fling, right? That was our agreement. Now the fling is over. The thought of leaving things like this, between them was a knife, to the stomach. Please. I've still got four hours. Let me help you. No, her tone was firm, her eyes steely. You are the job, Zach. That's never going to change. He rubbed a hand over his jaw, hating that she was right. I know, but it doesn't mean we can't still. What? Be friends? She shifted her weight from one foot to the other, arms still folded. Yes, Zack said, unable to keep the desperation from his voice. I want to stay friends. Is that so crazy? For a moment, he thought she might relent. Her face softened, her eyes growing luminous in the harsh fluorescent light of the hospital waiting room. Then her expression hardened, and he knew he'd lost. When she spoke, her voice was quiet but firm. Can you tell me where you're going? Zack let his hands drop to his sides, defeated. His eyes were wet with pain. No. She nodded. Can you tell me when you'll be back? No, he said again, this one quieter than the last. She bit her lip, looking sad and very much alone. Can you call me while you're gone? Was this how John felt when he left Meredith? Zack lifted his shoulders in a helpless shrug. I don't know. I hope so, but I can't make any promises. Can't make any promises. The reality of that slammed through him and he wanted to cry. Cheyenne deserved so much more. Then we're done. Her voice was soft and pained. I told you it couldn't be more than a fling. Right now, I need more than another unstable relationship in my life. I'm sorry. He wanted to argue with her. The sailor in him demanded he fight for their relationship. He'd never met a woman he felt this connected to. She seemed to understand him on a level no one else had. But if she truly understood him, she'd understand what the seals meant to him. They'd agreed to a fling. He couldn't give her what she needed. Maybe she couldn't give him what he needed, either. Acceptance slowly washed over Zack, and with it, the fight went out of him. He respected her too much to argue with her decision. They'd always known this would end in goodbye. It was just coming sooner than he'd expected. I'm going to miss you so much, Zack said. Please, let me sit with you until Sawyer and John get here. You shouldn't be alone right now. Noong Cheyenne tightened her hold on herself, shaking her head vigorously. I need to say goodbye right now. 
No texts, no phone calls, no updates. A clean break. Zack swallowed back the bitter taste of regret. A clean break was the last thing he wanted. What do you want? He asked himself. To ask Cheyenne to be his girlfriend? For her to spend the majority of her life waiting for him to come home? That wasn't fair, and he wouldn't ask it of her. At that moment, he fully understood John's decision to leave. But Zack couldn't do the same, which left him with only one option, doing as Cheyenne had asked. Of course, I'll continue to work on the truck and send you texts about it, Cheyenne said. Unless you'd prefer someone else finish it. I can give you some names. No, Zack said quickly. He hadn't even thought about the truck, but if Cheyenne was willing, he wanted her to finish it. She probably needed the money now more than ever. I'd like you to finish it. She nodded. Then I'll send you texts about the truck, but I want to keep things professional. Professional. Like they'd never shared life-changing kisses or discussed the darkest parts of their past in the moonlight. If that's what you want, Zack said. She nodded, brushing away a tear. It is. So this was what it felt like to go through a painful breakup. Zack swallowed hard. He'd had breakups before, but it had never taken long to get over them. Cheyenne would be different, though. She wouldn't be easy to forget. The last few weeks have been the best I've had in years. Zack cleared his throat, looking down to give himself a moment to regain his composure. I'm really going to miss you. I'm going to miss you, too. Cheyenne clasped her hands together, as though praying. Her eyes sparkled, and a few tears rolled down her cheeks when she blinked. In a moment, she had crossed the space between them. She rose on tiptoes, her hands going to his face as she kissed him. Zack wrapped his arms around her waist, heartbreaking. A moment later, she pulled away, and he let her go. Sailors make sacrifices, he reminded himself. He just never had thought he'd have to sacrifice, quite like this. Bye, Zack, Cheyenne said, a sad smile on her lips. Try not to get yourself killed. He flinched, clenching his jaw. I'm always careful. She just nodded, stepping further away from him. A nurse hurried into the room then, heading straight to Cheyenne. Miss Miller? Yes, Cheyenne said, her attention instantly diverted. The doctor wants to speak to you, the nurse said. Come with me. Cheyenne glanced over her shoulder at Zack. Her blue eyes blazed with emotion. Zack couldn't believe that this was it. Could their relationship really be over? She turned away, disappearing down the hallway as she trailed the nurse. Zack had no idea what the doctor would tell Cheyenne. If her mother was dead or alive. He no longer had the right to find out. Zack looked around the empty waiting room. He'd barely registered it before, when all of his energy had been focused on Cheyenne. Two love seats were flanked by end tables holding ratty-looking magazines, and some cooking show played on the TV, the closed captioning scrolling across the muted screen. Slowly, Zack walked out of the waiting room. He'd find somewhere else to wait for his ride, maybe the cafeteria. Somewhere Cheyenne wouldn't accidentally run into him, forcing them both to relieve the last few moments. He gave the waiting room one last fleeting glance, then headed down the hallway alone. Chapter 23 Cheyenne took a deep breath, hand resting on the door of her mother's hospital room. The last few hours had been a blur, but mom was alive. The doctor said they'd been able to restart mom's heart, but at the time he hadn't been certain if she would wake up or what the long-term effects might be. Cheyenne had answered all of his questions as best she could, her heart beating wildly and entire body shaking with adrenaline and fear. Then he'd sent her back to the waiting room. She'd never felt more alone. During those long, painful hours, she'd regretted sending Zack away. For hours with him by her side would have been better than none. But she couldn't allow herself to need him. Not when he would so rarely be around. Not when he could so easily die in the line of duty, just like her father. Cheyenne looked again at the door. Mom was awake now. The doctor said she was stable and would pull through the overdose, at least physically. 
but what would her state of mind be this time around? Had the overdose been accidental, too much drugs after the detox, or deliberate? Do not cry, Cheyenne silently commanded. Putting off this conversation wouldn't help anything. Wouldn't make her mom better. Whatever was on the other side of that door, she'd handle it alone. She always did. Cheyenne pushed open the door and forced herself to enter. Mom lay in the middle of the bed, nearly hidden beneath a pile of thin blankets. The hiss of oxygen was accompanied by the slow beat of some other monitor, maybe it was measuring mom's heart rate? Her skin looked even more sallow than usual against the dull blue of the hospital bedding. And four was taped to the crease of her elbow, and a bag of clear solution jerked into the tube at her arm. For just a moment, Cheyenne saw her mother as she'd been back when she was a kid, a healthy glow to her lightly tan skin, blue eyes sparkling, brown hair turned golden by the sun, and a dusting of freckles across her cheeks. Dad had been a cop back then, too, but the stress of the job hadn't yet gotten to any of them. It had been a few years later when he had his first real scare on the job, a gun pulled on him during a routine traffic check. His partner had been vigilant and the situation quickly contained, but mom had never been the same after that. Cheyenne? Mom squinted, her voice a thin wisp in the vast emptiness of the room. Cheyenne swallowed back the lump in her throat and forced herself to reply. Hey, mom. She held out an unsteady hand, and Cheyenne quickly crossed the room to take it. Blue veins spider webbed the back of it. For the first time, Cheyenne realized how old her mother's hands looked. A few age spots dotted the pale skin, and the skin felt less substantial and more fragile than in years past. Cheyenne swallowed back a sob. Her mother was barely 50 years old, but abusing prescription drugs had aged her at least a decade. You shouldn't have come looking for me, mom said, her voice trembling. Cheyenne dropped her mother's hand, feeling suddenly cold. What was I supposed to do when they called and said you'd left rehab? Mom looked away. If I'd wanted your help, I would have called you to come and pick me up. But I knew it was no use. I'm a big girl, you know. I can take care of myself. Cheyenne flashed back to all the ways she'd taken care of her mom. There were the obvious ways, like handling all of dad's affairs after his passing. Then there were the less obvious ways, like hiding the car keys so she didn't drive while under the influence and staying up all night to make sure she was still breathing after taking too many pills. Yeah, you've done a great job of taking care of yourself the last few years. For once, she didn't try to hide the bitterness in her voice. Five overdoses. Three hospital stays. Great job, Mom. Really? Mom looked down at the blanket, smoothing her fingers over a snag in the weave of the dull blue comforter as though imagining how she would fix it on her sewing machine. Cheyenne wanted to grab her by the shoulders and shake some sense into her. If only that would work. What do you want me to say? Mom asked, still not looking at her. Cheyenne suddenly ached for Zack. It would be so nice to lean on him right now. To feel the comfort of his arms around her and absorb the strength his presence lent. But Zack's days consisted of risking his life in secret far-off locations. Even if she hadn't sent him away, he wouldn't be here right now. He was probably at the airport. Maybe already on a plane. She shouldn't have let him in. Being strong was so much harder after allowing herself to rely on someone else. Did you intentionally overdose, Mom? Cheyenne asked, bluntly. Mom flinched. What a thing to say to your mother. What a thing to do to your daughter, Cheyenne shot back. Tell me how we can fix this. Mom continued playing with the loose thread on the blanket, intently avoiding Cheyenne's gaze. As far as I know, there isn't a way to raise the dead. Nothing will ever be fixed again, at least not for me. Cheyenne's breath caught painfully in her chest. It's been four years. Four years of fighting over pills. Of begging mom to stop. For years of worrying that she'd lose the only parent she had left. Mom smoothed out the thread, finally looking up at Cheyenne. Have you ever been in love? Really, truly in love. The kind of love that eclipses every aspect of your life. 
An image of Zack degreasing the alternator of his truck popped into Cheyenne's mind, making her heart ache. Did she love Zack? They'd known each other for less than two weeks. It seemed impossible, and yet she already missed him fiercely. Losing the love of your life isn't something you just get over, Mom continued, oblivious to Cheyenne's internal war. Your father was my entire world. I loved him before you were even a thought in either of our minds. I don't know how I'm supposed to live without him. The words slammed into Cheyenne. She'd known that Mom's drug abuse was tied up in her grief, but she'd never before stated it so frankly. Cheyenne wanted to back down. Give her mother some space. But she'd been doing that for years, and it hadn't worked. This time, things would be different. She wouldn't dance around the issue. Wouldn't tiptoe out of fear of what mom would do if Cheyenne said something to send her into another spiral. Medicating yourself isn't the answer, Cheyenne said, forcing her tone to be hard. Were you trying to overdose? She'd held out hope that it had been accidental. When the doctors told her what they'd found in her mother's system, Cheyenne had silently prayed for a believable explanation. But mom looked down at the comforter, her thin hands worrying that same snag in the fabric. And Cheyenne knew. The overdose hadn't been an accident. Not this time. I just want to be with him again, Mom whispered. Cheyenne swayed, feeling for the clunky chair, tucked into one corner. She dragged it closer and sank into the hard cushion, resting her elbows on the bed. Ancient springs sagged under the slight weight. At least they were done pretending. What is killing yourself going to accomplish? Cheyenne asked, her voice a whisper. Do you want to leave me here all alone? She tried to imagine a life without either of her parents. What would she do? Move into her childhood home and live with the ghosts of happier times? Aspen was getting married in a few months and starting a life separate from Cheyenne in Sapphire Cove. Zach would be somewhere in the world, fighting for freedom beside Sawyer. John and Meredith would be adjusting to civilian life. Where did that leave her? Of course I don't want to leave you. Mom's eyes filled with tears. Her shoulders hunched forward, voice broken. I just miss him so much, Che. He was my everything. I don't know who I am without him. Cheyenne dropped her head to the bed, resting it on her mother's leg. Her own tears leaked into the comforter. She wanted so badly to drop this conversation and go back to pretending but that path hadn't served either of them. You need to go back to the treatment center, Cheyenne said, trying to sound firm. I can't give you the help you need on my own anymore. You need professionals. Mom snorted, all anger once more. That place is for drug addicts and people who've made awful life choices. I don't belong there. I'm not an, an addict. I'm just a widow whose husband didn't ask to be murdered. Cheyenne jumped to her feet, her face heating. And I'm just a daughter who's asking her mom to stop using drugs. Her pleas fell on deaf ears. Mom's eyes were glassy and her gaze unfocused, as though she were staring at some past memory. He knew how much I hated that job. I begged him for years to change careers and go into something less dangerous. But would he listen to me? Of course not. I told him, I told him, I told him. A monitor started beeping shrilly. Mom hunched over, pulling her legs to her chest as she gasped for air. Panic made Cheyenne clumsy. She tripped over the chair, nearly falling in her rush to the door. I need some help in here, she yelled. Two nurses and a doctor ran into the room. Cheyenne stepped aside, watching as they checked monitors and spoke rapidly back and forth. The words were an incomprehensible stream of medical jargon. Was mom having a heart attack? A seizure or a stroke? Cheyenne wasn't aware that tears streamed down her face until one dropped onto her hand. This was what falling in love did to a person. It turned them into a shell. It was good that Zach was gone. A nurse ushered Cheyenne into the hallway, and she watched through the window as the doctor continued to work. More people entered the room. Cheyenne pressed a shaking hand to her lips. 
It was several long minutes before the doctor exited the room. Cheyenne stepped in his path, her hands clenched into fists to stop them from shaking. What happened, she demanded. The doctor's eyes were soft and sympathetic. He was middle-aged, with a thick head of dark hair and a nicely trimmed goatee. He probably had a wife who didn't overdose on painkillers. His kids probably didn't have to take care of their parents. An anxiety attack, the doctor said. We gave her something to help her sleep. She should be out for a few hours at least. Are you sure that's what it was? Cheyenne asked, hating how her voice trembled. The doctor nodded. We ruled out other causes, and the medication is helping. An anxiety attack. Was it Cheyenne's fault for pushing too hard? Will it happen again? Cheyenne asked. The doctor looked uncomfortable. Maybe. She's dealing with a lot of stress right now. Normally I would prescribe medication to help, but given your mom's addiction, I'm not sure that's the wisest course of action. I'd like to discuss it with the hospital psychiatrist so we can decide together. Cheyenne wiped under her eyes. Would the floor ever again feel stable beneath her feet? She felt like she was drowning. Running too fast. Pushing a boulder uphill. I would like you to meet with the hospital psychiatrist as well, the doctor said, his voice kind. Often it's helpful for family members of addicts. Cheyenne couldn't seem to stop crying. She gave up trying to wipe away the tears and instead wrapped her arms tightly around her waist. She missed Zach. She hated that she missed him. I spoke with someone the last time my mother overdosed, Cheyenne said. The ambulance had taken her mother to a hospital on the other side of Portland at that time, one a little closer to home. I'd still like to ask the psychiatrist to come down and speak with you, the doctor said. Is that okay? Cheyenne tightened her hold on her arms, wishing she could somehow hold herself together by sheer force of will. She didn't know how she could continue doing this alone, with no support system. For years, she'd carried the weight, but now she was breaking under it. Finally, she gave a curt nod. I guess that's fine. Great. The doctor patted her on the arm. I'll have her stop by soon. If you'd like to take a break for a while, maybe grab something to eat, now would be a good time. The cafeteria should be open soon. Okay. Cheyenne wiped again at her eyes. Please have someone page me if there's any change. I broke my cell phone today, so I'm not reachable on that. She didn't even know where her phone was. Probably still in her car, which she assumed was in visitor parking. Zach hadn't said. We will, the doctor said. Your mother is in good hands. Let us take care of her, and you take care of yourself. Cheyenne nodded numbly. Thank you, doctor. She stumbled down the hallway and around the corner before collapsing against the wall, her shoulders shaking with silent sobs. Her mother had tried to end her life. She was addicted to drugs and showed no desire to overcome that addiction. Cheyenne was going to lose this fight. She couldn't will her mother into recovery. She'd tried and failed on an epic scale. Images of her father's funeral flashed before her. Watching her mother collapse over his stiff body at the hospital. Picking out a casket at the mortuary while her mom cried uncontrollably, refusing to offer an opinion. Putting on a brave face at the funeral and accepting condolences from neighbors and the police officers her father had worked with because mom was already lost in a world of her own making. Would anyone come to her mother's funeral? Her father's police friends had long since stopped checking in on them. The neighbors had given up on trying to reach out after being rebuffed too many times. Cheyenne? She looked up, startled at the sound of her name. Meredith stood in the hallway, her blonde hair pulled into a hasty ponytail and a warm brown leather purse slung over one shoulder. Cheyenne struggled to her feet, new tears falling at the sight of a familiar face. She didn't know why or how Meredith was here, and she didn't care. Meredith held out her arms and Cheyenne fell into the hug, her shoulders shaking. I'm so sorry, Meredith said, tightening her grip on Cheyenne. I'm so, so sorry. 
It was several long moments before Cheyenne pulled back. For the first time, she noticed Meredith's red-rimmed eyes and haggard features. Was she sad because John had left, or had something else happened? What are you doing here? she asked. Is everyone okay? I'm here for you. Meredith offered her a wan smile. Zach wanted to make sure you weren't alone. Cheyenne looked away, her heart aching. Still the gentleman, even when she'd so rudely sent him away. It made her miss him even more. Are they gone then? Yes. They made it just in time and are already in the air. Cheyenne squeezed her eyes shut, taking in a shuddering breath. He was really gone. That's good. Except it didn't feel good. Zack was on his way to danger. How long would it take for him to be in harm's way? Twelve hours? Twenty-four? Where was he going, and what would he do when he got there? How's your mom? Meredith asked. Zack didn't know. Stable for now. Cheyenne pinched the bridge of her nose, a wave of exhaustion, sweeping over her. The stress of the last few hours had sapped all of her energy. She's sleeping. Good. Meredith hitched her purse higher on her shoulder. Let's go see if the cafeteria is open. You need to eat. Cheyenne hesitated. She wanted Meredith's company, hated the thought of once again being alone, but didn't want to impose. Don't you need to get back to Sapphire Cove? Meredith shook her head. I don't have any photo shoots today, and I'm not leaving you here alone. Cheyenne fell into step beside Meredith. She was so grateful to have a friend here. But how much did Meredith know? Was she only here because Zach had begged her to come? Cheyenne bit her lip, glancing over at Meredith. I broke up with Zach. Meredith didn't break stride, her shoes echoing on the tile floor. I know. That surprised Cheyenne, although she realized it shouldn't. She inhaled a shaky breath. I don't want to talk about him. It's too hard. We don't have to. Meredith wrapped an arm around Cheyenne's shoulder, giving it a squeeze. I'm here for you. Not him. Cheyenne bowed her head, overwhelmed once more with emotions. Meredith's proclamation meant more to her than she could put into words. Thank you. Of course. Meredith gave her a crooked smile. What are friends for? Chapter 24 The military issue cargo plane smelled of sweat and leather. Zack's jump seat was hard and unforgiving, but the mood inside the aircraft was jovial. The other seven members of the SEAL squad were talking animatedly, their raucous laughter bouncing off the metal plane. Even Sawyer and John, who sat beside him, were enthusiastically discussing an evening run along the beach. Zack's energy should have been high after such a successful operation. They'd spent the last eight days in Cairo, rescuing the kidnapped daughter of the U.S. ambassador to Egypt. The mission had hit on everything Zack loved about being a SEAL, adventure, adrenaline, and teamwork. They'd made a difference in the world while protecting the vulnerable. The squad had fought hard and worked together like a seamless machine, each member of the team perfectly executing their job. There had been challenges they had to overcome, there always were on ops, but at the end of the day, they'd reunited a nine-year-old girl with two extremely grateful parents. Zack himself had carried the girl out of the shipping container she'd been held in and placed her aboard the helicopter to safety. So why did he feel so empty? He hadn't spoken to Cheyenne since she'd asked for a clean break. Meredith had texted him the next day but hadn't shared much, just that Cheyenne's mother was alive and Meredith would do what she could to help. He'd wanted to press for more information, but hadn't allowed himself that luxury. As far as he knew, Meredith had said nothing more about the situation to John. If she had, his friend wasn't sharing. Was Cheyenne back in Sapphire Cove, working at Doug's? Or was she still in Portland, parenting her mom? It killed him that he didn't even know that much. The plane dipped, beginning its descent toward Coronado, and Zack braced himself for touchdown. Soon they were all grabbing their duffel bags and disembarking the plane. Sawyer and John continued to talk as they walked toward the barracks, but Zack wasn't paying attention. 
they'd just pulled off an almost impossible rescue. Yet he couldn't figure out how to fix things with Cheyenne. He wanted so badly to fix things with her, even though he knew it was impossible. Maybe if he wasn't a seal. But he was. In his room, he dropped his bag on the single twin bed with the solid blue comforter. The nightstand boasted only a lamp, and his laptop sat closed on the otherwise empty desk. The sparseness of his living quarters had never bothered him before, but today it felt cold and utilitarian. Why couldn't he just move on? He'd known all along that a relationship with Cheyenne had an expiration date. He just hadn't expected things to end so abruptly. Back in the hallway, Sawyer and John waited for him, having dropped off their bags. Should we head to the mess hall? Sawyer asked. I'm starving. You guys go without me. John already had his phone out, no doubt calling Meredith. I'm not that hungry right now. Zack rubbed his chest, trying to ease the ache. Would Meredith let something slip about Cheyenne? Not that it mattered, because Zack would never ask. Meet up with you guys later for that run? John asked, glancing up from his phone. Yeah, sounds good, Sawyer said. John nodded goodbye, then disappeared back into his room. Zack didn't say much as they walked to the mess hall. The air was balmy and warm, without the chilly tinge that often accompanied the breeze in Oregon. Palm trees waved lazily above their heads, but Zack missed the towering pines and rocky shoreline of Sapphire Cove. They ate mostly in silence, the low hum of voices, nothing more than static on a communications radio. Zack barely tasted his burrito. He longed to be back in Doug's garage, listening to Cheyenne explain how to disassemble an engine while their potato fries from Baylor's diner grew cold. His life had been the seals, for so long that he'd forgotten what it was like to be a civilian. But Cheyenne had reminded him of another version of himself, one who wanted to settle down and start a family. Maybe that was why he'd clung to his dad's truck when selling it would have been the smarter move. It reminded him of when he'd had his own slice of normalcy. You're thinking about her, aren't you? Zack blinked, focusing on Sawyer. His friend had already finished his meal, his silverware and plate neatly stacked on the tray with the used napkin beside it. Now he leaned forward, arms resting on the table and eyes peering intently at Zack. His lips were set in a hard line his forehead furrowed with concern. Of course, I'm thinking about her, Zack said. Leaving, under those circumstances, was brutal. What kind of guy does that? A seal, Sawyer said immediately. It's not like you cut and ran because things got real. None of what happened was your fault, and she knows that just as much as you do. Zack dragged his knife through the enchilada sauce that had pulled on his plate. It doesn't have to be my fault to have been a crappy move. No, but that's the job. Zack pushed aside his tray of food abruptly, the words bursting out of him. Then maybe it shouldn't be my job anymore. Sawyer drew back. Zack stared, horrified at what he'd just said. Sawyer's eyes were dark, his lips pursed tightly together. When he spoke, his words were carefully controlled. Are you being serious right now? Zack ran a hand through his hair, not meeting Sawyer's eyes. Of course not. I was just venting. Sawyer folded his arms, his voice growing rough. I know you like Cheyenne, but that's a big step. You only dated her for a little over a week. A week that had felt like a lifetime. They'd probably spent more hours together during that week than he'd spent with any of his previous girlfriends. He'd learned more about her and shared more of himself, than in any prior relationship. I didn't mean it, Zack said. Sorry. I'm just frustrated with how it ended. He couldn't mean it. Right? Cheyenne had said she didn't want to see him again. Even if he left the seals, she might not be interested in, what? Marriage? They barely knew each other, and leaving for anything less than a lifetime commitment was crazy. She'd said herself that she wasn't looking for a relationship. Zack hadn't been either. Still wasn't. So why couldn't he let her go? Sawyer pressed a hand to his forehead, letting out a frustrated growl. You're doing it again. 
Doing what? Zack asked, instantly defensive. Thinking about her. Sawyer leaned forward, his eyes, pained. I think you're considering leaving with John. Zack thought of how Cheyenne's body nestled against his when they kissed. The way her eyes lit up when she worked on his truck. Her quiet strength as she tackled her mother's addiction. She needed someone to help shoulder the load. He wanted so badly for that person to be him, but he couldn't be the man she needed and a seal. Zack wadded up his napkin, tossing it on his half-eaten burrito. Leaving the seals over a girl is John's play, not mine. Cheyenne's life is a mess right now, and the last thing she needs is some sailor making it messy, eh? Sawyer grunted. You know how much I hate that John is leaving the seals. I hate it too, Zack said quickly. Sawyer nodded. But you know what? As much as it sucks for us, John is happier now than I've ever seen him. Zack had to agree. He really loves Meredith. John was willing to give up everything for the woman he loved. Was Zack willing to do the same? Yeah, and he's lucky enough that she loves him back, Sawyer said. He gets to spend the rest of his life with her. Maybe it's not jumping out of airplanes and covert ops, but he seems okay with it. Zack stared at Sawyer, trying to read him. Sawyer stared back, unblinking. I have no idea where you're going with this, Zack said finally. Sawyer scrubbed a hand down his face, looking pained. I'm saying that I want you to be happy. If Cheyenne is what will make you happy, well, you've got to do what you've got to do. Zack swallowed back the lump in his throat, feeling suddenly emotional. He knew what the seals meant to Sawyer. Knew what it would cost him if both John and Zack left. What about you? Zack challenged. When do you get to be happy? Sawyer lifted his shoulders in a shrug. We're not talking about me. So, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Zack knew what he wanted to do, hop on a plane and go see Cheyenne. He wanted to erase their last conversation and spend another evening working together on his truck in Doug's garage. Wanted to hear her laugh as he told a funny story from his childhood and see her light up as she related memories from happier times. I don't know, Zack said. I just feel so guilty that I left her to deal with this all alone. Except you didn't leave her alone. Zack raised an eyebrow. How do you figure? Meredith's been checking in on her. Sawyer held up one finger, then another. Aspen seems like a pretty good friend, too, and I imagine she's keeping an eye on her. That's two people checking in on Cheyenne, and I don't think either of them will leave her out to dry. True, Zack said. But it wasn't the same thing, and he knew it. I just wish there was some way I could help more. In addition to the emotional stress of having her mother leave rehab early only to relapse, he knew the financial strain this would place on Cheyenne. If he thought she'd accept, he'd pay her double for working on his truck. Triple, if that's what she needed. He'd drain his entire bank account if it would make her life even 1% easier. If you're thinking of leaving, just give me a heads up, okay? Sawyer blew out a breath. I can't even believe we're having this discussion. I'm not thinking of leaving, Zack said quickly. He'd be crazy to leave. You have to do what's best for you. Sawyer held up his hands. I'm not going to try and influence you one way or the other. All I ask is that you give me some warning. I know you're meeting with Matthews tomorrow about your re-enlistment options, and I've got my meeting with him later this week. Zack folded his arms, staring at Sawyer. Trying to read his thoughts. He seemed serious about this. Like he expected Zack to go. If I did leave, and John's definitely leaving, then what would you do? Sawyer was silent for a moment, his eyes piercing. I don't know, he said finally. I just want all the information before I make my choice. The next morning, Zack was right on time for his appointment with Lt. Matthews, having already completed his PT for the day and gotten his hair trimmed at the barber. Zack took a deep breath, before rapping on the office door. Despite what he'd told Sawyer, his stomach churned, and he suddenly felt nauseous. Come in, Matthew said, his voice muffled through the door. 
Matthew's office was utilitarian, gray file cabinet in one corner, the drawers neatly closed with no papers visible. The top of the basic black desk was clear other than a laptop and file folder with Zach's name on it. Zach had been here a few times before, and it had always struck him how entirely the room lacked personality. It could have belonged to anyone or no one. But that was life as a seal, never putting down roads, because at any moment your country might need you to pick up and leave for someplace else. It had never bothered him until Sapphire Cove. That town had permanence etched into every crevice. It had been evident in the war laminate in Doug's shop from where customers had stood at the counter for years. Obvious in the way townsfolk greeted each other with a familiarity bred from years of interactions. Life on base was different. Zack snapped off a salute. Matthews was in his late thirties and nearly six feet tall, with weathered skin and eyes that had a hard glint to them. Despite his intimidating presence, he'd always treated Zack fairly, and they worked together well on ops. Now he stood behind the desk with an unreadable expression. Take a seat, Matthews said, motioning to the metal chair in front of his desk. Zack did as he was told. Was it his imagination? or were his legs shaking? Matthew sat down as well, his expression unreadable. I hope you've had some time to think about my offer. Zack swallowed, his mouth dry, and the decision made. I have, sir. Good. Matthews rested his elbows on the desk and leaned forward. I think you're the man for the job. You meet all the requirements for officer candidacy school, but more than that, you have the work ethic and people skills as well as the strategic mind, to lead the squad. A month ago, Zack would have been hard-pressed to hide his enthusiasm at the praise. It was everything he'd hoped to hear since entering BUD S. Thank you, sir. You have every right to feel proud. You've done very well for yourself. Matthew steepled his fingers, raising both eyebrows. Do I make the recommendation, Ben? One word, three little letters, Y-E-S and he'd take that first step down the path he'd always dreamed of. Zack felt frozen, his breath trapped in uncooperative lungs as the future played out before him. Officer candidate school would be an exciting new challenge, one where he felt he would thrive. When he re-enlisted in a year and a half, it would be as an officer. The promotion would come with a nice pay raise, and although that wasn't his motivation for accepting, it would be nice to rebuild the savings he'd drained by fixing his truck. He'd take over Matthew's command, leading the squad. Sawyer would naturally become his second, and while they'd feel the loss of John Keenly, Zack's life would continue the way it had since entering the Navy. Every day, he'd wake up to a new and exciting challenge. He'd put his life at risk to protect the vulnerable. Each night, he'd fall asleep knowing the work he'd done had made the world a safer place. This had been his goal ever since joining the military. He'd worked so hard for this. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. The words were on the tip of his tongue. He'd serve five or ten years as squad commander. When the rigors of the job took their toll and he could no longer pass the physical fitness requirements, he'd accept a support position and continue there until retirement. There would be no time to date. No time to start a family. No cozy bungalow overlooking the sea or lazy summer nights spent walking hand-in-hand hand on the pier. No Cheyenne. Maybe she'd reject him, even if he left the seals. But at that moment, Zack realized he wanted a family. Wanted to be the kind of dad his father had been, and to rebuild the kind of life he'd once been lucky enough to experience. The seals would always be his brothers. But they were no longer his home. I'm sorry, sir. Zack had expected the words to tear through him like shrapnel, but they slipped out as easily as a fish gliding through water. I have thought about it a lot, and my future is no longer with the Navy. I decided to leave with John. Chapter 25 Zack left his meeting with Matthews in a daze. The commander hadn't censured Zack. Hen questioned his choice or tried to change his mind but his eyes had been piercing when he clapped him on the shoulder and said, be really sure about your decision. If you change your mind, you've got one week before I start the paperwork. One week to decide the rest of his life. If Zack made the wrong choice, 
he'd have a lifetime to regret his decision. Re-enlisting meant six more years with the SEALs. It meant giving up any hope of mending fences with Cheyenne. He knew he wouldn't change his mind. Zack walked slowly back toward the barracks, his mind reeling. More than anything, he wanted to talk to Cheyenne. Everything had been so chaotic the last time they spoke. They needed to have another discussion about their relationship, this time in a calmer environment. But Cheyenne had asked him not to contact her again. It had been in the heat of the moment, but she had his number and hadn't used it in more than a week. Which meant he was leaving the Navy to, what? Not get the girl, because he might have already lost her. A deep sadness engulfed Zack. He felt like a riptide had pulled him under, one he wasn't sure how to fight. Why was Sawyer always right? Zack couldn't lie to himself any longer. He was in love with Cheyenne. And he would do anything to win her back. Back at the barracks, he paused outside Sawyer's door and tried to convince himself to knock. He had a promise to keep, but this conversation wouldn't be easy. John would, of course, be thrilled with Zack's decision and assume it meant he was moving to Sapphire Cove. Zack wanted to, desperately, but first he had to figure out a way to fix things with Cheyenne. If she wasn't interested in a relationship, it would be too painful to see her around town, not to mention being haunted by the ghost of her presence everywhere he turned. There had to be a way to make this right. As a SEAL, he'd assassinated terrorists, rescued hostages, and disarmed bombs, and that was just in the last mission. Now he'd taken the first step to convincing Cheyenne how serious he was about a relationship with her by leaving the SEALs. He just hoped it would work. Zack played back their time together, letting the memories lend him confidence. Whatever her current actions said, he'd felt her emotion in every kiss. Every touch. She felt just as strongly for him as he felt for her. He was willing to bet his career on it. Zack took a deep breath, then knocked on Sawyer's door. It opened a moment later, his friend's bulky frame filling the space. Sawyer's eyes narrowed, then he dropped his hand from the door and motioned Zack inside. I can tell I'm not going to like what you have to say, Sawyer said without preamble, opening the mini-fridge tucked next to his desk. Zack accepted the bottled water, silently, and sank into the desk chair. Sawyer sat down across from him on the bed, eyes dark and sad. They stared at each other, silently communicating. After several long moments, Sawyer rubbed a hand over his face and let out a deep sigh. I knew it. You aren't re-enlisting. Zack hung his head, eyes stinging. The disappointment in Sawyer's voice was physically painful to hear. I don't know what came over me. Zack's voice cracked. Matthews gave me another week to make my final decision. But you don't need a week. Sawyer twisted the cap off his bottled water and took a deep drink. Nell, Zack scrubbed a hand down his face, the panic finally setting in. What am I doing? I have no real plan. Sawyer smirked. You mean you aren't going to partner with John on King Trident scuba diving? Zack chucked the water bottle at Sawyer, which made him laugh. His hand shot up, catching the bottle before it could hit him in the chest. Can you imagine taking tourists on dives for the next 40 years? Zack asked. Sawyer sobered, tossing the water bottle back to Zack. Not really. Yeah, me either. Zack had no idea what he wanted to do. Before joining the SEALs, he'd been a pretty typical 18-year-old, tired of all the endless questions about his future because at the time he hadn't had a clue. Without the SEALs, he still didn't. John's idea doesn't sound so bad, Sawyer said. Not as exciting as being a SEAL, but better than being stuck on support. Maybe, Zack said. Neither held much appeal for him. At least you wouldn't be stuck behind a desk. Zack inclined his head. True. Sawyer sighed. You don't have to go into business with John just because you're leaving. I know. You've got over a year to figure it out. I know. Zack rubbed a hand over his face, the frustration building. The urge to kick something surged through him, but he pushed it back. Why aren't you telling me I'm an idiot? 
Why aren't you trying to talk me into staying? If the tables were turned, I'd be freaking out. I am freaking out. A month ago, I never would have imagined this happening. Sawyer raised an eyebrow as the silence stretched between them, collected as ever. Zack had always envied Sawyer's ability to remain calm in any situation. It was something that hadn't come naturally to Zack, and he still struggled with it. Like right now. Say something, Zack demanded. Sawyer tossed the now empty water bottle into the trash, the noise explosive in the silence. You want me to say something? To tell you what I really think? Yes. Zack knew this fight would hurt, that the guilt would wash over him like a wave. But it was also necessary. Fine. Sawyer folded his arms, his eyes steely. This sucks. I hate it. My two best friends are leaving the seals for women. That wasn't the plan. I didn't expect my life to take this turn either. Zack dropped his head, letting the wave crash over him. When his parents had died, Sawyer and John had been there for him. All four of Zack's grandparents had passed away by that point. Neither of his parents had siblings, so there had been no aunts, uncles, or cousins to comfort him. But Sawyer and John had helped with everything. Zack could still remember breaking down in his living room after the funeral, crying in a way that was embarrassing for a teenage boy. Sawyer and John had sat on either side of him, not saying anything but lending silent support. When Zack had choked out, I'm all alone, Sawyer had immediately replied, No, you aren't. Join the Navy with us. We'll be each other's family now. So Zack had, and he'd never once regretted that decision. Not until he was forced to leave Cheyenne alone at the hospital, her mother fighting for her life in the next room. Cheyenne hadn't called. Had walked away with such finality the last time they spoke. What was he doing? I know this isn't what you expected life to look like, Sawyer said quietly, pulling Zack back to the present. Joining the military made sense for me and John, but you had your parents. Until I didn't, Zack interrupted. And then you guys stepped up to the plate. If not for you and John, I don't know what I would have done. Family looks out for each other. Sawyer's shoulders slumped. And that's why I can't try to talk you out of leaving. As much as I hate it, I think leaving might be the best thing for you. John, too. It would be selfish of me to convince you to stay when it's not right for you. The words hit Zack like a bullet, silencing him. He watched the frustration mixed with resignation play out across Sawyer's face. Zack looked away, emotion rising in his chest. He didn't deserve a friend like Sawyer. How can leaving be the right thing? Zack asked, desperate for an answer. Cheyenne said she was only interested in a fling and isn't ready for a relationship. I'm not sure that I'm ready for a relationship. But Sawyer was shaking his head before he finished speaking. She's ready. You both are, whether you want to admit it or not. And if you're dumb enough to take what she said during a crisis seriously, then I guess you can't complain about the results. Zack winced. Are you saying I should beg her to take me back? I'm saying you shouldn't give up. The memory of their last encounter came back full force, and Zack pressed a fist to his mouth. She told me she wanted a clean break and asked me to leave her alone. How can I respect her boundaries and also ignore what she said? It's not about disrespecting her wishes. Sawyer leaned forward, his expression earnest. Her dad died in the line of duty. She just found out that you were a SEAL, and then her mom overdosed. At the time, Cheyenne had no idea if her mom would even make it. I think it's understandable that she freaked out a bit. The frustration was back. Zack leaped to his feet, unable to stay still. Of course it's understandable, but I won't force her to talk to me. She has the right to decide who she wants in her life. Of course she does. Sawyer rose as well, holding his hands up in a calming gesture. I'm not telling you to knock her unconscious and drag her to a courthouse to get married. But people say things they don't mean in the heat of the moment. If you're going to leave the seals for her, then she needs to know that. 
It might change how she feels about the situation. About a relationship with you. Zach paused, considering. Was that what Cheyenne was worried about, his career? He'd known it weighed heavily on her, but hadn't considered it might be the sole factor in her decision. And if his career wasn't a roadblock anymore. I think it's time you seriously think about what you want your future to look like, Sawyer said. And I guess, with you and John both leaving, I need to figure out what future I want, too. Zack sobered, heaviness, descending on him like fifty feet of water pressure. What are you going to do? Sawyer sighed, deeply. Your guess is as good as mine. The thought of staying on the team without you or John kills me. But I don't know if I can, Sawyer cut off abruptly, shaking his head. Being in Sapphire Cove wouldn't be easy, either. Empathy flooded Zack, and he awkwardly patted Sawyer on the shoulder. I'm sorry, man. Sorry that John and I are doing this to you, and sorry that we're putting you in such an awful spot. It's not like you guys did it on purpose. Sawyer gave him a quick one-armed hug, clapping him loudly on the back. We'll figure this out. Whether I stay or leave, we're still brothers. You can count on that. Over the next few days, Zack pushed himself to the limits during training exercises, relishing the way his mind cleared of everything but the moment at hand. John and Sawyer seemed preoccupied as well. John had been thrilled when Zack told him he was leaving the Navy and had high hopes that Zack would settle in Sapphire Cove. Zack hoped John was right. In those quiet moments just before falling asleep, Zack formed a plan. Sawyer was right about one thing he had to approach Cheyenne again. If, after having all the facts, she still wanted to never see him again. Well, he'd cross that bridge when he came to it. He just had to figure out the right way to contact her again. Work didn't make it easy. Their squad was sent on two more ops over the next three weeks, leaving Zach with little free time. He arrived home from Syria to find a text from Cheyenne that had been sent three days early. Zack's heart nearly stopped beating, and he almost dropped his phone trying to open the text. The last op had given him enough notice that he'd been able to leave his phone in his room, and was grateful he was alone to read the text in private. Sorry, I haven't worked on the truck lately. I know it's been over a month, but I might need to push that project to the back burner for a while longer. Zack stared at the text, his palms sweaty and heart thumping painfully. He didn't care about the stupid truck. He just wanted to know that Cheyenne was okay. This was it. His chance to connect with Cheyenne again. Had he already blown it by waiting three days to respond? Sorry, I didn't get back to you sooner. Don't worry about the truck. I know you've had a lot going on. He hesitated a moment, then added two more sentences. How's your mom doing? I've been thinking about you a lot. It was the next day before Cheyenne replied, leaving Zach ample time to second-guess his response. Had he crossed a line with that last sentence? He wanted so badly to tell her he was leaving the SEALs, but it wasn't a conversation for a text. Zach was in the wait room when the text notification dinged. He immediately stopped mid-set, the weights clattering back into place, and grabbed his phone. What if she reprimanded him for discussing his feelings? He wasn't sure how he'd tell her his news if she didn't even want to hear that he missed her. He opened the text, ignoring the loud rap music and chatter of the other members of his squad. Mom's fine. Thanks for asking. I'll let you know when I start working on the truck again. Zack stared at the text, his heart thudding in time to the downbeat of the bass music echoing through the weight room. She hadn't acknowledged that he missed her, but she also hadn't asked him to not say it again. She'd even thanked him for asking about her mom. He still didn't know if Cheyenne was still in Sapphire Cove or Portland. And what did Fine mean? Was her mom still in the hospital? Had she returned to rehab? He stared at his phone, then finally decided to ask the question that was plaguing him most. How are you doing? Zack went back to his workout, stopping to check his phone between every set. After showering, he headed to the mess hall for dinner with John and Sawyer. By the time he crawled into bed, he finally had to concede that Cheyenne wasn't planning on responding to him again. 
so he sent one more text, then went to bed. Don't forget to take care of yourself, too. The truck can wait. The brief interaction fanned the flames of his hope brighter, and Zack worked furiously to further implement his plan. Cheyenne seemed to be keeping her boundaries in place, and he wouldn't push those too far, at least not yet. But he also wouldn't stand idly by and let the woman he loved disappear from his life. Especially not when he was pretty sure that she loved him, too. He might be officially leaving the Navy, but civilian or not, he was a SEAL for life. And SEALs didn't give up without a fight. Chapter 26 The steady, even gaze of the therapist the hospital psychiatrist had referred her to had Cheyenne's skin prickling. She looked away uncomfortably, drumming her fingers against her folded arm. As much as she liked Dr. Bronson, sharing her feelings in therapy still felt like trying to remove lug nuts with a hammer. Today is a significant day, Dr. Bronson said. Cheyenne guessed she was around her mother's age, with a tall and willowy frame. Her sleek dark hair was clipped back in a familiar twist and her only visible makeup was a slight sheen of lip gloss. Cheyenne stared down at the goosebumps on her arms, chest tightening at the reminder. I don't know if I'd call it significant. Dr. Bronson crossed her legs, jostling the clipboard resting loosely on her lap in the process. Elaborate. Cheyenne lifted her shoulders in a shrug. Mom's been home from the hospital for a month, but I'm not sure why that's significant. The day of Mom's overdose, not quite two months ago, loomed much larger in her mind than the day Mom came home. Not that either day had been great. Cheyenne had been relieved that mom was alive, that she was okay, at least for the moment, but the weight of responsibility had rested heavily on her shoulders. She couldn't remember the last time she'd had a good night's sleep. Let's back things up a little then, Dr. Bronson said. While your mother was in the hospital, you decided to quit your two jobs in Sapphire Cove and move back home. Yeah. It was my only option. Cheyenne had felt awful about leaving without notice but Aspen had, of course, been understanding. So had Doug. He'd even let Cheyenne leave Zach's truck in the back lot of his shop until she could find time to move it to Portland. Cheyenne missed working on Zach's truck almost as much as she missed Zach. He hadn't pushed her, just like he'd promised, but his concern for her had shown through in the few texts they'd exchanged. You seem to enjoy your time in Sapphire Cove, Dr. Bronson said and you seem more melancholy than usual today. Are you missing the town? Cheyenne sighed, rubbing her arms. I guess I am. She'd only been back to Sapphire Cove once since that fateful day, about a week after her mother's overdose. The trip had been quick, just long enough to pack up her meager belongings and load them into the back seat of her convertible. Aspen's assistance that day had come as no surprise, but Cheyenne's eyes had filled with tears of gratitude when Meredith showed up in a faded t-shirt obviously meant for work and insisted she was there to help. She hadn't mentioned Zach once, and as much as Cheyenne had wanted to, she hadn't asked about him. But she had started texting Meredith regularly after that day. Cheyenne had come to rely on her friendship and support almost as much as she relied on Aspen's. Cheyenne had also watched the way Meredith handled the uncertainty surrounding John's career with something akin to awe. Not that Meredith didn't struggle with her fiancé's constant absences. Cheyenne had sensed how difficult it was on her. But Meredith never complained and seemed to have accepted the worry and loneliness as the opportunity cost of loving a seal. Sapphire Co. felt so, Cheyenne held out her hands, trying to wrap up her experience there in a single word. Idyllic, I guess. It's easy to miss. Dr. Bronson slipped on her glasses, which had been hanging on a chain around her neck, and focused on the legal pad resting in her lap. Idyllic, in a way that home is not. Cheyenne let her shoulders sag. Dr. Bronson was preparing to take notes, which meant Cheyenne was about to dive deep into realities she'd rather ignore. Yeah. Sapphire Cove had been like some fairy tale paradise. She'd still had stresses there, chiefly money and her mom but the town seemed to have cushioned her worries and eased her pain. Had it been the town, or had it been Zach? Let's talk about home, Dr. Bronson said. How is living with your mom again going? Cheyenne looked away. 
she'd moved back home instead of getting an apartment to keep a better eye on mom, who'd become even more sullen and withdrawn since coming home from the hospital. Cheyenne suspected she was using again, although she didn't know how she was accessing the drugs. Before mom had come home from the hospital, Cheyenne had searched every nook and cranny of the house for hiding places, the fifth time she'd done so in the past few years, and found none. Fine, I guess, Cheyenne said. At Dr. Bronson's raised eyebrow, she amended her statement. About like I expected. Cheyenne had known that moving home would be hard, a lot like babysitting a surly teenager intent on rebellion. But what choice had she had? It was that, or let mom relapse again. She kept the only set of mom's car keys with her at all times. Sneaked into mom's room after she'd fallen asleep at night to check the call logs on her cell phone. But Cheyenne had a sinking feeling that it wasn't enough. She couldn't be with mom every second of the day, not with the hospital bills rolling in and the payments to the treatment center still having to be made. She'd found a job as a mechanic at an auto shop only 10 minutes from home. It wasn't restoring classic cars, but at least she got to work on actual vehicles and wasn't just a glorified desk clerk. Then two weeks ago, when the first hospital bill arrived in the mail, Cheyenne had gotten a second job as a night clerk at a gas station a few miles from home. The work was tedious, but the pay was decent. Once she paid off a few of the larger bills, she could finally start saving again for her garage. Dr. Bronson pulled off her glasses, letting them dangle around her neck from the thin gold chain. Her eyes were troubled and her lips pursed. Cheyenne, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. These single-sentence responses are getting us nowhere. You came because you wanted help, but you have to give me something to work with. Cheyenne flinched. Dr. Bronson was right, of course. But the last time Cheyenne had been vulnerable, the last time she'd let someone in, her heart had been trampled. It wasn't the same, and yet she shied away from the inevitable pain that came with sharing. I'm trying, Cheyenne said, clasping her hands together in her lap. Dr. Bronson's expression softened. I know. How about we start with something simple? What are you feeling right now? Cheyenne's mind flashed back to last night when she'd stood with her ear pressed against her mother's door, desperately trying to hear the one-sided phone conversation. Wondering whether mom was talking to her dealer. How did someone buy illegal prescription drugs? After all these years, Cheyenne still wasn't sure. I'm feeling worried. Cheyenne swallowed the acidic taste of fear, forcing herself to voice her emotions. It feels inevitable that mom will have a relapse. I want to pick up more hours at the gas station so I can stay on top of the finances, but then I'm home even less. I worry about what my mom does when I'm not around. That's a normal fear. Dr. Bronson crossed her legs, the pad once again lying forgotten on her lap. You've now found your mother unconscious on the floor twice. That kind of trauma leaves a lasting impact. But you're taking on too many responsibilities, responsibilities that aren't yours. You can't police your mother's actions every minute of every day, and you can't hold yourself accountable for the debt that she's incurred, either. Cheyenne ran a hand through her hair, feeling the frustration build. You keep saying that, but what am I supposed to do, not pay the bills? If I don't, then no one will. I have no idea how much money mom has left from dad's life insurance settlement, but I know she isn't going to use it to pay for the hospital or treatment center. At least the house was paid off. Cheyenne had made sure the bulk of dad's life insurance money went to that. If she had to guess, the rest had gone to dealers. When Cheyenne was at work, the car keys carefully tucked in her purse, mom probably used the home's landline to call ride shares and buy the drugs she couldn't seem to live without. How long until mom remortgaged the house for her latest fix? What would Cheyenne do then? Tears stung her eyes, and she quickly blinked them away. Would she ever open her own garage? Ever be happy again? Let's follow that thought through, Dr. Bronson said. Say you don't pay the bills. What happens then? Cheyenne blinked, the questions catching her off guard. They'd go to collections. And then what? Where was Dr. Bronson going with this? I guess creditors would start calling the house. 
they'd report it as delinquent to the credit bureaus and tank your credit score. Dr. Bronson shifted in her chair. That's what would happen to your mom, because all of these debts are in her name. But what would happen to you? Cheyenne sank back into the couch, flummoxed. I don't know. Nothing, I guess. Dr. Bronson smiled as though Cheyenne had just made some tremendous breakthrough. Correct. No, not correct. Cheyenne's chest tightened with anxiety. All of those phone calls and notices in the mail would freak mom out. She might relapse again. Might lose the house if she doesn't pay. I'm not sure she has enough money left to cover those debts. In fact, I'm pretty sure she doesn't. Dad's life insurance policy wasn't huge. Dr. Bronson tilted her head to one side, looking thoughtful. Okay. So say you do pay the bills. You keep working two jobs and living at home. You cook the meals, clean the house, do all the shopping and laundry. In short, you remove every stressor possible from your mother's life. Does that mean she'll never relapse? Never again overdose? Cheyenne pressed a hand to her stomach, feeling sick. She whispered out her answer. No. No, Dr. Bronson agreed, her tone gentle. Your mother is sick with a disease. Addiction can be every bit as devastating as cancer. But she is choosing to not get help. She is choosing to continue using drugs, which resulted in yet another overdose and astronomical hospital bills. By taking responsibility for her medical debt, you are enabling your mother to ignore her responsibilities and, by extension, you are enabling her to continue using drugs. Cheyenne's entire body instantly flamed with anger. Everything I've done for my mom, I've done to help her. Are you seriously saying that this is all my fault? She had given everything to help her mom. Put aside her dreams. Moved back home. Worked two jobs to pay for her treatment. Tears welled in Cheyenne's eyes, and she blinked them back. She'd even said goodbye to Zach because of her mom's addiction. No, of course not, Dr. Bronson said in that same soothing tone. You are no more responsible for your mother's addiction than you are responsible for a stranger's. Cheyenne grabbed a tissue from the box on the small end table, dabbing at her eyes. Then what are you saying? Dr. Bronson leaned forward, her eyes earnest. When you do things like pay your mother's bills, on the surface, it seems helpful. You're minimizing her stress. Trying to keep her from financial struggles that could lead to losing the house or bankruptcy. Cheyenne nodded, feeling mollified. But what that does is make her more codependent on you. When you take responsibility for her actions, you rob her of the growth she might experience from facing the consequences herself. That's not a healthy relationship for either of you. Was Dr. Bronson right? Cheyenne crumpled the tissue in her hand, feeling queasy again. I've never thought of it that way. I've been focused on keeping her safe and trying to get her better. And you've done a great job, the best you could have done with the tools you had at the time. Often when we're in highly emotional situations like yours, it's impossible to think clearly. But I'm here to give you new tools. Your mother's most recent overdose is proof that the status quo isn't working and something needs to change. Since we can't change her actions, we need to focus on what you can change. And that's how you respond. Cheyenne dabbed at her eyes, her voice cracking. So I'm supposed to just give up on her? She tried to imagine doing that, simply walking away and leaving her mother to her own devices. Cheyenne leaned forward, resting her forehead against her knees. A hand rested gently on her back. It isn't giving up, Cheyenne. Setting healthy boundaries is important for both of you. The reality is that right now your mother doesn't want to get better, and no one can help her until she decides it's time to try to help herself. Not even you. Cheyenne held perfectly still, forehead still pressed to her knees, and focused on her breaths. For so long, she'd convinced herself that she could will her mother into recovery. But she could no longer ignore the evidence. She was wrong, and Dr. Bronson was right. As much as Cheyenne wanted to help her mom, she couldn't force her to get better. 
Hadn't she tried that with the treatment center and failed spectacularly? After several long seconds, Cheyenne straightened. Dr. Bronson had scooted her chair closer, knees nearly touching Cheyenne's and face full of empathy. I don't know how to set boundaries. Cheyenne clasped her hands together tightly. All I know is that my father's death destroyed mom, and she hasn't been the same since. Losing a spouse is never easy. Dr. Bronson paused. Neither is losing a parent. A tear slid down Cheyenne's cheek. She quickly wiped it away. No, it isn't. She missed her father so much. Had never truly mourned his passing. Holding mom together against the barrage of grief had taken all of Cheyenne's concentration and energy. It had deprived her of embracing her own sorrow and sense of loss. But she'd taken on her mother's issues while pushing aside her own grief because she'd been terrified of losing both of her parents. I'm so scared my mom is going to die, Cheyenne whispered. Dr. Bronson nodded. That's a valid fear. She may continue to overdose. She might die because of it. Cheyenne flinched, but Dr. Bronson pressed on. But if that happens, it will be her choice and not your fault. The only variable you can control in this situation is your response to her actions. If she won't change, then in order to preserve your own happiness, you must change. Change. For the first time, Cheyenne let herself imagine a future in which she didn't pay her mother's bills and instead opened her own garage. A future where she was confident and happy instead of anxious and fearful. A future where maybe, just maybe, she could risk her heart. I don't know how to let go, but I want to. The words were barely a whisper, but she forced them out. She had come to Dr. Bronson for help. Maybe her mom wasn't ready to do the work. But Cheyenne was. Good. We should start by setting boundaries, Dr. Bronson said. I have boundaries, Cheyenne said, an automatic reflex. But Dr. Bronson simply stared at her, unblinking, and Cheyenne relented. How do I set boundaries? I think we should start with a quick exercise. You don't have to answer aloud if you don't feel comfortable doing so, but I'd like you to think about and honestly answer each question for yourself. Again, Cheyenne nodded. She didn't want to do this. Answering Dr. Bronson's questions, even silently, would be difficult. Would force her to somehow change. But she was more terrified to not answer the questions. For her life to continue on as it had been for another four years. Dr. Bronson scooted her chair back, giving Cheyenne some space. The first question I want you to ask yourself is if there have been any times over the past four years when you have altered your plans because of fear for your mother. Cheyenne instantly thought of the day a few months ago when Aspen had bounced into their apartment, eyes bright, and invited her to move to Sapphire Cove for the summer. Cheyenne's heart had flared with excitement at the prospect, but she'd initially turned down the offer in order to stay close to her mother. She'd only changed her mind once mom got into the treatment program, which was closer to Sapphire Cove than to Portland. Dr. Bronson continued. Next, I want you to consider if there have been any instances where you avoided doing something because of your mother's addiction. What have you given up that you would not have if she wasn't an addict? Zach's sorrowful expression as she broke up with him made Cheyenne dizzy. She wrapped her arms around her middle, nails biting into her sides. If her mother wasn't an addict, if she wasn't terrified of ending up just like her, Cheyenne knew what she would do. She would go to California, find Zach, and throw herself into his arms. She would beg him to take her back. It didn't matter that they would only spend a few months a year in the same place. Didn't matter that he had a dangerous job she'd be kept in the dark about more often than not. If she hadn't seen the impact of grief on her mother, Cheyenne would have never broken up with Zach. She would have told him her feelings had changed. That she no longer was interested in a fling and instead wanted him. Forever. Your mother isn't going to change, Dr. Bronson said softly. Not until she's ready, and even then, it will require a lot of self-reflection and work on her part. Unfortunately, that isn't something we can force. But that doesn't mean you have to continue as you have been, Cheyenne. 
perhaps, if you show her change is okay, she will be more willing to go after it herself. In order to truly help the people we love, we have to stop enabling them. Cheyenne had heard the words before from other therapists, most recently Dr. Robbins, at the treatment center. But they'd never sunk in until today. If she let her mother's actions continue to dictate her choices, she would end up alone. Her entire life would be work and worrying about her mother. She'd lose Zach forever. Maybe lose the chance of ever having love. I'm scared, Cheyenne admitted. Fear raced through her at the thought of Zach dying. Of being as broken as her mom was. But mom was never well, a tiny voice whispered in the back of Cheyenne's mind. Dad had always called her fragile, something no one had ever accused Cheyenne of being. If she let Zach go, she would regret it every day for the rest of her life. At least if she loved him and lost him, she'd know they'd made the most of every moment they had together. By refusing to be with him, wasn't she losing him, anyway? I want to set boundaries, Cheyenne said, her voice a whisper. I don't want my mom's actions to control my life anymore. Tell me where to start. Chapter 27 Cheyenne had barely pulled into the driveway of Aspen's small bungalow when her friend ran out of the house, arms open wide. You're here, she exclaimed, throwing open the driver's side door and pulling Cheyenne into a tight hug. Cheyenne clung to Aspen, feeling a semblance of peace for the first time in weeks. I'm here. It felt so good to be back in Sapphire Cove. Cheyenne breathed deeply, letting the woodsy scent of pine mix with the salty sea breeze. Summer was in full swing, and the sun had warmed the air to a pleasant temperature. Here she felt needed instead of used. Content instead of trapped. Aspen chewed her gum, eyes sparkling with excitement. And you're really staying? So much had changed over the past two weeks. Cheyenne's head still spun, the unknown future, she barreled toward a terrifying blank slate. But she also felt exhilarated. Free, like she had that day almost three months ago when she packed up her convertible and left for Sapphire Cove. Cheyenne took a deep breath and nodded. Yeah, I'm staying. Are you up to having a roommate again? Aspen grinned, pulling Cheyenne into another exuberant hug. Uh, yeah. I think I'm up for that. It was as though another weight had lifted off of Cheyenne's shoulders. She'd called Aspen two days ago to let her know she was coming, but they hadn't talked about specifics. Not that Cheyenne had expected her best friend to leave her out in the cold, but it was nice to have some reassurance. Thanks. I promise to find somewhere else to live before you're married. She had a couple of months to figure it out. Cheyenne knew she couldn't afford a cute bungalow near the beach on her own, but there were some apartment buildings closer to Main Street that looked nice from the outside. As long as the price was right and it was in Sapphire Cove, she wouldn't be too picky. She needed to live in this town. Something about it made her feel happy and strong, like she could face her mother's demands without bending to her will. I've already been asking around town about rentals, Aspen said. Now that you're here again, I'm not about to let you move back to Portland. Good. Cheyenne grabbed her suitcase out of the trunk. I'm so glad you're here. So is Dan, because I'm turning into a total bridezilla. I need my maid of honor around to keep me grounded. Cheyenne smirked, trying to imagine Aspen stomping around a flower shop making demands. Bridezilla? I seriously doubt that. Even if it was true, Dan wouldn't care. Aspen could grow horns and shoot fire out of her eyes and he'd still call her beautiful. Fleetingly, Cheyenne wondered how Zach would react to a stressed-out bride. Probably with the same cool, calm efficiency he always displayed in tense situations. Like when they'd found her mom unconscious on the bathroom floor. Cheyenne pushed the thought aside, instead focusing on breathing deeply and relaxing each muscle like Dr. Bronson had taught her to. Those images of her mom would always be in her mind, and they'd probably always be accompanied by that sick worry and dread that snarled like a knot in her stomach. But she was learning to act instead of react, and to focus on what she could control instead of what she couldn't. One day at a time, she reminded herself, repeating the mantra Dr. Bronson had taught her. Healing doesn't happen overnight. 
Hey, you got kind of quiet, Aspen said. Everything okay? Cheyenne blinked, realizing she'd been standing silently by the open trunk of her convertible for far too long. Yeah. Aspen raised her eyebrows, curiously, but didn't pry. Well, come in. I want to hear all about what's happened over the last few days. You didn't give me much to go on when you called. I know. Sorry about that. Things were moving so fast. She'd been worried that if she took the time to talk it out with Aspen, if Cheyenne had to lay out just how little she'd figured out, she would get cold feet and change her mind. And she had really wanted to take this leap. She followed Aspen into the small bungalow, the familiar warm blue couch and dated coffee table making her smile. The cozy living room was furnished with a mismatched collection of yard sale finds and hand-me-downs. Cheyenne could vividly remember when they'd found each piece of furniture, and how excited they'd been. Her furniture, the little she had, was in a storage unit in Portland, along with her tools and the rest of her belongings. She could have left everything in her bedroom at Mom's, but Dr. Bronson had agreed that this was a good boundary to set. So Cheyenne had rented a unit, paid a couple of teenagers in the neighborhood to help her load everything up, and brought only a suitcase full of clothes with her to Sapphire Cove. Your room's just like you left it. Aspen motioned to the smaller of the two bedrooms, which Cheyenne had insisted on taking when they first moved in. I'll go make some tea while you get settled in, then we can catch up. In her room, Cheyenne leaned against the closed door with a heavy sigh. Her entire body felt limp with exhaustion, more mental than physical. The confrontation with her mom as she drove away from the house, as mom stood angrily in the driveway, yelling at Cheyenne for being an uncaring and unfeeling daughter, had nearly broken her. On Dr. Bronson's advice, she'd waited to tell her mom that she was leaving until last night. It had been a long, ugly conversation. Mom didn't want to pay her medical bills. Didn't want to be responsible for buying groceries, cleaning the house, making meals. How could Cheyenne abandon her own mother? So many times Cheyenne had wanted to cave and stay behind. It would be the easy thing to do, at least for the moment. But then she would remember all that she had given up and stay firm in her resolve. She didn't want to spend another day living her life for someone else. Cheyenne straightened, taking in the sparse room. It appeared just as she'd left it. There was a twin-sized bed pushed against one wall and a battered old dresser opposite it, both of which had come with the rental. But sunlight streamed through the big picture window, and she could see the gently rolling waves in the distance, framed by towering pine trees. She dropped her suitcase at the foot of her bed, taking a few deep breaths. Part of her couldn't believe she'd actually done it, left Portland and broken free from her mother's hold. Not that she was naive enough to believe the hard part was over. Cheyenne knew that maintaining the boundaries she'd set would be challenging, but Dr. Bronson had agreed to continue guiding her through online therapy sessions. Cheyenne was relieved that she wouldn't have to try to find a new therapist, since making the drive to Portland each week wasn't realistic. You're going to be okay, she whispered to herself. And for the first time in years, she believed it. In the kitchen, she sank onto a bar stool while Aspen set a mug in front of her. Steam curled up from the cup in lazy spirals. Cheyenne inhaled the faint scent of peppermint from the tea bag that steeped in the water. Aspen took her mug in her hands and leaned against the counter. How is your mom doing? Cheyenne played with the string for the tea bag, not wanting to imagine what her mother was doing right now. Her entire world had turned upside down today, and Cheyenne had a pretty good idea of how she'd handle this latest crisis. What drug had she turned to for comfort? Would she overdose again? Who would be there to call the paramedics if she did? Just the thought of it made Cheyenne physically sick. Boundaries, she reminded herself. I was not helping mom. I was enabling her. She took a slow, steady breath, letting the scent of the peppermint tea clear her head. Mom is the same as she's always been. She has no interest in returning to rehab. I know she's still using, even though she claims she's not. It would be so much easier to accept the lies her mother told, the ones Cheyenne so desperately wanted to believe, than to see through them to the truth. 
but Dr. Bronson had stressed the importance of being honest with herself about her mother's situation, and Cheyenne knew she needed to extend that honesty to her best friend. When she parroted the lies to others, it only made them easier to believe herself. Aspen frowned, her eyes dark with empathy. I'm so sorry, Che. I know how much you want her to get better. I do. Cheyenne looked down at her mug, running a finger along the rim. But it's not up to me, is it? No. It never has been. Cheyenne nodded. Accepting that truth had been painful, but also freeing. She'd done her best, but her mother's actions were her own. Cheyenne couldn't control them any more than she could control the weather. Aspen rounded the counter and dropped onto the barstool next to Cheyenne's. What happened to you in Portland? You seem different. I mean that in a good way. Was it that noticeable? Cheyenne's heart lifted at the thought. She liked the idea that her inner transformation was outwardly visible. Would Zach notice a change, too? Would he be willing to give her another chance? Therapy happened to me, Cheyenne said. Mom's doctor at the hospital finally convinced me to see someone. Aspen's eyes widened. Seriously? Cheyenne nodded, blowing on her tea. Hard to believe, huh? Dr. Bronson has helped me realize I need to live my life for myself. So I told Mom that I was moving to Sapphire Cove and she was on her own. Aspen set her mug on the counter with a thud, tea spilling over onto the pink tile countertop. Wow. Cheyenne could hardly believe it herself. Six weeks ago, she wouldn't have so much as considered doing this. I knew that if I stayed in Portland, I wouldn't be able to set healthy boundaries. So here I am. Aspen leaned forward, her eyes earnest. This is huge. I'm so proud of you, Che. Cheyenne took a sip of her tea, noticing how her hand shook. Really? Because Mom screamed about how selfish I am for at least an hour before I left. That's on top of the five hours she spent ranting last night. Aspen pursed her lips together, hands wrapped tightly around her mug. She isn't herself. I know it's easier said than done, but try not to take what she says to heart. Yeah. Cheyenne let out an unsteady laugh, feeling the uncertainty wash over her again. But she is right about one thing, this is a stupid move. Currently, I'm unemployed. Practically homeless. There aren't nearly as many opportunities for someone in my line of work in Sapphire Cove as there are in Portland. On paper, living with mom makes way more sense. Aspen was vigorously shaking her head before Cheyenne even finished. No way. Your mom isn't a typical suburban housewife. She's an addict, and she's been preying on your loyalty and love for years. Leaving was the best thing you could have done. Cheyenne gave Aspen a wan smile. Somehow, her best friend's assurance helped. Thanks. Aspen nodded, taking a sip of her tea. And I won't let you be homeless. If you have to stay here past the wedding, so be it. At that, Cheyenne snorted. I think I'd rather sleep on the street than witness your nauseating newlywed phase that closely. Aspen laughed, her expression lightening. Well, we'll figure something out. I can hire you back at the inn, so you won't be jobless, either. Our night clerk just turned in her two weeks' notice. I'm sure it isn't what you make as a mechanic, but it pays better than when you helped with breakfast. The offer was enticing, but Cheyenne forced herself to shake her head. She hadn't finally broken free of her mother only to take a job she hated instead of finally following her dreams. Thanks, but I'm going to ask Doug to rehire me, as a mechanic this time. While Cheyenne had let go of her mother's medical bills, she was still responsible for the remaining balance at the rehab center, she'd signed as the responsible party there. Things would be tight until she paid that off, but Cheyenne had hoped she could make it work financially with just one job this time around. I'm going to see if Doug will let me rent his garage in the evenings so I can do more restoration work. I want to create a website and start advertising. Hopefully, in a few years, she'd have enough clients, and enough capital, to open her own garage. Aspen's grin broadened. That's great news. 
you're much too talented to do anything else. I hope so. Cheyenne took another sip of her tea. And what about your mom? Are you going to cut yourself off completely from her? Cheyenne shook her head. She and Dr. Bronson had discussed that possibility, but it hadn't felt right. Addict or not, she was still her mom, and Cheyenne loved her. I'll call and check in on her every few days, and visit on holidays and stuff. What she wouldn't do was spend endless nights trying to hunt her down when she wasn't home and wouldn't answer her phone. Cheyenne would no longer sneak into her mom's room after dark to check her call log or hide the car keys. She would no longer search the house for pills and dispose of them. For years, Cheyenne had thought choosing herself was selfish, just like her mother claimed. But with Dr. Bronson's guidance, she was finally realizing that everything she'd done to help her mother had unintentionally hurt her. And in the process, she'd lost herself. She'd lost Zach, too. Maybe forever. I'm so proud of you, Che. Aspen's eyes glistened. I've seen how hard the last few years have been for you. For what it's worth, I think you're making the right decisions for yourself right now. Thanks. Cheyenne blinked, looking down at her mug. I just hope mom doesn't. Well, you know. The possibility of an overdose loomed large, but Cheyenne knew it always had. The only difference now was that she'd accepted that she couldn't stop it. Whatever happens, it's not your fault. I know. Cheyenne believed the words right now. She hoped that, if the worst happened, she would still believe them. Aspen gave her a sympathetic smile. Your mom has to find her own strength now. You can still love her, and care for her, and help her, but in a healthy way. A way that doesn't hurt you. Cheyenne nodded, tears creeping up her throat. She squeezed her eyes shut, swallowing back her emotions. The last few years had been impossibly hard. But she'd learned something through it all, that she was a fighter. That she wasn't fragile. She could walk through the fire and come out the other side, stronger. So, what are your plans for tomorrow? Aspen's voice shifted to bright and cheery. Cheyenne appreciated her attempt to move on to lighter topics. I've got work until five, but then I'm at your disposal. Maybe we can go and look at apartments? You probably want to get all of your stuff out of storage in Portland before you have to pay for another month's rent on the unit. I do. Cheyenne pushed aside her mug. But first, I'm going to go see Doug. After I convince him to hire me as a mechanic and to let me rent his garage, I'm going to see what needs to be done on Zach's truck. And then I'm going to figure out how to win him back. Chapter 28 Cheyenne ran a hand over her face, confusion warring with frustration, as she gripped the phone to one ear. Overly enthusiastic jazz music played through the line, interrupted occasionally by pre-recorded messages expounding on the benefits of Harbor Bay Rehabilitation Center and reminders to call 911 if this was an emergency. The clock on the kitchen wall ticked off the seconds loudly while the dishwasher hummed in the background. Aspen had left for the end nearly an hour ago, and Cheyenne had sat down to make a quick call before heading to Doug's. That quick call had now lasted 32 minutes. All she wanted to do was set up a payment plan for the remainder of her mother's rehab balance, but the front desk had told her the amount had been paid in full. While Cheyenne wished that was true, it was impossible. So the front desk had transferred her to the finance office, where she'd been on hold for nearly 20 minutes as they investigated the issue. The jazz music cut off mid-note. Are you still there, Miss Miller? I'm here, Cheyenne said, straightening. Thank you for your patience. Margaret had a soft voice with the barest hint of a southern twang. It made Cheyenne miss Zach fiercely. I've spoken to Suzanne, the other woman who works in finance. She said that she remembers this payment. Cheyenne seriously doubted that. What do you mean? I mean that there's no clerical error. Your mother's account has been paid in full. Cheyenne curled her fingers more tightly around the cell phone, biting back her frustration. I really don't think that's possible. The payment certainly didn't come from me. No, it was a man. 
Suzanne verified it was for your mother's account and processed the payment. It's all here in the notes, and I even listened to the playback of the recording to verify that we didn't make a mistake. Wait. What? Cheyenne pushed a hand through her hair, stunned. When was this? Four days ago. Cheyenne bit her lip, trying to think. Who would pay her mother's bill? Mom didn't have any friends left, not the kind that would use their money for someone else's rehab instead of their own drugs, and none of Cheyenne's friends had that kind of cash. So that's it? Cheyenne asked. I don't need to make any more payments? Nope, Margaret said, her tone light and cheerful. Everything has been settled. We sent a letter out yesterday to the address on file confirming the payment. You should receive that in two to three business days. Did the man give a name? Maybe one of her dad's old buddies on the force had heard about her mother's difficulties and stepped in to help. But that didn't make sense either, Cheyenne hadn't had contact with any of them since shortly after the funeral. No, he didn't, Margaret said. And unfortunately, we don't store the card name, just the number and expiration date. You're sure it was for my mother's account? Rayanne Miller. Yes, ma'am. Cheyenne was completely stumped. I have no idea who would have done this. I mean, of course I'm grateful, but I'm so confused. I understand, Margaret said. Sometimes we have benefactors in the community call and make anonymous payments on behalf of patients that they know are struggling. Maybe that's what happened here. Maybe, Cheyenne said. But wouldn't a benefactor choose to help someone who'd actually stayed in rehab and completed the program instead of a dropout whose first action after leaving was to overdose? Sorry, I couldn't be of any more help, Margaret said. No, you were great, Cheyenne said quickly. She hoped Margaret didn't think she was being a brat about this. Thank you. They said their goodbyes and Cheyenne hung up the phone. She set it carefully on the pink tile counter, trying to wrap her mind around this new development. No more money owed for rehab. No covering the utilities for mom or paying her hospital bills. Other than a few small student loans with manageable balances, all Cheyenne had to worry about were her own day-to-day -day expenses. Well, and saving up for her garage. She could actually do that now. Cheyenne knew she should feel elated, but confusion made it hard to process. Despite Margaret's reassurances, she couldn't help worrying that this was a clerical error and she'd end up having to pay the money back anyway. Cheyenne was still contemplating the unusual turn of events when she drove up to Doug's nearly an hour later than she'd originally planned. Not that the time mattered, she hadn't warned him she was coming. It felt strange to park in front of the store, instead of in the back lot, but she wasn't technically an employee anymore. Not yet, at least. Through the front windows, Cheyenne could just make out Doug standing behind the counter. A stooped older man had his back to the window as he spoke to Doug. He must be the owner of the silver minivan also parked out front. It looked like Doug was ringing him up for whatever service he'd had done. Cheyenne thrummed her fingers against the steering wheel, trying to decide what to do. Head inside and wait for Doug to finish up, or go around back and check on Zach's truck. It didn't take long to decide. She climbed out of her convertible, heart skipping a beat at the prospect of working on Zach's truck again. Her mechanic job in Portland had been more fulfilling than manning the front desk at Doug's, but oil changes weren't nearly as satisfying as restoration jobs. It felt like it had been an eternity since she'd last worked on Zach's truck. Well, maybe worked was too strong a word. Her cheeks heated as she remembered the kisses she and Zach had shared that last evening they'd worked in the garage. She'd teasingly told him they'd never get his truck fixed if he kept distracting her. The next day, she'd received the call from Dr. Robbins, and everything had changed. Zach's truck sat exactly where she'd left it last, the rusted white paint making her heart skip a beat. Leaves had fallen onto the hood from the tree it was parked under. She brushed them off, the metal warm from the sun. Cheyenne closed her eyes, remembering the feel of Zach's strong, warm hand in hers. What she wouldn't give to hold his hand again. To kiss in the garage as they took way too long to repair an engine. She'd sent him a text last night, can we talk? 
It had taken a ridiculously long time to craft that single sentence, but she'd ultimately left it at that. What she had to say was best communicated in person. Zach hadn't responded yet. Maybe he was on a mission and hadn't seen it. Maybe, even now, he was risking his life for their country while she cleared leaves off his truck. The thought made a bubble of panic rise in her chest, but she forced it back. She'd made her peace with the realities of dating a military man. Zach was a SEAL, and she couldn't, wouldn't, ask him to give up his career for her. One day, he might die in the line of duty, just like her father had. Merely, considering the possibility had tears pricking at her eyes, just like they had each time she'd discussed this with Dr. Bronson. But Cheyenne knew that, if the worst happened, she'd find a way to not only survive, but to be happy again. She wouldn't turn to addiction like her mother had. What Cheyenne couldn't live with was turning her back on Zach and not trying to fix things between them. Maybe she'd ruined any chance they had at a future. But she had to try. She shook her head, focusing once more on Zach's truck. Cheyenne hadn't bothered to bolt the hood back onto the truck and instead had simply rested it in place to protect the truck's mechanics from the weather. She lifted it off with a grunt, remembering the dozens of times that Zach had effortlessly done the same thing. Would he ever text her back? Maybe she should ask Meredith if she knew where the guys were right now. Cheyenne set the hood on the ground and wiped her hands off on her jeans, leaving a light dusting of dirt. She turned back to the engine block. This wasn't right. She blinked rapidly, trying to force her eyes to adjust to the dimmer light. Cheyenne leaned forward, bracing her arms on the truck's frame, and squinted. Where was everything? There, where the inner workings of the truck should have rested, sat nothing. Cheyenne couldn't make sense of it. The engine she'd been so painstakingly rebuilding was gone. The new battery was gone. The timing belt, alternator, radiator, and transmission. All of it was gone. Cheyenne let out a squeak of horror, blood roaring in her ears as her heart pounded furiously. Had someone stolen the truck's parts during the middle of the night? Who would even know the truck was here? Doug's didn't have a security camera to check, but that was because Sapphire Cove didn't have a lot of crime. It would have taken at least an hour or two to gut the truck. Even in the middle of the night, Cheyenne wasn't sure how someone could loiter in the back lot that long without being noticed. She glanced around, wondering if anything else had been stolen. The tow truck sat parked in its usual spot, looking undisturbed. A stack of new tires still rested against one wall, and that was by far the easiest thing to steal. Everything was just as she remembered it, except for Zach's prized possession. Cheyenne replaced the hood with shaking hands and moved around to the driver's door. Her stomach sank as she surveyed the interior. How had she missed that the steering wheel was gone? The gear shift was missing, too, although the seats and radio seemed untouched. I can't believe this, Cheyenne muttered, shutting that door, too. This truck meant everything to Zach. How was she going to tell him that someone had gutted it? It's okay, she told herself, using one of the soothing techniques Dr. Bronson had taught her. Yes, the truck had been gutted. But she could fix this. Her mind raced as she tried to come up with a solution. The most important part of the truck was still here. Zack didn't have an emotional attachment to the things that made the truck run. That much had been obvious as they worked on it together, repairing or replacing parts. It was the truck's body that held the memories for him, the frame and cab, which meant she could salvage this. It would be expensive, but she had connections and could probably trade labor for parts in most cases. It would be time-consuming as well, but she'd already planned on only working one job, so that wasn't a big concern. I will fix this, she muttered as she strode back to the front of Doug's shop. The older gentleman was just leaving. He held open the door for Cheyenne, giving her a friendly nod that she returned. Doug still stood behind the counter, tucking away the big ledger he kept the service receipts in. Cheyenne, he said, a genuine smile on his face. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. How's your mom? She's doing well, thank you. Doug wasn't someone Cheyenne felt a need to be transparent with, and besides, she had more pressing matters to discuss at the moment. 
Did you know that Zach's truck has been stripped? It's completely gutted. All that's left is a shell. I looked around, but it doesn't seem like anything else was stolen. Doug frowned, his brow scrunching together. Zach didn't tell you? Cheyenne braced her arms on the counter, her heart rate slowing. Tell me what? Maybe his truck hadn't been robbed. But if not, then what had happened? He called a few weeks ago and asked for help. Doug ran a hand over his beard, looking uncomfortable. Said he'd changed his mind and wanted to sell whatever he could from the truck. I've been slowly selling the parts ever since. I even tried to sell the radio and seats, but no one wanted them. All that's left worth anything is the body. When they come by to pick up the scrap metal next, I'll sell that, too. Zach had sold his truck for parts? Cheyenne pinched the bridge of her nose. She felt off kilter, like tires that weren't balanced. No, this doesn't sound right. Zach loves that truck. I know. Doug shrugged. I asked him if he was sure at least three times, and he said yes. I figured it wasn't my place to press, so I did what he asked. Sent him the money last week and even waived my cut since it was such an odd request. Whatever happened, it was obviously important. Never seen a man so attached to a piece of junk. This doesn't make any sense. Cheyenne shook her head, unable to visualize what Doug was telling her. What could have happened that would make Zach suddenly need money that badly? He couldn't have gotten more than a few thousand dollars out of everything. She doubted it would have even amounted to as much as her mother's rehab bill. Cheyenne gasped, a hand flying to her mouth. What? Doug asked, looking alarmed. Oh my gosh, she breathed. Doug said he'd sent Zach the money a week ago, around the time her mother's rehab bill had been paid in full. Cheyenne's eyes filled with tears as the reality of his sacrifice overwhelmed her. It had to be Zach. Nothing else made sense. He'd sold his truck to help relieve some of her burden and done it anonymously to boot. Those weren't the actions of a man who would ignore her text. That meant she still had a chance with him. Don't you dare let the dump take what's left of his truck, Cheyenne said. How much were they going to pay him for it? Next to nothing, Doug said. Why? Because I want to buy it, Cheyenne said. Do you have a few minutes right now that I can talk to you? There are some things I want to discuss, starting with continuing to use the garage. Chapter 29 Zack wearily shuffled toward the military plane's exit ramp, feeling as though his bones had liquefied. John walked in front of him and Sawyer behind, along with the rest of their squad. Exhausted didn't even begin to cover Zack's current state of being. The last stop had been brutal, two months in the jungles of South America, unable to communicate with home. He'd worried a lot about Cheyenne during that time. Hoped that paying off her mother's rehab bill had at least helped eliminate some of her stress. Ultimately, the mission had been deemed a success, but just barely. There had been a lot of red tape to sift through, along with some commands Zach hadn't agreed with. It had helped confirm his decision to leave the SEALs behind. He still wasn't sure what he'd do for work once his time with the SEALs was up in a year, but he and Sawyer were seriously considering going into the scuba diving business with John, much to their friend's delight. Zack hadn't been certain if Sawyer would leave the military. He was a born sailor, and Zack knew that either choice would be painful for his friend. In the end, Sawyer had said he made the choice he could live with. He didn't want to be a SEAL without his two best friends. Zack stepped onto the plane's cargo ramp, the warm San Diego breeze hitting him nearly as forcefully as the bright sunlight. He squinted, raising a hand to block the glare as he gazed across the tarmac. Beside him, Sawyer paused as well, lifting his hand to his eyes. But John was off like a bullet, running down the ramp with a loud whoop. Zack barely had time to register that Meredith waited for them before she was swept up in John's embrace. Looks like the families got notified of our return, Sawyer said from his place beside Zack. Yeah, Zack agreed. That wasn't always the case. Loved ones must have been given a few days' notice this time, because a few other families waited as well. Other members of their team were soon swept up in hugs and kisses. 
John and Meredith remained tightly embracing, completely oblivious to everything else. We should give them some time alone, Zack said, nodding to their friends. Sawyer grunted in agreement. Let's head to the barracks. I need a shower. Zack let out a groan. I've almost forgotten what hot water feels like. But first, he wanted to turn on his phone and see if Cheyenne had tried to contact him. The last two months had given him a lot of time to think and plan. As soon as he could get leave, he was heading to Portland to talk to her in person. He prayed she'd be happy to see him. More than anything, he wanted to make a relationship with her work. Wanted to help her through this difficult time, however possible. Thanks to hazard pay, Zack had saved enough during the last few months to help with her mother's hospital bills. He'd worried that Cheyenne might be upset he'd sold the truck, she'd put so much work into it, but he'd paid her for her time, and it had helped him pay off the rehab center balance. Zack hadn't regretted selling his truck for even a moment, hard as it had been to let go. He had the memories of his parents and those happy years, before their deaths, and that's what he'd continued to treasure. The truck had been a physical reminder of those happy times, and while he'd miss it, he didn't need it anymore. For the first time since his parents' deaths, Zack wanted to live in the present, not the past. He and Sawyer walked past Meredith and John, trying to be inconspicuous. But the embracing couple broke apart at the sound of footsteps, giving them identical sheepish grins. Welcome home, boys, Meredith said, giving both Zack and Sawyer a quick hug. It's good to see you both. It's good to see you, too, Sawyer said. He hitched a thumb over his shoulder. We're heading back to the barracks. We'll catch up with you two later. Zack added. To his surprise, Meredith shook her head vigorously. Um, actually, can I steal Sawyer for a minute? John and I had a question for him about computers. Zack raised an eyebrow. Sawyer was their squad's tech specialist, but John was more than capable of dealing with any hardware or software issues that Meredith's computer was experiencing. Okay, Zack said slowly. Is that photography program glitching again? Sawyer asked. Meredith snapped her fingers, nodding. Yeah. Glitching like crazy. Have you tried reinstalling it? Sawyer asked. You know what? This is going to take a minute. Meredith wrapped her arm through Sawyer's and waved Zack away. You look exhausted. Why don't you head back to the barracks and we'll meet you there in a few minutes? I don't mind waiting. Zack looked back and forth between his friends, who looked as bewildered as he felt. What was Meredith up to? No, go on ahead. In fact. She turned to John, practically yanking his bag off his shoulder. A moment later, she shoved it at Zack, catching him in the chest. He let out a surprised grunt, taking the bag. A moment later, she'd shoved Sawyer's bag at him, too. Will you take everyone's bags back with you? That would be a big help. Uh, Mayor? John said. We can take our own bags. There's no sense in letting them sit in the hot sun when Zack's heading back to the barracks right now, anyway. Right, Zack said slowly. Because our clothes might start growing mold? John smirked. I hear that California humidity is nothing compared to South America. Meredith ignored his sarcastic comment and turned her back on Zack. We'll catch up with you in a few minutes. You'd better get going, those bags are probably pretty heavy. Nothing compared to the hundred pounds of equipment he frequently dived with, but Zack was too tired to argue and he was definitely too tired to try and make sense out of Meredith's crazy behavior. His birthday was coming up. Not for another month, but maybe she was trying to plan something. Meredith hadn't been a part of their group for very long, and Zack was still getting used to having someone around who paid attention to that sort of thing. Whatever she was up to, she hadn't been very subtle. The weight of the three bags didn't slow Zack's pace, and soon he was walking up the sidewalk to the barracks. Maybe it wasn't about his birthday, and instead, Meredith had noticed some of Sawyer's weirdness lately and wanted to talk to him about it. If that was the case, Zack was glad she'd pushed him to leave, he wanted no part of that conversation. 
He shifted the three bags to one arm, reaching for his keycard to open the main door to the barracks. Hey sailor, a soft, feminine voice called out, the words carrying from the direction of the parking lot. Zack's heart slammed to a stop, then started racing like a sailor in hell week. That voice. He'd recognize it in a war zone, in South America, on the moon. He'd know her anywhere. Zack turned, his eyes zeroing in on the beautiful girl leaning against a shiny white truck that looked vaguely familiar. But he'd sold his truck, and the last time he'd seen Cheyenne, she had begged him to stay away. You're here, he said, dropping the bags to the ground with a thud. A denim skirt followed the line of her hips and flared out just above her knees. He'd never seen Cheyenne wear a dress, but it enhanced her femininity in a way that stole his breath. She wore a flowy white blouse he recognized from one of their dates, tied in a knot just above her belt. Dark hair flowed freely around her shoulders, something else he'd rarely seen from Cheyenne, but she still had that trademark red bandana tied around her head. He walked toward her in a daze, worried she'd disappear if he blinked. Was this a dream? Zack had never seen anyone more beautiful. I'm here, Cheyenne agreed. She bit her lip, looking uncertain. I texted you that I wanted to talk. That was like, two months ago. His chest tightened as something that felt a lot like hope bloomed within him. I never got it. I've been on an op and haven't had my phone. I know. She pushed away from the truck, taking a step toward him. Meredith told me. When she said that you guys were coming home, I asked if I could drive down here with her. Everything in Zack screamed to reach out and pull Cheyenne to him, but he didn't want to rush her. Didn't want to misinterpret things. A question rasped out of him. Why? She brushed a strand of hair behind her ear with a hand that shook. Because I made a mistake when I pushed you away. His heart started beating furiously. He'd dreamed of this moment. Prayed for it. Worried it would never come to life. Zack ran a hand over his jaw, feeling dazed. What are you saying? She took another step toward him, one hand curled over her heart, the other arm wrapped around her waist. He saw her swallow, watched as she blinked back tears. I'm saying that I love you, Zack. I'm saying that I'm so, so sorry for how I acted. I'm saying that I hope you can forgive me. I'm saying that I want a second chance. The words fell from her lips like raindrops and washed away the dark cloud that had hovered over him since their last encounter. Zack lifted his face to the sky, sending up a silent prayer of thanks. I should have told you that in the hospital, Cheyenne continued, clasping her hands tightly together. I never should have let you go. But I've been trying to fix things, going to therapy and working on myself. Can you ever forgive? Zack pulled her into his arms, soaking up the rest of that sentence as he pressed his lips to hers. Her body melded into his as she responded eagerly, arms wrapping around his neck. He trailed kisses across her cheeks and eyelids, hardly believing this was real. His lips found hers again as he wrapped his hands around her waist and lifted her off the ground. She pulled away from him with a gasp, then laughed as he rained kisses on her neck and across her collarbone. Kissing Cheyenne was like coming up for air after a long dive. Zack's heart soared as he set her back on the ground and she urged his lips to hers once more. She was here. She wanted him. Zack was certain he'd never been this happy in his life. Several long moments later, he finally broke away, resting his forehead against hers. Does that mean you forgive me? Cheyenne whispered. He cupped her cheeks in his hands and stared deeply into her eyes so that she'd have no doubt of his sincerity. There was a lightness there that hadn't been present before, and it made his heart sore. It means that I love you, too. Zack leaned down, gently pressing his lips to hers. And it means that I'm never letting go of you again. Her eyes glistened with tears, but her smile was wide. I'm not going anywhere unless you tell me to leave. He tightened his hold on her, his voice fierce. That's never going to happen. Do you have any idea how much you mean to me? I love you so much. 
A soft smile played at her lips, and she cocked her head to one side as she hooked her fingers through his belt loops I had an inkling when I realized that you'd sold your truck to pay off my mother's rehab balance. I can't believe you did that for me. He froze, surprised. How did you know it was me? Her hand slid up his chest, resting over his heart. Because no one else in my life would make that kind of sacrifice for me. I would do anything to make you happy. Zack brushed aside a strand of her hair, letting his lips linger on her neck. I know you would. You did. But I couldn't let you give up your last connection to your parents for me. She glanced over her shoulder at the truck that was parked a few paces behind them. That's why I had to buy it back. Zack's gaze whipped back to the truck, his heart suddenly beating rapidly for a different reason. Wait. This is my truck? My dad's truck? She nodded, her laughter bubbling over. Doug had sold pretty much everything, but the body by the time I checked on it, but yeah, it's your dad's truck. Zack grabbed Cheyenne's hand, tugging her toward the truck with a laugh. I can't believe this. He drank in the vehicle, tears pricking his eyes. The paint was now a flawless white, no longer dingy and spotted with rust. He glanced through the windshield, taking in the tanned leather seats that looked brand new and the gleaming dashboard. A dim memory flashed into his mind of watching his dad pull into the driveway. The truck had been new then and looked very much like this. Zack had been maybe four years old at the time, eagerly waiting to see what treats were left in his dad's lunch box from work. Zack turned back to Cheyenne, his eyes wet with tears. You did all this for me? She nodded, her eyes sparkling. It's no less than you did for me. How can I ever thank you enough? He wrapped an arm around her, pulling her to his side. I think you already have. I love it. This is amazing. You're amazing. I can't believe this is the same truck. How did you restore it so quickly? She smiled, resting her head against his shoulder. A lot of late nights and early mornings. I got the work done a lot quicker without your help, but it wasn't nearly as fun. He laughed, the impish look on her face nearly irresistible. I'm not going to apologize for that. Good. I don't want you to. You're back in Sapphire Cove, then? She nodded, suddenly looking unsure. For now. But Meredith and I looked at some apartments yesterday, and I've got an interview tomorrow with someone at an old car museum in Balboa Park. Hang on. Zack stared at her in awe, his heart feeling like it might burst. You're moving to San Diego? Her cheeks flamed red, but she gave a shy nod. I'm giving this 100%, Zack. I want to make this work. She motioned back and forth between them. And that means I want to be close to you, so we can spend as much time together as you're able. He searched her expression for any doubts or hesitations, but found none. What about your mom? Her eyes darkened with sadness, and she lifted her shoulders in a shrug. I've finally realized that I can't force her to get better. I'm done putting my life on hold for her addiction. You are what I want my future to be. Zack covered her lips with his once more, unable to resist. His heart was bursting. Soaring. Flying. I'm leaving the seals with John. Her eyes flew open. What? Zack chuckled, tightening his arms around her. Yeah. I was coming to Portland to see you just as soon as I could secure leave. I know you told me to stay away but I wasn't willing to give up without a fight. But you love being a seal. She pushed against his chest, shaking her head frantically. Don't leave, because of me. I know I said I couldn't handle it, but I can. I can be a good Navy girlfriend. I will. Show, Zack pressed a finger to her mouth, stopping her mid-sentence. He ran a thumb along her bottom lip, loving the feel of it. I do love the seals but I love you more. You don't have to choose. Her hands curled around his biceps as she leaned into him. You can have both of us. He saw the honesty in her eyes. She would support him, no matter his decision. 
but Zack had already made his decision, and he had no regrets. I want to choose. And I choose you. I love you, Cheyenne. You're it for me. He took her hands gently in his, holding them out to their sides. This is what I want for my future. You and me, together in a little house in Sapphire Cove. A few kids. Helping you restore cars. Her mouth formed a little O at the admission, then a sly smile slid across her lips. Is that a proposal? He grinned. Not yet, but it's coming. That's a promise. How do you know that I'll say yes? He laughed, kissing her again. Because you were willing to move to San Diego for me. You're setting boundaries with your mother. He paused, choking up. You restored my truck. She blinked quickly, her eyes luminous. And you're leaving the seals. He nodded, tightening his grip on her hands. We've got our whole future in front of us. Totally unplanned. I'm not worried. We'll figure it out together. Zack could think of nothing he'd like more. Cheyenne reached into her pocket and pulled out a keyring, dangling it in front of him. Want to take her for a spin? Zack eagerly snatched the keys out of her hand. Only if you come with me. You couldn't get rid of me if you tried. Good. He helped Cheyenne into the passenger side of the truck, then raced around to the driver's seat. The engine purred to life, and Zack let out a satisfied sigh. Cheyenne slipped on a pair of sunglasses, reminding him of the first time that they'd ridden together in her convertible. He should have known then that his heart was a goner. She caught him staring and smiled, happiness radiating off of her. The sunlight made her hair look almost golden, and Zack knew that this was the beginning of many more memories being made in this truck. His parents were his past, but Cheyenne was his future. I'm the luckiest guy alive. You know that, right? I don't know about that. She reached out, taking his hand in hers. But I'm definitely the luckiest girl. He put the car in drive, giving her a wide smile. Are you ready for this? I'm ready, she said. Let's drive. Epilogue Cheyenne smoothed down the front of her dress with shaking hands, the white satin gliding over her palms. Tool peeked out of the bottom of her T-length dress, looking out of place in the lobby of Doug's auto shop. Her entire body buzzed with anticipation. In less than an hour, she would officially be Mrs. Zachary Thomas. Meredith and Aspen had been with her all day, making sure everything was perfect. But Cheyenne didn't care about the ceremony. Didn't care about the dinner or reception. All that she cared about was forever tying herself to Zach in a tangible way. Aspen handed Cheyenne a bouquet of lilies with a grin. She wore a blush pink dress that just brushed her calves, and a sprig of baby's breath was tucked into her low bun. The slight roundness of her stomach was subtle enough that most wouldn't notice. Cheyenne had been thrilled when Aspen told her about the baby. She knew how much this meant to both Aspen and Dan. Ready? Aspen asked. Cheyenne played back everything that she and Zach had gone through together. Dating a SEAL, even one who was leaving the service, hadn't been easy. In the six months since they'd gone back together, Zach had disappeared in the middle of the night four times, and her mother had overdosed once. But through each crisis, they'd worked to keep the lines of communication open and come up with solutions together. Meredith had also been an invaluable resource in navigating life as a Navy fiancé. Cheyenne surveyed herself in the full-length mirror wedged between the aisle filled with motor oil and windshield washer fluid. She adjusted her birdcage veil, then fluffed the tulle on her skirt. Zack hadn't seen her in her wedding dress yet, but she wasn't worried, she knew that he'd love her in anything. The ensemble made her feel beautiful, while also being simple enough to match her personal style. She took a deep breath, then nodded. I'm ready. You look beautiful, Meredith said. She wore an identical dress to Aspen's, but her hair was curled around her shoulders. Zack's jaw is going to hit the floor when he sees you. Cheyenne's stomach swooped with anticipation. He's already out there, then? Aspen nodded. Him and about fifty other people. 
Cheyenne's eyes widened. Fifty? That's not so many. Meredith gave her a reassuring smile. There are the guys from the SEAL squad, of course, and then some locals. You're part of Sapphire Cove now, which means people show up for your big events. Cheyenne had been more than willing to move to San Diego to be near Zach, but they'd agreed that it made the most sense for her to stay in Sapphire Cove and work on establishing their lives there. Zach would be out of the SEAL soon, and the current plan was to start the scuba diving business with Sawyer and John. As for Cheyenne, she'd convinced Doug to rehire her as a mechanic, not that she would be able to keep working for him much longer. Her car restoration business had taken off, and she almost had more clients than she could handle. They were looking into loan options now and planned on starting construction on her garage soon. Aspen cleared her throat, and Cheyenne looked over at her expectantly. Your mom's here, too, Aspen said. She showed up, just a few minutes ago. Oh. Cheyenne's grip tightened on her bouquet. She hadn't known how her mom would react to her engagement. Zach had wanted to go with Cheyenne to break the news, but had been called away on a mission at the last minute. Since she had no idea when Zach would return, Cheyenne had chosen to speak to her mother alone rather than wait. It had been obvious when she arrived that mom was on something, but Cheyenne had pressed forward with the announcement anyway. Her mother's response had been a glassy-eyed stare, followed by a single word, oh. Then she'd asked for fifty dollars. Cheyenne had left the house in tears, devastated by the lackluster response. But instead of stuffing down her emotions or making excuses for her mom's destructive behavior, like she would have a few months before, she'd called Dr. Bronson and talked it through. That's when Cheyenne had decided that while she would invite her mother to the wedding, she wouldn't involve her in the planning or place any expectations on her participation. Choosing that on her own had felt like a victory, and Zach's praise when he was able to call her again two weeks later had made her feel better than a freshly installed engine. It's good she's here, right? Meredith said, bringing Cheyenne back to the present. Yeah. Cheyenne relaxed her grip on the bouquet, focusing on Aspen. How is she? Good, I think. Aspen rubbed a hand over her stomach. She asked if she could see you, but I said that you were busy and would talk to her after the ceremony. And that didn't upset her? Cheyenne asked. It would be awful if it did, but she wouldn't let her mom ruin her wedding day. She and Zach had already spoken to Sawyer and John, and they had a plan in place, the two seals would swiftly escort her mom from the ceremony if she attempted to make a scene, then call the police and let them handle it. She seemed disappointed but understanding. Aspen gave Cheyenne a tentative smile. I think she'll behave. And if she doesn't, John and Sawyer know what to do, Meredith said. Don't worry about your mom. Today is about you and Zach. I know. Cheyenne arched her neck from side to side, trying to relieve the tension there. I'm trying to let the worry go. Her relationship with her mother had been rocky since Cheyenne had started practicing healthy boundaries, just like Dr. Bronson had predicted. But the doctor had been right about something else, too. As Cheyenne stuck to those boundaries, things had slowly eased between them. She knew her mother hadn't stopped using drugs. Maybe she never would. But today she would just be grateful that her mother was here and on her best behavior. After the ceremony, she'd talk to her, with Zach by her side. Do you need a minute? Aspen asked. Or are you ready to marry that Navy SEAL fiancé of yours? He won't be a SEAL for much longer. Meredith's eyes sparkled with an anticipation that Cheyenne felt, too. None of them will be. Once a SEAL, always a SEAL. That's what Sawyer keeps saying, right? Cheyenne said. Meredith laugh. Yeah, I guess so. Cheyenne grinned. I can't wait to have them permanently home, either. She knew the adjustment to civilian life would be hard for the guys, hard on all of them, but she was ready to tackle the challenge head-on, with Zach by her side. Enough talking. Aspen waved her hands. Do you want to get married today or not? I want to get married. Cheyenne took a deep breath and straightened, holding her bouquet in front of her with both hands. Let's get this show on the road. On it. 
Meredith headed to the door. I'll let them know you're ready. Time had stretched out endlessly all day, but now it suddenly raced forward. In the blink of an eye, Cheyenne was carefully stepping across the gravel parking lot to where one of the garage bay doors gaped open. When she and Zach had asked if they could hold their wedding at his garage, Doug had looked at them like they were crazy. Cheyenne had known it was a unique request, but she and Zach had wanted to seal their love at the same place where it had begun. As the scent of motor oil mixed with flowers hit her, Cheyenne knew that there was nowhere else she wanted to be right now. No flashy reception hall or elegant church could compare to this. Mason jars filled with flickering tea lights lined the makeshift aisle. Rows of chairs were on either side of it, tool bows tied around their backs. Cheyenne scanned the crowd as she walked along the back of the chairs toward the aisle, recognizing most of the faces. But it was a face near the front that caught her attention. Her mother stood along with the rest of the crowd, her face haggard but smiling. She caught Cheyenne's gaze and pressed her fingers to her lips in a kiss, then placed her hand over her heart. Cheyenne blinked quickly, her eyes instantly tearing. She gave her mom a watery smile, which mom acknowledged with a nod. Today was going to be a good day. She could feel it. Taking a deep breath, Cheyenne took her place at the end of the aisle. As the music changed, signaling her walk down the aisle, her attention riveted on Zach. He stood underneath an archway made of old license plates, his white-gloved hands clasped in front of him and the medals on his military uniform glittering under the strings of party lights. She walked confidently toward him, her eyes locked on his. They were hooded under his white cap, but his smile radiated pure joy. Everyone else disappeared. Each step down the aisle was one step closer to Zach, and Cheyenne didn't care if she had to crawl to get there. She was only halfway down the aisle when Zach took a step toward her. The crowd chuckled as he jogged the few paces to meet her, taking her arm and placing it in the crook of his elbow. I couldn't wait even one second longer, he whispered in her ear, and her heart soared. Long ago, she'd dreamed of this day. Imagined her father walking her down the aisle while her mother cried happy tears in the front row. A part of her would always mourn what could have been. But when she'd imagined her groom all those years ago, she hadn't even come close to imagining a man as perfect for her as Zach. His arm felt strong and steady beneath her hand, and she knew she would follow him to the ends of the earth if he asked it of her. The music stopped as they reached the minister, who looked at them with a grin. Seems we have an eager groom, he said and the crowd chuckled again. You have no idea, Zach said, turning to face Cheyenne and taking both of her hands in his. The minister opened his Bible. Well then, let's get started. I love you, Zach mouthed as the minister began the ceremony. I love you too, she mouthed back, tightening her grip on his hands. She was finally home. Sawyer leaned against the tool-covered wall of Doug's garage, a half-empty clear plastic cup in one hand. He'd loosened his tie after his best man's toast, but the tuxedo vest still felt like it was strangling him. The party lights he and John had helped Meredith string across the rafters cast the makeshift dance floor in a soft yellow glow. Doug had only been able to sacrifice one day of business, his present to the newlyweds, and so they'd started decorating before the sun. Sawyer supposed it had been worth it, though. Zach looked happy, at least. His arms were wrapped tightly around Cheyenne as they slowly turned around the dance floor, sharing their first dance as a married couple. And then there was one, Sawyer muttered before tossing back the rest of his water. If someone had told him a year ago that he'd be here, his two best friends married, all of them preparing to leave the seals and start a scuba diving business together in a sleepy coastal town, he would have recommended that person get a brain scan, because they were clearly crazy. But he supposed that was life. The soft rustle of fabric had Sawyer straightening. Meredith and John walked toward him, their fingers intertwined, the picture of a happy couple. Don't they look great together? Meredith asked, beaming. Loneliness slammed into Sawyer, like a punch to the gut. He nodded, running his thumb along the rim of his cup. Yeah, they do. I'm so happy for them, Meredith said. Me too. John grinned at Sawyer over his wife's head. I'm so glad you're moving here with us. It wouldn't be the same without you. Sawyer just nodded. 
Watching his two best friends start families of their own while he was left behind sounded more painful with each passing day. Maybe he should have stayed with the seals. But it was too late now to change his mind. Cheyenne told me they're looking into buying some property to build a house and garage on, Meredith said. I'm so happy her business is going well. She's so talented. Yeah, she did a great job with Zach's truck, Sawyer agreed. John and Meredith would live in her little bungalow near the beach. Cheyenne and Zach would build a house downtown. Where did that leave him? I can't believe this is happening. John rubbed his jaw, looking chagrined. The three of us putting down roads? I never would have believed it when we first joined the Navy. Sawyer glanced at Meredith, who gave him a bright smile, then away again quickly. He stared down at his empty water glass, giving himself time to shove his feelings down where no one would notice them. Crazy, he muttered. Had he made the right choice, not re-enlisting? Once their term was up, he'd be in Sapphire Cove full-time. There'd be no escaping the newlywed Hayes, both of his best friends were now trapped in. It would be so much harder to convince himself that he was fine, happy, even, when confronted on a daily basis with the reality of just how alone he now was. John clapped a hand on Sawyer's shoulder, his eyes suspiciously wet. I can't tell you how happy it makes me that you and Zach are moving here, John said, his voice thick. I knew there was no way on earth I could live without seeing Meredith every day. But the thought of not seeing you and Zach, well, that would have hurt. You two are brothers to me, and family means everything. Sawyer swallowed, his throat suddenly tight. The three of them had been through hell together, and nothing could break, or eclipse, that bond. He clapped John back, clearing his throat of emotion as he returned the hug. The feelings mutual. I wouldn't even know how to be a seal without you two backing me up. I know that right now it feels like we're giving up a lot. But we're going to gain so much in return. John pulled Meredith to his side, dropping a kiss on her forehead. You'll see. It's going to be a good life here. Sawyer blinked, looking away from the soft smile on Meredith's lips. I wouldn't have left the Navy if I believed otherwise. We're so lucky, man. The luckiest, Sawyer agreed. Meredith tilted her head to one side. Maybe once you're in one place for longer than a minute, you'll find a girl to share this new life with. Sawyer shoved his hand in one pocket and curled it into a fist. I'm not sure I'm the marrying type. You know me, kind of a lone wolf. Not like these two yuppies. John laughed, but Meredith continued to stare at Sawyer. He shifted, uncomfortable. What did she see when she looked at him? You say you're a lone wolf, and yet you're leaving a job you love to follow your pack. Someone's got to keep John and Zach in line, Sawyer said, trying to lighten the mood. John shoved Sawyer, playfully. Oh, please. I've saved your bacon way more than you've saved mine. Sawyer forced himself to grin, but he knew John was right. Where would he be without his two best friends? He didn't like to think about it. His life hadn't been easy. Sawyer's mom had left when he was a kid, and his dad. Well, he had tried to avoid him as much as possible. Then he'd met John and Zach in seventh grade, and at Zach's house, he'd finally found a home. When push came to shove, Sawyer hadn't been able to give that up. He'd chosen his friends, his family, over his career. He just hoped he could live with his choice. The song ended, and Sawyer joined the clapping crowd as on the dance floor, Zach pulled Cheyenne close for a kiss. A more upbeat song started playing over the sound system, and Meredith tugged John toward the floor. Come dance with me, hubby. He laughed, raising his shoulders in a what can you do? Shrug as he followed Meredith onto the dance floor. Sawyer fisted the cup in his hand, focusing on the satisfying crunch of plastic as it gave way beneath his grip. Leaving the seals might be the hardest thing he'd ever done. Watching his two best friends experience a happiness he craved would hurt like an infected gunshot wound. But he would do it, because John and Zach were his family. Their brotherhood meant everything to him. He could lose the seals. What he couldn't lose was his family. It would take time to lock away his feelings. Every day, 
he'd have to carefully control his emotions. But Sawyer wasn't one to back down from a challenge. And once he'd succeeded in overcoming this one, he'd go looking for the woman who'd complete his own happily ever after. He wanted what his best friends had. And he would do whatever it took to find it. You've been listening to Dare to Fall, A Second Chances in Sapphire Cove Romance. Written by Lindsay Armstrong. Text Copyright 2022 by Lindsay Armstrong. Production Copyright 2022 by Lindsay Armstrong.